So I've had a couple of ghost encounters that really messed me up, but this one in particular was the worst. So my mom was dating a guy who I wouldn't call redneck, but definitely not like a normal country guy. He also had a son who I still stay in close contact with to this day. Basically, almost every Sunday, we would go out to my stepdad's mom's house. She lived in the middle of the woods, but not secluded like there were no other houses in the area, but directly across the dirt road, there was an abandoned house that pretty much looked like what you would expect an abandoned house to look like. So my stepbrother and I would go in there every once in a while for fun and would see some weird stuff, like a random chair in the middle of a room and a cooler full of dead roses. But one day we were headed in there like usual, but once I took a step in, I just wanted to throw up. My brother kept going and was telling me that it would be fine and to just come in, but I was not going in there. A couple of minutes of talking go by, and all of a sudden, my brother's face turns pale, and he drops his water bottle and runs out without saying a word. I follow him, asking him to slow down, and he says that we're never going in there again. When I asked why, he said that he heard a voice whisper in his ear and tell him to run. We never told our parents until like two years later. At the time, we were 12, but... He was true to his word. We never went back. This is something that happened to a friend's brother. And a lot of people say that this town he lived in, which is called Bor in my country of Serbia, is filled with black magic, and generally not so many good things. When he started high school, he moved to Bor and stayed at some student dorms. He had a friend that had this girl that was basically stalking him. She wasn't very attractive, so he just dismissed her, and he'd often joke around about how ugly she was. My friend used to visit his brother in Bor, so he was very aware of this stalker girl. He visited him about once a month. The next time he came, though, the guy was in love with the stalker girl. She would piggyback him and run through the halls and engage in behavior that was pretty abnormal for the guy. My friend naturally asked the guy why he was with this girl, especially when he'd said she was so ugly. This guy picked up my friend by his throat, threatening him, saying that if he ever said anything bad about her, he'd kill him. He asked his brother what had happened to the guy and his brother told him that this girl did black magic on him. Apparently they found some weird stuff under the guy's pillow, but he wouldn't listen to any of them. So the brother, being fed up with the things going on in the dorms, decided to rent a house out with his best friend while he was there. He told me a lot of creepy stories about that town, but this was one of the creepiest. He said that they were at a student party and were walking back home. He and his friend had to pass this park. Through the middle of the park were these stairs. They had to pass them to get back home, and they were a really long set of stairs. So after the party, maybe two to three in the morning, they're walking past those stairs, and they see a really old woman slowly walking up the stairs, holding both of the rails. They consult each other as to what they should do, if they should help her. But knowing the parts they were in and considering the time, they decided to cautiously walk past her. The brother's friend was the first one to walk past her, and as soon as he did, he just starts bolting up the stairs like his life depended on it. The brother, now reasonably scared, walked past the granny, and he said that the granny looked straight into his eyes, with hollow eyes, and he said she was crying blood. He said he ran so fast he overtook his friend and never looked back. There are a lot of tales of folklore from that town, and knowing them I'm not surprised at what the people who live there tell me. Last fall, my mom was not doing so well. 
and it looked like she might not make it. So my wife and I traveled back to my hometown just in case this was goodbye. We stayed at a pretty sketchy hotel while we were there because not much else was open. After coming back to the hotel for the night, we noticed that our dog didn't come to the door to greet us, which was strange. We called her and called her, and nothing. My wife then saw that the bathroom door was closed. She opened it and came upon our dog in a little nest of towels, happily laying there without a care in the world. It was odd because our dog has horrible separation issues. Fast forward to the middle of the night, we were woken up by the bathroom door opening and repeatedly closing all on its own with no cause whatsoever, at least not a natural one. Once we were home, things seemed to get back to normal. However, one day my wife was sleeping in our room and I was in the living room with the dog. The bedroom door was closed. I noticed that the door to the bedroom was opening with no one being there to open it. It had been closed securely. I had even heard the click sound that it makes when it closes all the way, and I did so intentionally to give my wife quiet while she slept. Since coming home, things are pretty standard, other than the fact that our dog will now stare for prolonged periods of time down the hallway toward our laundry room at seemingly nothing. Electronics have started to turn themselves on and off, the fan beside me, for example, has now become known for just turning on, never off though, all on its own. So has the TV, the Apple HomePod, pretty much everything. The Apple HomePod will suddenly answer unheard questions at times of total quiet, even when no other TV or other noise sources are available. It's so strange. I think something might have followed us home. I used to clean offices back when I was a student going to university. It was a great job for students because they didn't really care when you showed up. As long as you got the job done between the closed hours of 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. This one law office I cleaned every Thursday was pretty cool by design, but it always spooked me out. The building was about six stories high, and the law firm being on top had a beautiful view. It was a heritage building, located in what was the city's original town square. I was told that it was where the town hangings had once occurred and the particular building I worked in was at one time a brothel. So lots of history, and that history alone made me want to get the job done as early as possible. The whole sixth floor would usually take me about an hour to clean. I usually managed to be out of there by eight or nine at the latest, usually taking a beautiful sunset too. This night I had stayed late at school and arrived at the job well after dark and close to midnight. The layout of this law firm was a circle. You take the elevator up with your cart, and the door is open to a reception and waiting area. To the right were the washrooms, and then individual law offices circled around the floor with a large boardroom in the middle and a staff break room at the opposite end. A strange feeling usually hit me as soon as the elevator doors opened. This weird feeling of someone there but the stillness of the vacant space kept reassuring you that that was crazy talk. The later in the evening it was, the stronger the feeling. I was not looking forward to this next hour. This night, the doors opened and I could hear people talking and laughing. It sounded like ladies were working late and chatting it up in the break room. I remember smiling with relief because I was feeling pretty scared to be there alone so late. I walked around the right side calling out hello to let them know that I was there and to not surprise them. As I rounded the corner to the break room, the talking sounds just stopped and absolutely no one was there. I stood there frozen for a moment and thought maybe they were in the offices on the left, so I kept going 
I kept calling out hello and announcing my presence. No one was in the building at all, but the chatter that I had just heard was clear as day. As I came full circle back to the elevator, I kid you not, the elevator doors opened by themselves. I was so frightened that I just pushed the cart back onto the elevator and went home. Nope, nope, nope. This is by far the scariest thing that I've experienced. Where my boyfriend used to live, at his mom's, he's moved out now. It was like a new build complex. Lots of new houses and roads, like its own little village. Built around a mental asylum. They knocked the majority of it down, but what remained was the administrative building, church, and a large garden. We'd walk the dogs in the garden at night, and I always got feelings in there, kind of in my shoulders, like something was behind me, or watching me. It never felt malicious, but it creeped me out all the same. Being the adventurous people we are, we decided to explore the administrative building, so we gathered a few friends and headed off. This was during the day, as it was guarded at night. Getting inside involved lots of climbing through windows and up scaffolding, once in, we split off and explored, but it was in such a state of ruin we didn't get too far. I found some stairs down to another floor and stood there for a while. I heard footsteps up the stairs and did a runner. I told the guys and they were on the other side of the building, so it definitely wasn't them. We kept hearing doors slamming, but it was a calm and sunny day. Thoroughly creeped out, we left and just explored the grounds and some of the other smaller buildings. When we got home, I was absolutely exhausted, like really drained, but I didn't think much of it. The next night I was back at home and settling down to sleep, but I couldn't get comfortable. I could feel something watching me from the end of my bed. I tossed and turned, trying to ignore it, but I could feel it, staring. I got really upset and started crying, it was so intense. I then got a thought that passed through my mind. You came to stare at me, so I'm staring at you. I bolted into my parents' room next door and told them. They calmed me down, and when I went back to bed it was gone. Another time we were in the garden late at night with a friend, and as usual I could feel something there. My boyfriend and his friend were facing toward me, and I was facing them. At the other end of the garden, I saw what looked like arms and the tops of legs, walking behind a sort of archway in the garden. It was almost see-through white, and walked for about five seconds before I told the guys. Of course, it wasn't there when they turned around. The garden has got high walls all around it, so it definitely wasn't a car, and there was no one else there. That place is definitely haunted. I did some research, and the residents at the unit used to visit the garden and spend a lot of time there. They weren't treated well, and they still used all the old-fashioned treatments for mental health and learning disabilities. We haven't been back since, as my boyfriend doesn't live with his mom anymore, like I mentioned. I have always experienced the paranormal, and I'm definitely open to sensing spirits. Honestly, being followed, though, was the scariest thing I've ever been through. I have absolutely no memory of this experience. I was a little over two years old and just starting to walk on my own when this event took place. My mom only told me this story about three years ago when I was 32 and about to get married. My mother was raised in a very tiny fundamentalist Christian community and had no belief in the paranormal. She believed that our souls sleep until judgment day or something like that. Ergo, there are no ghosts or spirits around to haunt houses. Even over 30 years later, 
she still sounded terrified as she told me this. This woman who always talks way too loud was literally whispering by the end of it and was white as a sheet. I believed her completely and I still do. My mom never talks about stuff like this. I'm just glad that I can't remember it also. In 1988, my parents had their second child. This was my brother, whom I'll call Victor. We were very crowded in our rented flat with two babies. My parents decided to move to a rambling old two-story farmhouse on a seven-acre plot in southern Ohio for more room for the family. It was way out in the sticks and took almost an hour to get to town from there. My mom said that the very first time I saw the house, I freaked out. I was crying and saying things like, don't like mean house, mean the house, ugly house, don't like, scary house, mama, don't like. My mom said this behavior was very out of character for me, but I stopped complaining about the house after a few weeks, so she just chalked it up to the stress of the move. Now, this house was ramshackle and in the middle of nowhere. The kitchen was to the far rear of the house, and until recently before we moved in, still had a working ancient wood-burning cooking stove against the back wall. This had caught the back wall on fire a couple of months before we moved in, and had caused a lot of damage. A lot of that damage wasn't fixed. So my young, broke parents got a very cheap rental agreement. Gotta love the 80s. On the second floor, directly above the kitchen, was a locked room. The landlord claimed that it had heavy fire damage, but her son, who had done the repairs, claimed the only fire damage left was in the kitchen since it had been the worst and was beyond his skill level to fix. Either way, the landlord was absolutely adamant that the room was off limits, and my parents always respected that. I would have looked, 100%. I know all this because I heard stories about the crappy farmhouse with the creepy door my whole life, and there were pictures of us in and around the farmhouse. The locked door was right next to the upstairs landing, so there was no avoiding it. Both my parents have told me that it gave them the creeps. A few months after we moved in, my mother and I were in the yard with our pit Doberman mix, Boss. She was hanging laundry and I was rolling around with Boss. She said that just as she noticed that everything was way too silent, Boss started going ape from surprisingly far away. About 500 yards from the house on the left, there was a small duck pond. Boss was in between the two, running toward my mom, then turning and running back toward the pond, then back to my mom, barking frantically the whole time. My mom saw something thrashing around in the middle of the pond. She took off toward the water at full speed. Boss beat her there and dragged me out of the water himself. Thanks, pupper. Although my mom was confused how I got so far so fast and how I had gotten into the center of the pond since it was over my head and I couldn't swim, she figured she underestimated me and brought in the baby gates and the play pens. I was to be contained from now on. A few weeks later, she was cooking downstairs. Boss was outside, Victor was asleep in his crib, and I was in my playpen in my room upstairs. I also had a gate on my door and one at the top of the stairs. The stairs ran up from the side of the kitchen, so my mom said she could listen for us crying or fussing while she cooked. My mom said no longer than 15 minutes after the last time she looked in on us kids, Boss started going crazy again, in the yard. She runs up to check on us, Victor is still sleeping, every baby gate is still shut and locked, but I am not in my room. A frenzied search reveals that I'm not in the house at all. A sudden image of Boss saving me from drowning causes my mom to rush outside to see what he's trying to tell her this time. She said he was running circles in the yard, barking uncontrollably. When she got outside, he took off toward the right, away from the pond. He would run ahead, turn around and bark at my mother, wait for her to catch up a little and then race off again. He ended up leading her almost a mile and a half out onto the dirt road that separated our property from our neighbors, and then he led her to a thick stand of trees on our neighbor's side of the rocky drive. She said what hit her first was the foul stench of advanced decay. She plowed into the trees with her heart in her throat, 
and her stomach full of ice. She said she noticed many piles of corrugated tin, tarps, tires, and other debris. The miasma was emanating most strongly from these junkyard cairns. Peeking under a sheet of tin, she discovered the extremely decomposed corpse of a butchered cow. As she headed deeper into the thicket, where the tree cover was denser, she said less care was taken to cover the remains. Grizzly pieces of bones and rotted chunks of bovine littered the area. Apparently, our neighbor, in an effort to cheat his taxes, had been illegally slaughtering cattle and hiding the remains in at least one of the few thick stands of trees around. She found me in the dead center of this thicket, just standing there, looking around like I was confused, surrounded by carnage. She said I didn't seem scared or anything, I was just standing. She rushed over to me and, after ascertaining that I wasn't injured, began to question me on why I was there and how I'd gotten there. Keep in mind that although my mother said I started speaking very young, I still didn't have much of a vocabulary. She said that I told her, with that serious look only small children can give, that the children had brought me here. Shatting her pants at the thought that anyone, even children, could walk right past her through the kitchen, get me from upstairs and walk right past her on the way down the stairs and out with me, she demanded to know what children and where the hell they are now. I looked her dead serious in the eye and told her, the ones that live with us in the room at the top of the stairs. I don't see them anymore. After a moment of stunned silence, she started asking all kinds of questions about these children. However, she told me that I refused to say anything else. She said as long as she questioned me about what happened, I would just stand there staring at her with that serious expression and my mouth closed. She said the same pattern held true every other time she brought it up to me. So she was always left wondering and immediately began hounding my dad about moving closer to town. While the incident with me getting to the pond was highly unlikely, it was at least remotely possible. My mother is adamant that me being in the hidden slaughter yard that day was a flat impossibility. She says there's no way that I could have even known it was out there, much less have had the ability to open and relock the baby gates, get downstairs past her and two miles down the road, all in under 15 minutes. I was only two and as slow and clumsy as most toddlers are. As I said, it's 30 years later and she's still shaken by it. I have no idea what happened that day. I have thought about hypnosis, but haven't yet decided that I really want to remember. Maybe it's better to let it be a mystery, because whatever those things were, I highly doubt that they were children. So this happened when I was 18. I lived with my parents in a sleepy suburb outside of DC. It's a big three-story house with a left side deck and the basement outside door is beneath the deck. Going underneath the deck is a granite rock staircase out to our backyard, which is a steep 30 degree slope down a peppy little creek. Now that that's out of the way, it's the summer of my senior year my parents are out of town for a week. I leave the Marine Corps in a few months, so naturally I throw a rager. The party was pretty rad. A metal band showed up at some point. Many a gallon of swill was ingested, and it went on late into the night. At around three, there were a few of us left, just hanging out and shooting the shit. Eventually, everyone falls asleep, except for me and my two friends, Heather and Amber. So we go out on the deck which overlooks the hill and my neighbor's yard, separated from ours by a wooden fence roughly three feet high. They have a rock garden that's tiered with about two feet drop downs for about 20 total feet, with a nice pagoda in the middle. They also have a weeping angel style three foot tall statue overlooking the hill a few feet away from the fence. Anyway, we're out there getting lung cancer, smoking, and we keep hearing these footsteps coming up the rock path. 
It's pitch black, so we can't see who's coming up. And I didn't want to turn on the floodlights because I'm worried I'll wake the neighbors. I whisper down, drive safe, thinking it's someone leaving the party. The footsteps abruptly stop, and I jokingly call out, good night to you too. Around a minute or so passes, and we start getting weirded out, wondering what the fuck that person is doing there, just standing. Amber yells out, Are you okay? No response. So I go inside and grab a flashlight quickly, and shine in below the deck to see what the matter is. There's nobody there. I ask Heather and Amber if they heard them walk off, and they assured me that they hadn't. This is when Heather notices the statue. I said it was pointed down the hill. Well, it's now turned noticeably toward us. Not facing us, but it's clearly been moved. We get real quiet, light up another cigarette, and start talking about how strange all of this is. Now, I spent eight years in the core, and I've seen plenty of funny, creepy, and weird shit since then. But I've never seen anything like I did that night. As we're looking at the statue, it fucking gets turned facing us even more. We all see it, and we start freaking out. Not quietly, I say, what the? And right as I do, we hear loud footsteps on the rock stairs again. Heavy, fast, moving steps. I quickly shine my light down there. For the second time, there's nothing. I shine it over to the statue, and I swear it's been moved another 90 degrees. We then hear squishing, crunching footsteps coming from by the statue. We had a little garden area, maybe eight feet or so, in between the stairs and the neighbor's fence. That's where the footstep sounds are coming from. At this point, we're all scared, but being a guy, and Heather and Amber both being attractive, I exclaim that I'm going to go investigate, to try to calm them down. They say they'll follow right behind me, not wanting to be alone. So we go out the front door and slowly creep our way down the steps. Before we round the corner of the house, we hear the footsteps again, beating feet away from us down the hill. Mind you, there's nowhere to go down there, just fifty or so acres of woods and the creek our house being on the ass end of the cul-de-sac. We get to the spot where we heard the crunching and I shine my light down the hill. Nothing but the trees and their shadows. I shine my light to the fence and the statue is now facing us completely. I start to walk over to the fence, shining my light down so I don't trip. And Heather says, wait, look. I look down and see several massive boot prints. Think shack-sized shoes. They go toward the statue and stop. One of the prints was made around the fucking fence post, like something had stepped through it. Listen, my balls are only so big, so I say run, and we take off back inside and rush upstairs and into my bed, thoroughly freaked out. We stayed there for about 30 minutes, trying to think of how any of that was possible. Nothing came to mind then, and nothing does now. After about another 10 minutes or so, I realized that I didn't lock the door. So I go back downstairs, into the front door. As I lock it, and turn around, I hear a fairly loud bang on the deck, like someone, or something, hit one of the support columns. I promptly decide fuck the neighbors and turn on all of the floodlights and run back upstairs. We stayed up until the sun began peeking through the trees, talking about what the fuck just happened. It was seriously terrifying. That's the end of that night. The statue was back to its normal place when we went to look in the morning sun, and the footprints were gone. I never had anything else happen in that house. My parents still live there and have never mentioned anything, but to this day, it remains one of the creepiest paranormal events I've ever witnessed.
Back in 2000, when I was 20, a friend of mine, a 19-year-old female, decided that she wanted to get an apartment and asked if I would be her roommate. I didn't really need a place to stay, but we decided to do it anyway. We moved to a nice apartment complex right next to and behind the house where my aunt saw her dead ex-boyfriend. The place was nice and newer, so the thought of it being haunted never crossed my mind. I didn't even experience anything until my roommate got homesick a month in and had to move back in with her folks, leaving me there alone for three months. It started with the lights coming on by themselves. I would go to bed, always turning the lights off and always closing my bedroom door. I was meticulous about the lights because that's how I was raised. I'd go to bed and at some point open my eyes and see light coming in under the door. I thought my roommate had come home. So I would get out of bed excited to see her, only to discover I was still alone and the dining room or bathroom light would be on. Then the knocking started. Right after I'd lay down, there would be three loud knocks on my bedroom door. Again, thinking my roommate had come home, I would get up to greet her, only to find that I was still very much alone. A week or so before Christmas, my roommate and I went out gift shopping and went back to the apartment to wrap everything up. When we were done, we were both standing at the door, checking to see if we had everything before leaving. The apartment was completely quiet, and we heard this clearly. My acoustic guitar, which I had leaning up against the wall in my bedroom with the pick stuff between three strings, was plucked, each string in succession, then slid along the wall until hitting the floor. We just looked at each other, then walked to my bedroom to find the guitar on the floor with the pick still stuck between the strings. Those strings had been plucked, meaning the pick had been used and then replaced when done. At Christmas, during a party with her and some other friends at the apartment, the VCR turned itself off. It did that one or two other times while living there, never before or after. For Christmas, my girlfriend got me a guitar tablature book for Pink Floyd's The Wall. One night, I sat on the floor of my bedroom, learning how to play a song in it. When I was done, I put the pick in the strings and set my guitar up on the wall. But instead of closing the book as I normally did, I left it open and went to bed. Just after laying down, I heard the pages in the book flipping on their own. It was a thick book, but the song I had been learning was somewhere in the middle. I figured that the weight of the pages made it change pages on its own. But when they stopped flipping, I got curious and I got up to look. The pages stopped flipping on the song, Hey You. And when I read the title, I got chills and shut the book, pleaded with the ghost to let me sleep and went back to bed. While laying there, I realized if the pages had flipped on their own from the weight, they would have gone the other way, away from that song. After that, I started calling the ghost Pink. Anytime something happened, I would just say, oh, hey, Pink. But one night I had been out with a friend until around 2 a.m. And when I opened my door and stepped in, I could feel the ghost standing there. I said, oh, hi, Pink and I could feel the energy go through me and out of the apartment. So that's when I figured it didn't like being called that, which didn't stop me from saying it. Shortly after, my roommate came back and stayed the rest of the lease. Not much happened then. I figured if an entire house could be haunted, then surely an entire apartment building could be. I wanted to ask my neighbors if they ever experienced anything, but never did, and actually never really talked to them at all. My roommate and I were and are really good friends. We never dated, we never slept together. She was also really good friends with my girlfriend and it was my girlfriend who told her to ask me to move in with her. Also, I've known since I was around 10 or so that I could feel ghosts, if you will, but usually only when standing right where they were. If I stood with them long enough, I could usually get an image in my head of what they looked like, as well as their mood. In a few instances, I've had them communicate with me like that, their words coming to me as thoughts or images, usually the latter. 
I usually don't tell people this because they typically don't believe me, and I would just rather not go through with the ridicule and name-calling. However, with Pink, I never figured out who or what it was. I always felt that it was male, but I didn't know. I still wonder about it from time to time. I'm currently 17, and I believe this first encounter took place when I was 13 to 15. It happened sometime in between 8th and 9th grade where I'm from. I remember it clearly. I was just waking up from a nap in my dad's room and looked out his window at our front lawn and street. It was the middle of a clear and sunny day, so there's no way it was just the shadow of a cloud. On the other side of our street a man was jogging, except nobody was there. It was like a shadow of somebody. Like I'm sure you all know how shadows stretch and shrink depending on where the light's coming from, right? But this shadow didn't. It was as if there was an invisible wall there and a person in front of it. Except there wasn't. It was the perfect outline of a man. I could see straight through it and whatever it jogged by was changed to the mutish gray color that the shadows are. I saw my neighbor's lawn, a tree, the bottom of my neighbor's fence, and many other things, as this thing passed it. I rubbed my eyes a few times just to see if maybe I was seeing something weird or had film on my eyes or something, but no, this weird shadow guy was there, just taking a leisurely jog through the neighborhood. I watched him for a while, completely bewildered. The weird shadow guy didn't really move in regular time. It was almost like he was jogging in slow motion. He would bound up kind of slowly and then come back down just as slowly. Almost like gravity affected him indifferently. Or not at all. After that, I went out to my living room to check if I was just seeing things or maybe there was something on the window. But nope. The guy was still there. Or the shadow was still jogging at the same pace. That's all that really happened the first time I saw him. The second time, it was a bit more... interesting. I'm not too sure how old I was the second time I saw the shadow guy, but it was a similar situation. I was waking up from a nap in my living room and happened to look out our large rectangular window, which looks out onto the front lawn and street. There he was again. Still at the same pace, with the same figure, translucency, and color. This time, I made the mistake of going over to my door and opening it to get a better look at him. I took a step out onto my front step and immediately realized I had made a mistake. He slowly turned toward me and began jogging at me at the same pace in my direction. Almost instantly, I got an uneasy and scared feeling in my stomach, went back inside and closed the door. He turned back to the direction he'd been going in before and continued at the same pace down the street. Afterward, I could feel my heart beating in my chest and I was breathing heavily. I'm not too sure what would have happened if I had stayed outside, but believe me when I say I'm glad I didn't stick around to find out. I'm sure it wouldn't have been good. I did a little bit of digging on my area, Ellicott City, and I couldn't find anything on people that had died while jogging in and around my neighborhood, so I'm stumped. I do remember something I read in a book one time, though. Keep in mind, it definitely wasn't a non-fiction book, as when I did read for fun, I wasn't really into those. What it was called, I can't quite remember, but I do recall the description of it. It was something about shadows and spirits that walk down streets and roads. If you're on the road with it, you're supposed to either cross the street to the other side or run away from it, but I can't remember which. If you let it run through you, it's supposed to steal your soul or something like that. Whether that's an actual description of something or just something made up that was in a book, I don't know. 
but I thought it was weird how it almost perfectly described what I'd seen. Like, it was almost too similar to just be a coincidence, but I don't know. Since the second sighting, I haven't witnessed him. But I have seen something else. My house was built in 1963, and before we moved in, I heard from my mom that an old couple had lived in the house and that one of them had died inside. There are a lot of things that have happened to my sister and I that could be considered paranormal, but I'll just describe the few that I remember the most clearly. It was the middle of the night and I had woken up for whatever reason. For less than a second, I saw an old lady. The lady was sort of hunched forward and facing away from me. She turned in my direction very quickly, before disappearing completely. She had white hair in patches, was very skinny, and was decomposing in several places, so much so that I could see bone. But her most prominent feature was her jaw. It was detached from one side of her face and hanging off the other. Despite her mouth and face decomposing to the point where discolored flesh was hanging off her face, her teeth were perfectly white and intact. After that, I just lay awake for a while staring at where she'd just been. Nothing. I thought I saw an outline, but I wasn't too sure. That was all I saw of her. I haven't seen her since that time, but I still think about it every now and then. It was definitely weird. This next one is actually kind of funny. It's in the same house, but this time I was in my room at night. I was awake and on my phone, and the door was open a crack. All of a sudden, it opens all the way, kind of slowly, and hits my wall. From the hallway, I hear footsteps walk up to my bed and turn around, but nothing is there. All I say is, why you gotta creep me out like that? It's not cool. And I heard footsteps leave the room and the door closed. It happened a few more times, but at differing points in the day, before I realized that all of these incidents had a commonality. My door was either open a crack or all the way, and everyone had to be asleep or I had to be home alone. So I started closing my door all the way, and it stopped. I haven't really heard from this thing since, so I hope whatever it was found its peace. At least this one was a pretty chill ghost. I talked to my sister about it. She says that some similarly weird stuff has happened to her since we moved in as well. This one actually happened this morning, right after I woke up. I kept trying to close my eyes to go back to sleep, but I kept hearing a tapping on my pillow. I couldn't feel it but I heard it every single time I closed my eyes. It continued until my mom came in and opened my door to let me know she was going somewhere. After that, the tapping stopped. So if I'm not crazy, either there's a new ghost or spirit that came in after one of my parents opened my door to check on me during the night, or it's the same one and it just got stuck after coming in during the same occurrence. If it's the same one, I'm really sorry it hasn't found its peace yet. If it's a new one, well, hope you like my house, I guess. After retiring from the service in 2009, I was in Iraq working as a contractor. My job entailed traveling all over the country, making sure specific things got done. Sounds like a lot, but it really wasn't. In the end of August of that year, I was detailed up to Mosul. I traveled, worked out the issues, and on the way back, I was directed to go through Balad to hitch a ride to Baghdad. While waiting for the ride in the air terminal, there was a battalion of army support folks who were also traveling. Many of them were sick, coughing and hacking up a lung. I tried to stay as far away from them as I could. My travel continued without them, but I was to live to regret it. A week later, I came down with swine flu, thanks to all that coughing and hacking. 
I went to the doctor on post, and because I was retired military, I was seen. He said that I was to immediately go into quarantine. My barracks did not have individual bathrooms, so I was led to the truck by my buddy and driven the five miles to the other side of the base complex to Camp Liberty. I was sent down the road past the PX, on down to the right-hand side past the Y, if you have been there you will understand, and almost to the end of the road, two large campsites short, down by the wreck yard, where they brought all the destroyed vehicles. Then, way back, to almost the eastern outside wall of the camp, I was one camp short of the wall. The camps were about 20 trailers long, all surrounded by concrete T-walls. You could drive between the rows. Then, ten of those rows wide made up a camp, with a large space to drive semi-trucks between each camp. My hut was the one on the end. It connected to another living space through a shared bathroom. My buddy kicked me out of the truck and I walked between the T-walls up to the door and opened it. The dust on the floor didn't bother me at first. Everything is dusty in Iraq. My buddy followed me in and we looked at the dusty, dusty accommodations. I walked over and flipped the mattress over to a clean side and sat down. The room had a desk, a walk-in closet, and the shared bathroom. It also had an air conditioner that, when turned on, pumped out very cool, sweet-smelling air. It was then when I noticed the calendar hanging on the wall, July 2007, two years before. My buddy told me that he would go and pick up my poncho liner and laptop that was in my day pack so that I could watch movies while I waited out my seven days of quarantine. He also told me that he would bring me meals during the days that I was staying there. I thanked him, and he left. It was mid-afternoon, and I was tired, so I laid down and tried to breathe while resting, feeling sick as a dog. It was then in the quiet that I thought I heard someone talking outside. I couldn't catch the conversation, which bothered me some, as I couldn't hear if they were speaking English or Farsi. The hut door was locked, and I went on through the bathroom to see if the other hut door was locked, which it was. I kept the lights off so that nobody would know that I was there and come looking. When my buddy came back, I told him what had happened. It was getting dark by then. He had brought my laptop, poncho liner, and as an afterthought, he included a nice tanto knife I traveled with as I was not supposed to have a firearm for some reason. He left and I curled up in my poncho liner, and soon I was fast asleep. I woke later that night, sleeping on my side, facing the wall. It had grown quite dark in the room. Still facing the wall, I could hear voices speaking quite softly, but this time distinctly. You ask him. No, you ask him. At this point, I was wide awake and staring at the wall. Did I forget to lock the door? Who was in here with me? Something kicked the bed frame, and I thought somebody was trying to figure out why I was sleeping in their room. So I rolled over and looked around, but no one was there. I got up and checked the doors and under the bed. You could say that I was somewhat shaken by the encounter thus far. After everything was checked, including the closet, I turned on the closet light, but I left it cracked open a bit. So I was in the shadows in the room, and the room was light so I could see the rest of it. If somebody was messing with me, I was not going to take it. I was sick and feeling pretty crappy and just over it. This time I wrapped up in the poncho liner facing the room. Things got quiet after a while, so I drifted off to sleep. I was awakened again about an hour later by these same voices asking the same thing. Only, this time, a voice stated clearly, I'll ask him. It was at this time that I was laying on my back, and something climbed up onto my bed and sat on my feet like you would do during the sit-up event for PT. Needless to say, I was wide awake, and they had my full attention. With a sharp intake of breath, what or whoever was sitting on my feet jumped off. I sat up, and there was nobody in the room that I could see. 
The smell in the room, which was cool and dusty, turned into a sharp, burned smell. I thought it was coming from the air conditioner, so I got up to check. When my back was turned, I heard the voice say distinctly, Ask him. I told them in my best SGM voice to stand easy and I would be with them in a minute. I walked to the door and went outside, leaving the door open. It was early morning and around 4 a.m. The sun was just starting to light up the sky. I sat down on the steps and waited for my buddy. At 6 o'clock a.m. he showed up and looked at me strangely, asking why I was out on the steps as he handed my breakfast to me. I told him we were leaving. He laughed and said, No, you have six more days of quarantine. Go back inside and relax. I looked at him and said, No, I'm good. He found me sitting in the shade of the tea wall for lunch, same for dinner. He was starting to wonder what was going on. I told him, I'll tell you if you take me away from here. He just laughed as he drove away. The same thing happened to me that night, and more. The next day I was sitting on the steps when four soldiers carried a private by the legs and arms into the room next to me and flung him on the bed. They dropped a box of MREs and a 12-pack of water, and laughing said, Later, loser. I stayed outside till around 2300 hours, and then I went in and prepped for the nightly activities. The following morning at about 5 a.m., I was sitting out on the steps when the door to the other hut burst open and a very scared private ran out. He looked left, then right, breathing pretty hard like he had just run a marathon. I smiled at him and said, how's it going? He sat down and tried to light a cigarette, but his hands were shaking so badly he couldn't light the match and gave up after a few seconds. I could tell he was pretty shaken up by something. He looked right at me and said, D did you? I said, you met them too, I see. And he calmed down a little. I said, I don't think they're gonna do any harm to you, but it is a little unsettling. He said, yeah, I'm leaving. They can't make me stay here. I laughed and said that I had four more days and could use the company. His mind was made up and when it got light, he went and packed up all his stuff and left. My buddy was true to his word, and each day he brought me breakfast, lunch, and dinner like clockwork, each time finding me sitting on the steps or in the shade with the door open, waiting. Finally, on the last day, he came by for lunch and said, Time to leave so we can go get pizza. I had all my stuff packed and shut the door and jumped in the truck. He asked, Now are you going to tell me what's going on? I told him, Not until we are far away from this place. We drove over to the belaying office to give the key back. We went inside and had to wait as a tall, muscular army CW4 was chewing out one of his soldiers. He was not in a good mood. When he was done, I walked up and introduced myself as the guy staying in the quarantine hut. He asked if there were any problems as he reached out for the key. I looked him in the eye and as he grabbed the key, I hung on and said, Chief. You need to cut that key and the key to the other side of that hut in half and never issue it to anyone again. He was not amused, asking if anything was wrong with the hut. I said, you just go and spend one night there and you'll understand why I'm telling you to cut those keys up. He got pissed and took the keys. I left with my buddy looking at me like I'd lost my mind. At pizza an hour later, I told my buddy what had happened that whole week, leaving nothing out. He thought I was full of crap. A week later, I was walking through the PX at Camp Liberty, looking at all the pod over items, thinking if I could use another t-shirt with a slogan on it, or a new 501 shirt with my buddy in tow, when down the aisle, I see the chief running at me. He grabs my arm and says, I cut the keys in half. I cut him in half, and no one under any circumstance will stay in those huts ever again. This shocked and surprised my buddy. The chief said he was pissed at me when I turned in the key, thinking I had trashed the place. We went over to check it out. It was getting dusk when he left. He found the rooms neat and tidy, but also found them, and they wanted to talk with him. 
I later learned that the camp was handed over to the Iraqi army. I always wondered who got those rooms, and just how that went for them. In summary, I think it was a unique experience. I think that there were approximately seven to ten distinct individual entities present at any given time during my stay. They never followed me outside or into the bathroom, which was nice of them. They did go from room to room where people were staying, making themselves known. It was usually in the late evening to early morning, usually gone before the sun was up. I felt that I couldn't really help them, but I did tell them that they were quite possibly dead and that they needed to move on. I didn't get any names from any of them. It just seemed that it wasn't important to them to tell me. It was more of a can you see me and do I exist type of experience. I've thought on this many times and I've told a few people. Most think it was made up because I was sick. I don't think so. Usually when I'm sick I dream about fly fishing in cool mountain streams, not ghosts chatting with me. The private and the chief were also involved, and I didn't know either of them before I was sent to quarantine. And when the chief was in there he wasn't even sick. So, who knows? So, in 2019, my family are all driving back from Narrabeen when we drove in Wakehurst Parkway. There is a legend of this road where a lady all in white is on the side of the road, and if you're not careful, she can appear in your car. So, like I said, we're driving back and it's about 9 p.m. We were in the thick brush area. My mother, brother, sister, and I were asleep. My father was the only one awake and was all alone, as he puts it. He said that he was driving when he saw this lady, all in white, standing on the side of the road. He freaked out, but continued to drive. However, he said he saw the same lady two minutes later, on the same side of the road. My father told us he was so freaked out that he tried to drive faster. Two minutes later, the same lady again. After we got home, he told us what had happened. Personally, I couldn't sleep for a night or so. Cancun was a paradise of blue skies and even bluer waters. The ocean was its own world, alive and whispering secrets through the currents. I'd spent the entire year looking forward to this snorkeling trip. My dad used to tell stories about how our ancestors were seafarers, explorers who mapped uncharted waters. I always felt a connection to the ocean that I couldn't explain like a song whose lyrics I had forgotten, but whose melody stayed with me. On the third day, armed with snorkeling gear and a waterproof camera, I took a boat trip to a secluded reef. The guide, Ricardo, assured me it was an extraordinary spot, a place where the sea unveiled its hidden beauty. As soon as I plunged into the water, I was in another realm. Schools of vividly colored fish danced around me. Corals stretched out like ancient cities, an underwater metropolis teeming with life. I lost track of time, mesmerized by the vibrant underworld. But as I swam farther from the other snorkelers, the scenery began to change. The water got darker, and the corals appeared older, their colors muted. I was about to turn back when something caught my eye, an object half buried in the sand below its outlines too straight and angular to be a natural formation. Curiosity pulling me deeper, I dove down for a closer look. What I found stopped me cold. A statue, humanoid but not human, its features a surreal blend of aquatic and terrestrial elements. It looked ancient, the material worn away by countless tides. It was the plaque at its base that took my breath away, literally and figuratively. 
My family's last name was etched onto it, Mendoza. I blinked, half expecting the letters to rearrange themselves, to make this bizarre occurrence some kind of misreading, but they remained, a cold testament set in stone. I took photos, my hands trembling. I had to show this to someone. I had to have proof that this wasn't some sort of underwater mirage. I quickly swam back to the boat, my heart pounding in a rhythm it had never known. When I showed Ricardo the pictures, he looked puzzled, and then concerned. This isn't something I've seen before, and I've been guiding tours for over a decade. You sure about the location? I nodded, pointing it out on the laminated ocean map he had on board. Ricardo scratched his head. That's not a typical spot for tourists. Too many local legends about sea spirits and forgotten gods. The fishermen avoid it. Ignoring my heightened sense of dread, I pressed him for more information. But he shook his head, reluctant to indulge in what he called superstitious nonsense. For the remainder of the trip, I couldn't get the statue and its plaque out of my mind. Who had put it there? How long had it been in the ocean? What did it mean? When I returned home, I showed the photos to my family. They were fascinated, but equally baffled. My dad, always the history buff, tried to dig into our family archives but came up empty. There were gaps in our lineage, periods where records were either incomplete or missing. Looks like our ancestors were good at keeping secrets, he mused. Weeks later, long after the trip, was a collection of photos and memories. Strange things began to happen. I found myself increasingly restless, a peculiar type of insomnia that left me tossing and turning, the sound of waves echoing in my ears even in the dead of night. Then I started to dream, visions of vast oceanscapes, of ancient rituals, of murmured incantations that seemed to flow from the statue's chiseled lips. Each morning, I would wake exhausted, like I'd been on an endless nocturnal journey. The final straw was the night I woke up to find my bed soaked, as though I'd been submerged in water. The room smelled of salt and seaweed, like a shoreline after high tide. And there on my nightstand sat a small shell, a type I had never seen before, its spirals forming a pattern eerily similar to the designs on the sunken statue's plaque. I booked a return trip to Cancun, this time alone. When I met Ricardo, I could see the unease in his eyes. You sure you want to go back there? I have to, was all I could say. As the boat neared the spot, my heart tightened in my chest. Donning my snorkeling gear, I plunged into the ocean, propelled by a force I couldn't deny. I reached the statue, its presence as unsettling as before. But now it felt like an unfinished chapter, conversation interrupted but not concluded. I took a piece of paper, a waterproof one, and a pencil from my gear. On the paper, I wrote my full name, then pressed it against the plaque, securing it with a small net bag usually used to collect underwater samples. Then I waited. It didn't take too long. The water around me began to churn, the sand swirling like a miniature storm. I felt a pull, not of the current, but something deeper, as if the ocean itself had gripped my soul. My vision blurred, and when it cleared, I was back on the boat, Ricardo staring down at me, his face pale as sea foam. We need to leave, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. As we sped back to shore, I looked at the photograph of the statue one last time, and then deleted it from my camera. Some mysteries, it seemed, demanded their own form of isolation, their secrets too heavy for the surface world. That night, in my hotel room, I found another shell on my pillow, identical to the first one, but this time it came with a note. Welcome home. I haven't gone snorkeling since, not because I'm afraid, but because I'm not sure what I'd be returning to. 
a world of coral and fish, or a lineage that stretches into the dark corners of the sea. And sometimes, when the night is still and the moon casts its glow on the water's surface, I hear whispers, voices that beckon, that plead, that promise. They call to me from depths I can't fathom, asking me to reclaim a legacy that was submerged long before I was born. And I wonder, with equal parts dread and longing, what would happen if I answered. It was meant to be a celebration. My buddies and I were camping along the Black River to commemorate graduating high school. We'd been planning this trip for weeks, ever since the invitation to a night of beer and bonfires deep in the forest came from Jake's older brother. He knew the area well from fishing trips. That first night went perfectly, drinking and joking around a crackling fire under more stars than I'd ever seen. Sometime after midnight, I wandered away from the group to take a leak. As I was zipping up, something in the river caught my eye. A dark, massive shape cruising slowly against the current. I stared, puzzlement turning to unease. It was no overturned log or debris. This shape had a defined head and body, with what looked like several limb-like appendages trailing behind. As the moon briefly illuminated its surface, I glimpsed something scaly and slick, something very much alive. I hustled back to the fire, trying to convince myself it was just an odd shadow, but a nagging dread lingered at the back of my mind. I didn't mention what I'd seen to the others. They were pretty hammered and would have just laughed it off. Eventually, I passed out in my tent. Sometime before dawn, I woke to urgent whispers right outside the tent flap. It was Jake and some others, crouched in a circle. What's up? I asked groggily, crawling out to join them. Jake shone his flashlight toward the tree line. Huge claw marks gouged deep into the bark of several trees, sap still oozing. The gashes were far taller than any animal native to these woods could make. What the hell did this? Jake breathed. I slowly told them about the dark shape I'd seen earlier in the river. As I described it, their eyes widened with fear. We agreed to pack up camp first thing in the morning, but morning would not come fast enough. Later that night, I was roused from my tent again by whoops and chaotic laughter from the group. They were gathered at the river's edge, chucking rocks and sticks into the water. I rushed over, convinced that they were drunkenly provoking whatever had left those gashes. Stop it, I hissed but no one would listen. They just jeered and kept throwing things. Suddenly, a monstrous shape exploded from the black water, not 20 feet from shore. I barely glimpsed black, scaly skin and huge claws before it disappeared with a splash. Everyone froze, mouths agape. Let's get the heck out of here, Jake said shakily. No one argued. We began tearing down camp as quietly as possible, but it was too late. An earth-shaking roar boomed out of the darkness, followed by a splashing charge through the shallows, straight toward us. Panicked, I sprinted for the trail that led back to the cars. Glancing back, I saw a hulking creature haul itself from the water. It stood upright on two muscular legs, black scales glistening. Moonlight glinted off rows of sharp teeth in its elongated, crocodile-like snout. Heavy claws flexed at its sides as it roared again in rage. Chaos erupted. My friends screamed and fled in all directions into the trees. I ran mindlessly through the darkness, hearing the beast's bellows and the crash of trees as it rampaged after us. Heavy footfalls pounded the earth uncomfortably close at times. Finally, I burst from the tree line onto the gravel lot where we had parked. Other panicked friends were already diving into their cars. I jumped into the back seat of the closest one. Tires spun as we peeled out and went careening down the dirt road away from that cursed place. 
Gasping for breath, I looked back and saw a dark shape appear from the trees at the lot's edge. It raised its crocodilian head toward our fleeting taillights and let loose an enraged primal scream that will haunt my dreams forever. In the frantic days that followed, we learned that two of our friends were dead and another missing, presumably taken by the demon that dwells in the Black River. Efforts to find their remains came up empty. The authorities blamed wild animals, but we knew the truth, and we vowed never to speak of the horror we had witnessed or to go anywhere near those woods again. I've worked in multiple prisons. Due to privacy reasons, I won't name them. I wasn't at this particular prison for very long, and due to the notoriety of this specific inmate, it will give away that prison's location, but that's fine. I worked in the prison that holds Florida's death row at one point in my career, before transferring to a prison that was a lot closer to home. Due to the fact that I am a woman, they really didn't want me on the row unless it was for training. I was training, and during my training, I was given a tour of the row and the death chamber. Our death chamber is comprised of two rooms. One holds our gurney for lethal injection, and one holds our electric chair. I wasn't technically working on the row, but we did have an inmate who was on death watch, and there needed to be an officer in there 24-7. Death watch is where the inmate is moved to the final holding cell until the execution, where they receive their last meal and everything like that. An officer came to relieve me for a 15-minute break, and due to the size of this prison, I couldn't walk out and have a cigarette in time. I decided to explore a little bit on my break out of morbid curiosity. I walked into the room with the gurney and saw it from the window, and felt my heart sink, knowing that the inmate that I was watching over would be strapped down to it in just a few hours. He ended up getting a stay of execution, however, so that never ended up happening. I ended up finding myself in the room with the chair, and when I did, something felt really off. I felt a mix of feelings, despair, anxiety. My mind was racing. I felt uneasy, and I turned to leave the room when I heard, you didn't think I would be back, huh? I felt like I was in an arctic tundra. I began to shiver. My spine was tingling. I was frozen in fear because I knew that I had entered that chamber alone. I forced myself to turn around. I had my pepper spray in my hand just in case I ran into an inmate that had somehow escaped from the row. I did run into an inmate, but definitely not the one that I was expecting to. I was staring dead into the face of Ted Bundy, sitting in the chair that he died in. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. My heart was racing, and I felt like fainting. I began to back away, slowly. It was like he was alive. He wasn't see-through. It was like he was really there. The only way that I would have ever known this was an apparition was because that I knew that he'd been executed in the 80s. But still frozen in fear, I watched what appeared to be an alive and solid Ted Bundy disappear like he'd never been there in the first place. I got the hell out of there and was pretty much unable to speak to anybody for the rest of the day. Static Memories on Route 9 I was already regretting the decision to stay at the dilapidated motel off Route 9. The carpet had seen better days, the wallpaper was peeling, and the fluorescent light overhead flickered in a way that would give anyone a headache. But it was late, and driving farther wasn't an option. After unpacking a few essentials, I turned on the old radio that sat on the nightstand 
hoping to fill the room with something other than the sound of my own thoughts. A burst of static filled the air before settling into the smooth velvet tones of a late night radio host. Just past midnight, folks, he announced. Time for some stories that'll make you question the very fabric of reality. I scoffed. Late night radio always had a flair for the dramatic. The host began recounting tales from callers, a UFO sighting here, a ghostly apparition there. All typical stuff, until he said something that made my blood run cold. Here's a story we received by mail, no return address. It's about a young man who made a tough choice a few years back. I listened, increasingly puzzled, as the host began detailing an event from my past a choice I had made that affected the trajectory of my life, an agonizing decision about leaving a life behind for a new job opportunity in another state. How it had torn me apart, the details of the solitary night I had wrestled with my choice, right down to the glass of stale whiskey, and the worn notebook in which I had jotted down the pros and cons of my options. No one knows about this, I muttered to myself, my hands gripping the edge of the bed. I never told anyone. The host's voice continued, an eerie calm in his words. The man always wondered what would have happened had he chosen differently. A life of what ifs and maybes. We're sending out a message, friend. If you're listening, just know the path not taken isn't always the path not lived. The broadcast suddenly cut out, plunging the room into static noise before the radio turned off entirely. My heart pounded in my chest, each beat echoing the unspoken fears I had carried ever since making that life-altering choice. I didn't sleep at all that night, tossing and turning, half expecting that radio to come back to life with another chapter from my past. But it remained silent, an old electronic relic looking strangely innocent in the light of dawn. Morning came, and I left the motel as soon as I could, leaving the key at an unmanned front desk. As I got in my car and started the engine, I took one last look in the rearview mirror. I almost expected to see some dreary radio host standing in the doorway, but there was nothing, just the empty parking lot and a nondescript motel facade. I drove away, each mile putting distance between me and the inexplicable events of the night before but the words of the radio host stayed with me. Was it a message meant for me or just some really eerie coincidence? I'll never know for sure. But sometimes when I'm alone and the night is deep, I can't help but wonder about the other paths my life could have taken. I'm always left with this disquieting thought that somewhere in some parallel frequency of existence, another version of me made a different choice and he's listening to a radio that tells my story instead. My mother went to Eastern Washington University and stayed in one of the houses the locals rented out to college students. I can't give the exact age of the house, but it was old enough to have a built-in button on the floor that would call up the servants to the attic, so the house was relatively old. During her studies there, she had three different roommates. My uncle was the first, who then was replaced by my mother's best friend, who was then replaced by my father. All three of them can confirm strange happenings in this house and being woken up in the middle of the night with people whispering. The worst of it was in my mother's room in the attic. My mother hated that house, but she didn't have anywhere else to live, and the dorms were expensive, so she sucked it up and lived there until she graduated. She hated sleeping alone. The air in her room constantly felt thick and heavy. Her closet was constantly freezing cold, and at night, she would hear multiple people whispering incoherent words all at once. While living there, my mother had a cat named Puss, like Puss in Boots, who would constantly hide under the bed. 
One time, my mother caught the cat out from under her bed, sitting, watching, and growling at one of the corners of the room. My mom went over to the cat, confused at what she was looking at, until she saw a black figure in the corner slowly start to move upwards toward the ceiling. Puss started to become more aggressive, her hissing and growling getting louder before she freaked out and shot off back under the bed, still growling at the corner until the figure was gone. My mother had never seen the cat act like this, since she was usually a very loving and happy cat, but whatever that was clearly terrified her. Sometime later, my mother was talking with a friend who was excited to be touring two famous paranormal investigators around the college and town, showing them supposedly haunted places. My mother brought up the fact that she has always had weird things happen in her house and thinks it might be haunted. Her friend got all excited and begged her to let him bring them to her house. My mother refused since she wasn't willing to stay up late for some people she doesn't even know. My mother didn't know at the time who these investigators were, since she never really kept up with paranormal stuff, believing that doing so can let evil into your life. She only knew that they were on quite a few popular talk shows at the time. It turns out that these two investigators were Ed and Lorraine Warren. Around midnight, my mother's best friend comes to her and tells her that there are people at the door who want to speak to her. Confused, my mother put on a robe and went to the front door. There she saw her tour guide friend with 12 other students behind Ed and Lorraine Warren. Lorraine asked my mother if they could come in as their guide had told them that it was possible her house was haunted. My mother agreed and let them all in. Lorraine asked my mother where in the house the haunting was more active and my mother told her that it was in the bedroom, that she would take Ed and Lorraine there but everyone else had to wait. They agreed, and my mother took Ed and Lorraine to her room. When my mother entered the room, she sat on her bed and asked if they could feel it, how heavy the air was. Ed and Lorraine agreed that the air was heavy. Lorraine walked around the room to the closet and asked if she could hear voices here. My mother broke down crying and said she could hear them every night and that it kept her up at night. Lorraine told her it was possible that her closet was a doorway for people who had passed on or a doorway to hell. My mother continued to cry before Lorraine came over to her and told her that the reason these things are happening is because of her mom's family, that the women have some connection with those beyond, and that it's possible that they are psychics, which makes the dead more attracted to her. My mother then told Lorraine about the black figure, which Lorraine told her wasn't from this house, but was connected to her family, mainly on her dad's side and that it was most likely something that went after her grandfather, her father, and now her. The figure wasn't a ghost or a demon, but just something that was pure evil and wanted her. Fearful, my mother asked them if they could bless her room, which they did, and after further investigation of the house, Ed and Lorraine told her that her house was the first place that actually showed activity and signs of a haunting in the whole area. After they finished blessing the house, Ed and Lorraine left. Time passed and my mom's best friend moved out and my dad moved in. The activity in the house still continued even after the blessing. At first, my father was skeptical of the house being haunted until one night while sleeping in my mom's bed, he heard the whispering. He asked my mother what she said and she told him she didn't say anything. After a few moments of silence between them, she asked if he could hear them. Confused, my father asked what she was talking about. She said, the whispering. He then agreed that he heard the whispering and asked where it was coming from. She said that it was coming from the closet and that it happens every night. Sometime after, my father got curious about whether or not that servant spell still worked. Originally, no one had ever been up to the attic. Both of my parents made their way up to the attic, but never reached the top. Since on their way there, both of my parents felt like they couldn't breathe as the temperature dropped into the freezing ranges. My mother started to panic and she felt like she was being choked. She quickly told my father to turn back around because it felt as though they weren't wanted up there. Not wanting to upset my mother even more, my father agreed and turned back around, never to go up there again. 
Once my mother graduated from college, they moved out of the house, and strange events continued to happen no matter where they moved. Around the time that I was born, my parents lived in a rather small house with my two older brothers. Constantly, our cats would freak out, growling and hissing at the corners of the house. Not only that, but my mother would constantly see this black figure around the house. Later, my family had our new house constructed and we moved out of our old one. These strange events followed us and got worse. One day when I was around five, I was walking outside my room to walk downstairs. The moment I walked to the balcony, I felt somebody grab my arm extremely roughly. I turned around and all I see is this black figure holding my arm. I scream for my mother. My mother comes running up the stairs and she sees the figure. She grabs my arm and tries to pull me away, but the figure will not let me go. She pulled as hard as she could and ripped me away from it. As she does this, the figure disappears and a giant hand mark is left on my arm. My mother runs downstairs and screams at my father to get my brothers and that they were leaving the house until it was blessed. We later had a priest come to our house and bless it. Afterward, the activity stopped, but growing up, my second older brother and I would constantly have nightmares of this figure in our dreams, doing awful things to us. But in our dreams, it had bright red eyes and would chase us. Nothing else has happened since then and I still live in the house. But every once in a while, I get this sudden fear from the staircase. I never go downstairs at night without the lights on, out of fear that this thing is possibly still here. I had spoken to my mother about the dreams and stuff that happened to her, but she tries to avoid talking about it, since she believes the more we talk about it, the more it will come back. She has told me, though, that she spoke with my grandfather about this figure, he refused to talk much about it, since the first time she brought it up, he went pale as a ghost. He said that figure used to torment him as a child, and his dad would tell him about the figure and how it would come for him, as it did with my grandfather. My mother didn't realize that it was Ed and Lorraine Warren until we were watching a documentary about them. She points to them and says, those are the ones that came to my house. I was speechless and she was confused. I told her that they were THE Ed and Lorraine Warren, the most famous paranormal investigators ever, pretty much, that they were the ones who started publicly doing paranormal investigations, and that there are famous horror movies that involve them. My mother freaks out and tells my father about it, and while my father was shocked, he didn't think much of it. I'm sorry if this story is a little all over the place, but it's the best attempt I have to explain my mother's story and my experience, since my mother doesn't like to talk about it much out of fear. I was working as a correctional officer in the state of Florida. I have a ton of stories, but I just want to tell one this time. I'll start with my first experience ever in the prison. It was my first week, probably my third day on the compound. We have to count inmates, so I was working a 16-hour shift. During the night shift, there's nothing to do. So we count the inmates who were locked in cells hourly. It was the 2 a.m. count and I was in a tea dorm. Tea dorms, obviously by the name, are shaped like a T. There are two stories, and I was on the second story on the right side of the wing. The very first cell that I went up to, an older white inmate had his face against the glass. Inmates like to gun officers. I'll let you figure out what that means, but I wouldn't Google it. And I had been gunned quite a few times in the short amount of time that I had been there. Being gunned was something I didn't tolerate, so I told this inmate that he needed to be back in his bunk by the time I came back from counting the rest of the wing, or I'd make sure to throw the handcuffs on him. He didn't say anything. I wrote down the cell number and continued my count. It was the first cell on the wing, so I wouldn't have forgotten which cell it was anyway. I continued my count and went back to that cell to make sure that this inmate was back in his bunk. After shining my flashlight in the room, I counted two inmates, 
but these inmates were neither old nor white. I obviously freaked out, and I told the officer in the station once I got back. This officer told me that the guy's name is Kevin, and he does this all the time. I explained that this guy was white, and that neither of the guys in the cell were, so what gives? He said, oh, well, Kevin's dead. I actually found him after he smoked himself to death on K2 mixed with rat poison three months before you got here, actually. Prisons are not silent places, and I have a ton of stories, but that one was my first hell of an introduction. This happened when my boyfriend and I went to Florida, specifically Miami, for our winter break. This was literally right before the pandemic hit America. Most news was still about China, so we were still allowed to travel. We were having dinner at this barbecue place that we found while we were driving around. We couldn't decide what to eat, so we just agreed to stop at the next place we drove past. Neither of us can even recall the name of the place, and the food was meh. Anyway, we were finishing up and the waitress comes and passes us the bill. Like, okay, that's normal. The thing is, both my boyfriend and I was so sure that he had picked up the bill, slid his credit card there, and left it on the table. Like, it happened so naturally. It was such a routine thing to do, we weren't paying attention, but I could have sworn that I saw him take the check. So then comes a random waiter who didn't serve us at all that night, and picks up the bill. Then the original waitress who had served us comes back two minutes later and tells us we forgot the card. Inside the book thing that they give back to you, there was nothing. When my boyfriend checked his wallet, the card was gone. We were so dumbfounded. The next ten minutes, my boyfriend and the staff were searching for this card, which was nowhere to be found. And mind you, our table was like less than ten feet away. Anyone would have noticed a card dropping on the floor. The waiters and waitresses swore that it was empty from the second they picked up this checkbook thing. Even if they wanted to steal it, why would they take that risk? It makes no sense. And my boyfriend even waited a day to see if there was any activity on his card, but there was nothing. He cancelled it later. What's weird is that we also couldn't remember who the waitress or waiter was that was involved with the bill, even right after it happened. The whole thing was just so weird. And honestly, we never even saw that second waiter again. I'm not sure if it was a glitch or what, but it was just strange. I was in Florida for a high school marching band trip. This was about three to four years ago. We were to march in the Disney parade as the marching band, so we got to spend time in Florida and we went to all the theme parks, including Universal. One day when we were in Clearwater, this event occurred. Three guys who were a part of my group and I were chilling on the beach, far away from most other people. All of a sudden, I heard a really dark, deep voice say, It wasn't like a yell, so it didn't make me look around or anything. In fact, it almost felt more like a thought in my mind, but it was very clear and distinct. I was kind of shook for a second, but I didn't really want to mention anything to the guys I was with. After about a minute, one of them asked, Did you guys hear that? Instantly, I asked, the no? Everybody had heard that exact same no, with a deep male voice. It sounded very close, as I said, basically like a thought. And again, the nearest people were easily 60 feet away, and it was a mom and her kids. As a sound engineer, I can confidently say that a man with a deep voice couldn't say a soft no loud enough from over a hundred feet away 
to make it feel like it was inside our very heads, especially with all the chatter from everybody else on the beach and the sounds of the ocean muffling it. That's it, though. Nothing else happened, so I mean, it's not a super interesting story, but I 100% believe that there's something out there now. I just don't know what it is. I was never a fan of long-haul flights. Hours confined in a metal tube surrounded by strangers. To pass the time, I usually toggled between in-flight movies and the digital tracker that displayed our plane's current location. On this particular international flight, I decided to check the tracker again, something to take my mind off the tightening muscles in my back. A quick glance at the screen, and my eyes narrowed. We were way off course. According to the map, our plane was headed toward an island in the middle of the ocean. An island that I'm pretty sure wasn't even supposed to be there. Puzzled, I hit the call button for the flight attendant. When she arrived, I pointed at the screen. Is this thing accurate? I said. She leaned in to look. Oh, these trackers can be a little glitchy sometimes. Don't worry, the pilots know where we're going. Despite her reassurances, the sinking feeling in my gut persisted. I couldn't ignore the hard data staring back at me. We were heading into uncharted territory, and it seemed like I was the only one who cared. An hour passed, then two. The tracker showed us getting closer to the mysterious island, while the rest of the plane's occupants were either asleep or engrossed in their entertainment screens. I had to do something. I unbuckled my seatbelt and headed for the restroom, strategically located near the cockpit. Waiting for the perfect moment, I saw a flight attendant push a cart into the galley. I seized the opportunity, knocking softly on the cockpit door. One of the pilots opened it, a hint of annoyance in his eyes. Can I help you? I'm sorry for the interruption, I said quickly. But according to the in-flight tracker, we're heading toward an island that's not on any map? Is that a glitch, or...? The pilots exchanged glances. The tension in the cockpit was palpable. Come in, the second pilot said, ushering me inside. I stepped into the cockpit, the array of controls and screens glowing in the semi-darkness. The main navigation system confirmed what I'd seen on my tracker. We were off course, headed toward an anomaly. We've been trying to correct it, the first pilot said. The navigation system deviated on its own about two hours ago. Manual overrides aren't working. We're stuck on this trajectory. Shouldn't we inform the passengers? I asked, my voice tinged with urgency. And say what? That we're flying blind toward an island that doesn't exist? The second pilot shook his head. Panic is the last thing we need. For a brief moment, I contemplated rushing out, alerting everyone, forcing the issue. But the potential chaos held me back. What good would it do? Look, said the first pilot, if you have any ideas on how to fix this, we're all ears. Otherwise, please return to your seat. We're doing everything we can. Resigned, I exited the cockpit, closing the door behind me. I returned to my seat eyes flicking back to the tracker. Closer and closer we moved toward the Phantom Island, its outline growing more distinct. The flight continued in its eerie silence, the tension in my body building with each passing minute. And then it happened. The plane began to descend. Seatbelt signs flashed on and the cabin crew prepared for landing. We were committed now, come what may. As the wheels touched down on a makeshift runway, I stared out of the window. The island was real, its terrain lush and untamed. We taxied to a stop, the engines winding down, the weight of the unknown settling over us. The cabin door opened, stairs deployed, and we stepped out, passengers and crew alike, into the island's embrace. 
there were no signs of human life. No structures, no reception committees, just wilderness stretching out in every direction, and an ocean whose horizon held no promise of rescue. We had landed on an uncharted island, a place that defied maps and logic, carried here by a plane that refused to obey its pilots. Where we were, why we were here, and what it meant, those questions hovered in the thick, humid air, unanswered. Days turned into weeks. Rescue never came. We adapted, survival outweighing understanding. The island became home, its inexplicable presence a riddle interwoven into the fabric of our new reality. The outside world faded into an abstraction, as distant as the stars that watched over us each night. The flight that vanished off the radar, the passengers who disappeared into thin air, the plane that went where it shouldn't, all became the stuff of headlines, then theories, then myths. But for us, it became life. A life off course, off map, on an island that didn't exist until it did. This happened when I was in middle school. I'm about to graduate high school. I still remember every detail to this day. When I was younger, my mother sent my siblings and I to this cute little summer camp in the mountains. It was one week in the middle of nowhere. No cell service, no quick way to reach anybody, and we were miles and miles from the nearest town. This event happened in my third year of attendance. The way these campsites were set up goes as follows. You were split up by gender and age group. Each campsite had four cabins with five raised beds in each and one lean-to for the assigned camp counselor. So in your cabin, you've got four buddies that you get to know fairly well throughout the week. There's also no bathrooms at the campsites. So if you had to go, you would have to get the TP from your counselor and go into the woods. We were about 12 at the time, so we always had to go with a buddy. This one night, a girl in my cabin, who I had become pretty close with throughout the week, was just talking to me in the dark of our cabin about absolutely nothing. Just two kids who couldn't sleep. So we opted to stay up and talk until we could sleep. Eventually, she tells me she has to go to the bathroom and asks if I'll go with her. I say, yeah, no biggie. So we grab our flashlights and sandals and hike over to get some TP. And then we go back past our cabin. Ours was the farthest out on the edge of our campsite, a good 20 feet from the other cabins. And we go a little ways into the woods. I stand on the path while she goes up into the trees to do her business. Again, we're 12. It's cold, and we're both afraid of the dark. So she asks me to keep talking to her so she doesn't freak herself out. So we're talking about nothing, and I'm doing that little step dance you do when you're cold, swishing my flashlight around to see if I'd find anything cool. I almost never go to the mountains, and I just wanted to know if there'd be any cool plants or animals that I could see in the distance. I stop as my light lands about 13 feet away from me. I was dead in my tracks. To this day, I don't know what else to describe this thing as other than the description of the rake from that creepypasta story. I know how childish that sounds, but it's the only comparison I had in my head. It looked freakishly lanky extremely decrepit, pale, hairless, like a person, but definitely not a person. I could only see its head, shoulders, and from its forearms to its fingers, it stretched out as if it was crawling down the path. It had long, spindly fingers that seemed to sharpen at the end. I really don't know if I was looking at nails and claws or if its skin was just stretched like that. Its head was pointed slightly downward, 
and I would later figure that it was as if it was trying to avoid the light beam, but I could still see its eyes. Eyes that still make me shiver if I think about it too long. Large, black ones. I don't know if it was extremely dilated pupils, or if its eyes were just black, but it was like the eyes themselves bulged out of its head. I was too scared to shine my light any farther, and I could see one of its hands slowly creeping toward me. I was petrified in my spot. I didn't move my light off of it once I saw it. I didn't know what to do. I wasn't going to just leave this girl out there if it actually was something that might have hurt her. I told her to hurry up. She asked me why my voice was shaking. I remember saying, I, I don't want you to freak out. It's probably nothing. I I'll tell you when we get back. But uh, w when you're done, just tell me. Because we're going to make a run for the cabin. Okay? That really made her move. I felt bad for scaring her, but I myself was terrified. I heard her say, done, and I just told her to run. I spun around, finally taking my light off of it, and sprinted so quickly that I caught up to her in seconds. This might have been my own heartbeat pulsing in my ears, but I was sure I could hear it almost galloping behind me. We were both moving so quickly that we slipped a bit on the leaves in front of our cabin door. I remember two of the other girls waking up when the door slammed behind us as I fumbled with the hook that would lock it. I don't really know how I thought that would help though. It was a poor lock. My friend was freaking out, asking me what I saw and practically begging me to tell her I was pranking her. I couldn't say anything though as I had begun to have one of the worst panic attacks in my life. My breathing became audibly labored and someone had to get up to get our camp counselor, which is what got me talking again. She got about halfway to the door before I said, no, and that was what made everyone more freaked out. Eventually our counselor heard us and came to the cabin. Someone opened the door for her and she came in wanting to know why I was crying so viciously and why everyone was panicked. I was able to piece together a coherent enough sentence that she got the gist. Obviously, she didn't believe me, who would, but she finally gave up on trying to convince me when she offered to go with me to confirm there was nothing there, and I just kept crying harder at the thought. I slept in the lean-to with her for the rest of the week. I'll be the first to admit that I can't honestly know what I saw. I was 12, it was dark, and I was tired, with probably an overactive imagination. But I know that staring off into the dark has never struck such terror into me like that before. I know that figure that I saw, I just don't know what to call it. I still don't really know what to make of it, but I think about it every summer. All my life, my mom has always unwillingly been a magnet for paranormal activity. She never spoke of it. She thought of it as a curse that plagued her. Once at around two in the morning, I found her sitting at the dining room table sitting stock still, smoking cigarette after cigarette, staring into the living room with all the lights off. The cigarette smoke was settling at about the halfway point in the room so it looked like a low, stagnant cloud, adding to the suddenly alarming feeling of the space. I called out to her, but she didn't respond. She just sat there, the ember of the Marlboro brightening with every drag. You could hear the crisp sound of the burning tobacco as she inhaled. I just stood there, arms crossed, chilled from the night air, looking at her in confusion. N Mom? Mom, are you okay? She just sat there, silent, stoic, staring at nothing. Another drag, and then 
Finally, she said something. They just walk through. They, they just walk through here. I don't know where they're going. I scanned the room, goosebumps shivering up my arms. Who, Mom? Who walks through? Nothing. I was young and fairly creeped out, so I just backed up slowly and quietly went back to bed, closing and locking my bedroom door. The next morning, I asked her what that was all about, and she acted like it was nothing. Like I'd had some bad dream and thought it was real. She completely played it off like I was the crazy one to think that she would ever do something like that. And then she said, you know I quit smoking six months ago. Stuff like that happened all the time. These little incidents that she was part of but would never acknowledge after they happened. I know she had some gift or power or something, but she never actually told me about it. I think because she hoped whatever it was wouldn't find an attachment to her sons. It did anyway. It was my first year back from college. I was asleep in my bed, briefs only, the morning sunlight streaming into my room and waking me from my dreams. It was warm and bright. I can still feel the way the sun felt on my skin that morning as I lay on my stomach, blankets thrown asunder by the vigorous sleeper that I was. The day was going to be beautiful, and I was thinking about what I'd do first after breakfast. I was facing the wall opposite the doorway of my room, staring at the cocoon movie poster that I loved so much, when I heard my bedroom door creak open. Mom checking on me before she headed to work. Only, suddenly, something felt off. I could hear the door opening. I knew the sound of that door as well as I knew every creak and groan of the house that I'd grown up in. I knew what it sounded like when it was opened all the way, but... It didn't open all the way. It stopped suddenly. It was like the minute that I recognized something was off, the door just stopped moving. Like lightning, a wave of terror rushed through my body, washing through me like an icy wave. I was fully awake instantly and paralyzed with fear. Completely paralyzed. It wasn't my mom. I knew it. Whatever it was, it was not my mom. I couldn't move, I couldn't yell, I just lay there, completely terrified. Then it started moving toward me. I could hear the steps on the carpet. My heart was pounding so hard I thought it would burst. I was so scared, the tears started streaming from my eyes. I could feel it stop, hovering over me, looking down. I kept praying that it wouldn't touch me. Please don't touch me. I could feel it reaching out, its arms extending, moving to rest a hand on the small of my back. I managed to close my eyes and decided that I was not going to let this happen. I was going to count to three and gather all of my strength and jump up and scream. I was going to break this paralysis. As I made this decision, I felt the arm stop. It stopped right over my body. I felt the presence freeze. So I gathered all my energy and I tried to count to three and move, but I was still so scared that nothing happened. I barely moved an inch. I closed my eyes again and focused harder than I ever have on anything in my life and managed to roll myself off the bed and squeak out a meager yelp. It was enough, though. I hit the ground hard, breathing heavily and sweating from either fear or the suddenly hot sunlight streaming through my window. My bedroom door was closed. There was nothing around me. The presence was gone. I threw open the door and ran up the stairs to the living room where my mom was getting ready to go to work. You're up. I was just about to go down there and say good morning. Bright. Cheery like nothing had happened. You weren't just in my room, checking on me or something? I said, wiping sweat from my forehead, completely confused. She gave me an odd look. No, and for God's sake, put some clothes on. I'll see you tonight. After that, she was gone. That was the first time. 
but since then it's followed me everywhere I go. I don't feel it all the time. Sometimes years go by, but it always comes back. I don't know if I will ever find out what it is. My mom passed two years ago. With her gone, I can only hope that she tries to protect me from whatever this is. This isn't the only experience I've had either. It's just the one that profoundly affected me. At first I thought it was a sleep issue, but the problem is, I was awake the whole time. I remember seeing the wall, the poster, the bright room, feeling the sheets beneath me, the smell of the fabric softener. I'm no fool. The first thought I had was that it was a dream. But I was going through the logic of what was happening to me, and I knew that it wasn't. That, coupled with our family's history, my mom's experiences, my experiences, I knew something was happening. We traveled everywhere, all over the world and the country. I think we picked up something, somewhere, and I think my mom knew it. This wasn't the first thing that happened, it was just the biggest. One day, I'll tell you about our house on Park Place in Florida. That is where I began to think that my mom had secrets she didn't want to share. But I guess some secrets I'll never know. As an experienced backpacker and nature photographer, I've hiked hundreds of miles through remote wilderness over the years, but nothing could prepare me for the terror I experienced last week while camping alone in the Boundary Waters. I had hiked deep into the network of lakes and streams, excited to spend a few days completely immersed in nature and solitude. The first night went perfectly. I cooked dinner fireside as the sun set, and then curled up in my tent listening to loons call across the lake. The next morning, I set off hiking again with my camera, hoping to photograph some wildlife. I stopped frequently to snap photos of birds, deer, and other creatures. Late in the afternoon, I came across huge, mysterious tracks in the mud along the trail. They looked somewhat human, but enormous, with only four toes. Unease trickled down my spine, but I shook it off and continued. I set up camp that evening on a scenic ridge. While boiling water for my freeze-dried dinner, the forest suddenly fell eerily silent. The birds even stopped singing. Every nerve tingled with the sense something was watching me. Glancing up, I saw a face peering from the brush chalk white skin, sunken eyes, and a lipless mouth gazing right at me. I shouted in alarm, jumping back. The face vanished. I grabbed a stick from the fire and thrust it toward the bushes, hands shaking, but nothing was there. I spent that night huddled by the dying fire, unable to sleep. At dawn, I discovered enormous man-like footprints circling my tent and, dragging from the bushes, a long trail where something heavy had been pulled into the forest. Fighting panic, I decided to hike out as fast as possible. All day, I had the creepy feeling of being followed. Twice, I heard odd whooping cries from a ridge parallel to me. They didn't sound like any normal animal. At one point, across a stream, a dead deer lay mutilated as if flung savagely against a tree trunk. Nerves on edge, I pushed onward. I hiked hours past my usual stopping time, desperate to put distance between me and that thing. Exhausted, I finally made camp after nightfall in a meadow. I boiled water for dinner, but was too wired to eat. The woods were silent as a crypt. Later, drifting off to sleep, I dreamed of hearing footsteps outside the tent. Suddenly, the tent unzipped, and I awoke with a start to see a pale, grinning face staring down from the opening, empty black eyes meeting mine. I screamed and kicked out wildly, 
The face vanished. Heart racing, I peered outside with my flashlight. Huge, bare footprints surrounded the tent, but the night was still in quiet once more. At dawn, I packed up and practically ran the last few miles back to my truck, constantly glancing over my shoulder. Only when I was driving away did I finally relax, profoundly thankful to have escaped with my life. This is a family story that happened sometime in the late 80s, I believe. For context, I have a huge family, German-Irish Catholic, and growing up we always had big family parties for birthdays, holidays, and other events. My mom, several aunts, grandma, and great-grandma were at my grandma's house cleaning up after a party late at night. It was probably 10 or 11. My great-grandma went to bed. She lived with my grandparents due to dementia and the lack of resources for the elderly during that time. My great-grandma came out to the living room in her nightgown and said, There's a man outside of my window. Understandably disturbed, a few of the group go into her room and look outside the window. The backyard is not very large. It was mostly ivy and gardens. There is an iron bench with a vintage lamp post next to it had a very early 1900s look to it. There was no sign of anyone outside. Chalking it up to dementia, my grandma said, there's no one there. It's okay. Go back to bed. The group continued cleaning while listening to music and goofing around. My great grandma came out again and said there was a man outside her window. The group walked back into her bedroom to look out the window once more. There was an exchange between my grandma and my great-grandma. Where is the man that you're seeing? My grandma asked. He just knocked on the window. He wants me to come outside, said my great-grandmother. What does he look like? Asked my grandma. Oh, he's very handsome. He's wearing an all-white suit with a top hat and white shoes. He wants me to come outside and meet the lady. What lady? My grandma asked her. The pretty lady on the bench, don't you see her? She's wearing a very nice pink dress. At this point, my mom, aunts, and grandma are pretty freaked out. They turn on every light and search the backyard. There's no sign of anyone, or of anyone having been there. Everyone decides that her dementia is progressing faster than they thought, and they called it a night. The next morning, my grandma gets a phone call from some family in California. They were calling to say that my great-grandma's sister had passed the night before. My grandma was obviously upset, especially because as far as she knew, her aunt was in relatively good health. My grandma composed herself and asked, Was she sick? What happened? The family member from California said, Not as far as we know but she must have known it was coming. Why do you say that? My grandma asked. Because she fell asleep in her bed that night, wearing her favorite pink dress. A month ago, my neighbor passed away in her sleep. She was kind and always made a point to say hi to everyone and wish everybody a blessed day. She even went out of her way to wish me a Merry Christmas when I got home from the hospital last year on Christmas Eve. After her passing, weird things started happening, and it's not just in my apartment. My other neighbors, there's eight households in our building, have all experienced weird things. It started with hearing someone shuffle up and down my hallway, which I believed was my roommate at the time. I later found out that he wasn't even home at night because he worked overnights during that month, so it couldn't have been him. Once my roommate moved out, the activity got weirder and weirder. 
I started hearing someone knock on the door every morning at 3 a.m. We would check and no one would be there. At first we thought we were being ding-dong ditched until we heard a knock, went to go check, saw no one, and then as we were closing the door, heard the knock again. The door was still partially open, so we knew that there wasn't anyone there to do it. After that, I started having trouble sleeping. Even now, I only sleep two hours a night if I'm lucky. Because of this, I'm usually the witness of it all. I think that whatever is here knows that. I've heard doors opening and closing, my windows sliding open, and my drawers on my dresser slamming shut. The most profound experience was when my fiancé and I were just going to bed and hadn't turned off the light yet, when a shadow figure ran into our room and headed straight for the closet. We both sat, frozen in fear, and watched the closet door for a few minutes. Once we calmed down, he laid down, and in between us, we heard someone whisper, What are you doing tomorrow? Clear as day. The weird thing about all of this is, that I know the shadow and the things that happening aren't my neighbor. Yet they all started when she died. My neighbors say that they hear knocking and running too, but they didn't say anything about ghosts or shadow people. They all said it's probably some kids doing the ding-dong ditch thing. I don't think it's people doing it unless kids have found a way to become invisible while knocking on doors. Even as I'm typing the story, I hear loud footsteps in the hallway. There's no one here. I have the door open, and I don't see a single person. I'm honestly terrified. I think we're being haunted by something, but it's far too creepy and evil feeling to be my nice neighbor. Have you ever heard of Great Wolf Lodge, the huge indoor water park packed with arcades, restaurants, and basically everything you could imagine? Well, I've been there twice, and the first time I had an experience that I wouldn't wish on anyone. I was there with my brother, my aunt and uncle, and my cousin. We got a room that came with the kid cabin. All that was in the kid cabin was a bunk bed, a small TV, a nightstand, and some cool paintings on the wall. The first night was fine. I slept on the top bunk and Natalia, my cousin, slept on the bottom. The next day, my cousin begged to sleep on the bottom bunk again. So me, wanting the top bunk anyway, allowed it. I stayed up really late that night. I mean, not really, it was like 10.30, but being seven, I thought it was so cool. All I had for light was a small 3DS light. As I started to fall asleep and put down the game, I heard my cousin laughing. Well, more of a giggle. What's so funny? I asked, laughing a little myself. Stop, you're scaring me, she replied, her laughter fading a bit. Well, what? I responded, confused and a bit scared. How are you making that face? All of her laughter had poured out of that innocent seven-year-old's voice by now. I was rushing to turn on my 3DS for the light. I asked, what do you mean? I'm up here. She paused. Who is that? She said, realizing that whoever she was talking to wasn't me at all. She started to cry and call for me. The DS was still loading and by the time it turned on, she said that it was gone. The next day, I asked more about it. She said that there was a girl with black hair bobbing up and down and smiling really big. To this day, it still scares me. This happened to me around six years back when I was visiting family in Alaska. 
I was borrowing a car to go visit some family when I lost control on a two-lane highway and hit a tree. I was freezing cold and there was no point in staying in my car because the windows were smashed. I was scared. It was night and I had no way of calling for help. When I saw some headlights coming down the highway, I got out an emergency light and flagged the person down. It turned out to be some old Max Semi. A big guy opened the door and let me in. He asked if I was right and I told him I was fine, but I had crashed and I thanked him very much for helping me out of the cold. I told him my name and he said that his name was Bill. He ended up dropping me off in a small town ten miles ahead and told me he had to go. I thanked him again and I went inside a small restaurant. I told them that some trucker named Bill helped me out. They all got a very strange look. They told me that that was impossible because the only trucker who drove those roads named Bill had died in an accident six years prior to that day. I got chills. It's very weird, and I still don't believe in ghosts, but mine and the bartender's descriptions matched perfectly. No matter what I do, I can't disprove what happened that night. In case anyone was wondering, the bartender said that Bill had jackknifed on the highway to avoid someone who spun out on the road. Alaska drivers, please be careful. Twenty-five years ago, I moved in with my cousin and her roommate and co-worker named Jose. The house was an old cement block, three-bedroom, one-bath house with a large fenced yard. He had two very large German shepherds that lived there and were mostly in the yard. The house is in Carmel, Florida, in a shitty, packed suburban neighborhood. Nothing special. Rent was cheap, 50 bucks a week from what I remember, and the house was clean. Plus, my cousin lived there too, so I moved in. We all got along well. Everyone worked. We pretty much kept to ourselves and saw each other for a few minutes here and there. I lived there for about six months. This is the story of what caused me to move out. On a weekend night, we all happened to be off from work. We decided to invite some friends over from the pool hall that we frequented, and Jose invited some people over that worked at the pharmaceutical lab. There were probably 20 people there total. We played music and did what young people do. Eventually it got pretty late and we found ourselves talking about ghosts. We all shared stories. My cousin and I came from a pretty spooky family so we had some good ones and everybody was really into the discussion. Jose was quiet throughout most of the conversation. He waited until we had all kind of quieted down. And then he said, you know, this house is haunted. My cousin and I shot each other a look, and then both laughed because, yeah, sometimes Jose's 20-pound house cat would meow at the empty hallway, but other than that, that was it. He proceeded to tell us that there was a presence in the house, but that it mostly stayed in the shed in the backyard. This tiny little pink wooden shed that I had never even looked in. He told us he always keeps the curtains in his bedroom closed because his window faces the shed and the door to the shed will not stay shut. He has jammed it shut a million times and it always pops back open. It creeps him out. He said he could tell when it was in the house because he would wake up feeling depressed. It creeped me out. I didn't want to think that I lived with a presence and I didn't like the idea that it was hurting my roommate. I was a tough chick in my opinion, so I was like, screw that ghost. I'll shut that door, and you won't have to keep your curtains closed anymore. I said all this because in my heart, I didn't really believe that anything was in the shed or the house. I believed we were all just messing around. So I told them all that I was going to go outside to inspect the shed and deal with the door. Everyone followed me, and while we were walking around the outside of the house, Jose told me that it was a really bad idea to mess with the shed that whatever it was wanted that door open and I should just leave it alone. We all got out there and it was exactly what I thought it was going to be. A very worn down wooden shed that oddly kind of looked like a tiny house more than a shed. 
I looked inside and there was a busted lawnmower and some old paint buckets, rusty screens, and darkness. I looked around outside and found some rusty shovels in a corner of the garage. I took a shovel over to the shed. I kicked the door of the shed back into the frame. The door was closed and literally kicked into the frame, kicked shut. I took the handle of the shovel and I put it under the handle of the shed door. I shoved that into the ground. It was secure. We all went back inside. We BS'd some more, but it was late, I'm gonna say around 1 a.m. by the time we go back in and everybody said their goodbyes. We let the dogs out of their pen in the yard and locked the gate. We made sure that the front gate was secured so that they wouldn't get out, and then we straightened up the house a little and eventually we all went to bed. Sometime around 6 a.m. I woke up because I needed to use the bathroom. I opened my bedroom door, and I was sleepy, but there was a weird sound as I opened it. It startled me. It was like fingernails scraping on something coarse. I opened the door all the way, and the shovel fell in the door and hit me. I can't even put into words how I felt in that moment. That shovel had been standing against my bedroom door from the outside, and there was a tiny pile of dirt where the tip had been sat against the tile floor of the hallway. I rushed through the house to the side door, which was locked, and then out to the backyard. The shed door was wide open. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I ran back into the house. I immediately pounded on both Jose and my cousin's bedroom door. I was terrified and angry because I knew, I mean, I absolutely knew that one of them had done this. Now, I know that you couldn't have been there to see the reactions, but I promise you, based on them, neither of them did it. Jose literally broke down sobbing. He begged me to tell him I was lying. He begged my cousin to admit that she had done it. When neither of us took responsibility, he went to the store and got a bunch of religious candles, produced a rosary, and started trying to pray away whatever it was, or pray for me for being dumb. My Spanish wasn't even close to fluent enough to keep up with his prayers. My cousin, on the other hand, was pissed. She was ready to fight me. She was adamant that I was pulling a prank, cussed me up and down, called me a liar, said I was a child, that most of all, she didn't appreciate being woken up at 6 a.m. after a night of partying to be a pawn in my prank. When I knew that neither of them had put the shovel against the door or reopened the shed door, I was literally terrified. There was no way someone else got into the yard, passed the dogs, got to the shed door, opened it, got into the locked house, and then put that shovel against my door. I didn't sleep there again without someone else in the room with me. Every moment spent there after that was beyond tense. We all kind of stopped talking to each other, and Jose and my cousin ended up in a terrible argument over a button on the stereo of all things, and she moved out within a week. It took me two weeks to find another place to live, and I never went back. I want to tell you about the times that I was mimicked, or at least the times that I encountered a mimic. The first one was actually a mimic of my sister. My other three siblings were at home and wanted to get takeout, so they called for my sister, who was not in the house at the time. She was outside with me. Now, I don't know if this is fake or not, but someone answered, or something did and they said it sounded exactly like her. When the food came, they called for her again to get her stuff, but this time no one answered, so my brother took the pizza to her. He went inside the room just to find no one there, a dark, empty room. When they told me this, I could confirm that she was with me, but I didn't know whether to believe that something actually mimicked her or not. I thought they were just pulling our leg. The second time was a mimic of me, and I was scared out of my wits. My mother wanted to go out to the 7-Eleven store, 
and I was like, nope, not gonna happen because it was really late at night. She ended up leaving anyway and I was pretty upset, sulking in a corner. I was really scared because I had been watching too much Criminal Minds and that shit makes you paranoid. So after her little run, she stood at the bus stop waiting for the bus. When she heard me behind her, she legit heard Mama in my voice. I was even more terrified when she told me, because again, it was my voice and I was clearly not behind her. I still didn't believe it though, but a lot of things have happened in my household, like some scary shit, and I guess this just adds to it. I still have a hard time believing it, but I don't know why my mother of all people would lie. Would you believe it? Or would you think it was nonsense? I've never had any kind of supernatural experience and I'm generally a skeptic, but something happened that gave me chills. My wife and I live in a newly built home that we built, and we have infant twins. They sleep in the same room, but in separate cribs. They sleep roughly from 7.30 at night to 6.30 in the morning. We leave on a relatively silent humidifier, a baby monitor, and a white noise machine. Recently, Twin B was having a rough night. He was constantly awake and screaming. Normally, he sleeps well. We kept going in and settling him, only to have him wake up again shortly after, crying. At around 2 to 3 a.m., he woke up again. Neither my wife nor I immediately got up. I just thought I'd see if he'd cry it out in a little bit. At that time, I heard a very distinct shh-shh-shh-shh-shh from the baby monitor. I was so tired that I thought I either imagined it or it was the white noise machine, although the sound was very distinct from that machine. The next day, later in the day, my wife mentioned to me that she had a bit of a fright because she heard shushing coming from the baby monitor and thought that I was in the nursery. But then she looked over and I was sleeping beside her. I told her I heard the exact same thing. I actually hadn't really thought about the incident until my wife told me this. We both heard it. The baby monitors are not on Wi-Fi, and we live in a pretty rural area. I'm sure there's an explanation, but this is the first time in my life that I've actually had chills from an occurrence like this. In 2013, my wife and I divorced and we both moved into separate homes. The divorce went well and we are still good friends to this day, partly because we have a daughter together. We agreed to split custody over our daughter and I rented an old house in a historic district in the city where we live. It was a very pretty home, built in 1935 but kept up very well. I would have my daughter two weeks at a time and she had a bedroom in the back of the house. She was three years old at the time, and I kept noticing her talking to her friend. One day I found her in a little closet, talking to someone, and I remember her saying that she was talking to another little girl named Betty. I have no idea where she heard the name Betty, as she was only three years old, but I just chalked it all up to a child's vivid imagination. Keep in mind, I'm a single dad to a little girl. I really have no idea what I'm doing when it comes to dressing, hair, or little girl stuff in general. Her mother is good at that stuff, but not me. I put my daughter to bed one night after her bath. I remember brushing her hair that night, but that was all I did. The very next morning, her mom came to pick her up from my house, and my daughter was just waking up. Her mom went back to her bedroom to find my daughter's hair was fixed into two perfect French braids. Her mom was really proud of me at first and said that I had done her hair so cute, but I told her that I didn't and couldn't do that. I can't even regular braid her hair, much less do a perfect French braid. We asked our daughter how she'd gotten her hair fixed. 
and she told us that Betty had done it during the night. I broke the contract on that rental agreement and moved out within the next month. My boyfriend of five years has crushed on me for probably 12 or 13. He was two grade levels below me and was a bad boy while I was popular and in all honors college level classes, so I wasn't aware he existed until I met him at my dad's business about seven years ago. He apparently talked about me being his dream girl and was teased that it would never happen. So in 2009, he and his best friend, I'll call him Josh, were getting into pills due to Josh's grandfather being an amputee and unable to properly attend or understand hiding the medications, thus leaving large amounts of methadone and other drugs lying around. This was before the opioid crisis that has affected my generation deeply in the last 15 years. Two days before Christmas 2009, Josh overdosed in the bedroom that my boyfriend is currently staying in. It's a long story, but we moved back to our respective families because we were laid off during the pandemic and were in a bad wreck, losing our extra car. The room has never felt spooky, never anything strange about it, but I've had a few pranks pulled on me that we believe Josh does to basically congratulate my boyfriend on being with the woman he waited for. I have woken up to sticky notes completely covering my body, my drinks poured on the floor, and random objects moved right where I exit the bed so that I step on them first thing in the morning. I swear I've heard giggling. Each time I have angrily asked my boyfriend if he was messing with me, and I know when he's lying. He always says no, and I believe him. We like to think that this is Josh playing practical jokes, something he was known for, but this is nothing compared to what Josh did for me in 2017. It wasn't a prank. It saved my life. Four years ago, I went into anaphylactic shock. I lost all ability to speak or move my lower body. I was upstairs with a curved and steep staircase separating me from my phone. I remember crawling to the stairs, knowing it could be fatal if I smashed into the wall that the stairs led to before the turn with very large, steep steps. I know I was extremely oxygen deprived, but I immediately saw Josh and two of my deceased best friends ascend the stairs and carry me to the living room couch with my nebulizer and cell phone. I called 911, but I had no voice. My friends were gone, except Josh. He told me he was going to go wake up my boyfriend from the hammock in the back of my yard. All of a sudden, my boyfriend dreamed of this friend saying that I was in trouble. My boyfriend came running into the house, and by this point, I was literally dying. I could no longer use any part of my body, and no air came into my lungs when I inhaled. I remember thinking of my daughter and praying her father would navigate my loss to her and keep memories of me alive. He actually died in a freak accident eight months ago, so now I'm fulfilling that for him, but I digress. I struggled to remain conscious, but I was fading. My boyfriend saw the 911 operator on the phone and my sweaty blue body. He told them he didn't think I was breathing, and by some absolute miracle, there was an ambulance passing my neighborhood. The hospital and dispatch were 30 minutes away. This coincidence, plus my boyfriend's sudden premonition that I was hurt, saved my life. Josh and those EMTs saved my life. I remember the EMT asking my boyfriend if I had overdosed. I hadn't. And I thought of how Josh had died. I was blabbering on about dead people saving me after a large amount of epinephrine, so no wonder they thought I was high. The doctors and EMT were baffled at how I managed to get down those stairs, or even stay alive long enough to get help. I had one bruise on my leg, and it was really tiny. That was it. Well, and the worst headache I've ever had. Turns out I'm allergic to the latex and spray paint. I just told them that I slid down the stairs, but that's not how I remember it. The weird thing is, I had never met Josh when he was alive. I don't know how I recognized him or hallucinated him, but he looked exactly like the picture I was shown after the fact. 
I've had a lot of paranormal encounters, but my run-in with Josh saved my life, and he never even knew me. So thanks, Josh, for giving me more time on this earth, and I wish we had met many years before. I do hope that he's resting peacefully, but just periodically decides to pop in and check on us. When I was about 14, we had this house with this old attic that always creaked quietly. No one ever went up there because it was always locked. But one night when my parents were out of town, my friend Cameron slept over. We were playing video games and watching TV like we always have. At around 8 o'clock p.m., we heard what sounded like footsteps in the attic. We were too nervous to go and check, so we just brushed it off as the house settling and went back to watching TV. Then, about 15 minutes later, we heard a heavy slam and a shatter like glass breaking from the kitchen. We ran out to go check, but when we got to the kitchen, there was nothing. No glass, nothing was out of place or broken, so we just looked at each other, confused, and walked away went back to watching TV. At around 10 p.m., we heard loud footsteps from upstairs, so we got up and checked all the rooms. But when we reached the stairs to the attic, we stopped. He pulled out his flashlight, and when he pointed it toward the top of the stairs, we both stopped and got really pale, because what we saw was a tall black figure that had to be at least seven or eight feet tall. It just stood there, staring at us, and then it vanished into thin air right in front of our eyes. That's when we ran outside and called the cops. We left out the part about it vanishing in front of us. We just said that there was someone in the attic. They checked the entire house and said that there were no signs of anyone being there. My family and I have always been animal lovers. I've never known a time when we didn't have cats or dogs with us, and I feel like they helped raise me. When my father was in college, he adopted two cats named Tigger and Sato. Tigger passed away due to a coyote, and after she passed, Sato was never the same. She was grumpy and preferred to be by herself, but I would annoy her with my love anyway. One night, I was carrying her in her wicker basket with some blankets. I would bring her room to room as I cleaned up everything and did my normal things. I'd been petting her and listening to her purr when she suddenly stopped moving. I was maybe 12, and I remember praying for the first time to bring her back to me. It was awful to bring her out to my mom and tell her she had passed. I had a tradition whenever a pet died that I would make a concrete headstone with little marbles and their names on them. I had it set out on our kitchen counter to dry and left it there. The next morning I checked on it and found a small piece of her fur right in the center. I went around to everybody and asked if they had placed it there, and they all said that they hadn't. I felt like she was giving me one last piece of her. I kept it in a tiny knick-knack tea kettle and it lives there with a few of her whiskers I found weeks following her passing. In a way, I think she gave me one last gift. Okay, so this experience was actually my mom's. When I was nine, about 24 years ago, my mom's older sister passed away very unexpectedly. She was only 35. It was also just a very tragic situation. Anyway, my grandparents, mom, and other aunt were devastated, and I remember it just being a very sad time. So fast forward to about a month to six weeks after her passing, 
We just moved into a new house, and all of this was going on while we were waiting on the autopsy report, cause of death, things like that. So one night, my mom woke up from a dead sleep and felt compelled to go down to the kitchen. As she turned the light on, to her absolute shock, there sat my Aunt Veronica on the bar stool at the kitchen counter. Mom said that she looked just like she did in real life, not ghostly or transparent or whatever. She told my mom that she knew everybody was worried, and she apologized for how she left, but she said that she had to go. She told my mom she was at peace and that her passing was all for the best. Mom said she looked so peaceful and happy. She told my mom that she was going to wake up and not believe that this happened, so she was going to give her proof. She said we would be receiving a check for a large amount that we weren't expecting, and when she got that check, mom would know what had happened was real and not a dream. Well, lo and behold, the next day, thinking it was all a dream, my mom ventured out to the mailbox. Inside was a tax credit check for a large amount. In that moment, she burst into tears. She unequivocally knew that what had happened the night before was real. This isn't the only time she's visited us since she passed. She comes to me in dreams every now and then. I actually keep her Bible on my nightstand, and every time I dream of her, I write it down on a piece of notebook paper folded up inside. I know that she really is visiting me and that it's not just a dream. Like I said, the circumstances around her death were very tragic. I will mention that our entire family was under the impression that she had died of a heart attack. She did have a pre-existing heart condition. But it wasn't until my granddad passed away in 2020 that we saw the actual autopsy report. My aunt had actually committed suicide by taking 30 prescription pills at one time. This is something my grandparents carried with them all those years and never revealed to my mom, her sister, or anyone else. I think the actual cause of her death is the reason why she visits so often. I assume there's a lot of guilt she has about how she chose to go. Either way, my aunt was the most wonderful person. She never had kids or a husband. We honestly talk about and think about her every day. Even all these years later, this is one of just many memorable encounters with her following her death. And since my grandmother and grandfather have passed, they now accompany her in our dreams. This was told to me by my mom and dad when I grew up. I am Native American and raised both spiritual and Catholic. My father's side of the family is spiritual and believes in ghosts and respecting them. I was raised like that. When I was a few weeks old, my parents and auntie were walking to the store with me. My dad was carrying me with my mom on one side of him and my aunt on the other. The store was about two blocks away from my grandma's house on a dirt road. But it was on the reservation, and she lived in an area with a lot of houses on both sides of the street. When they reached the halfway point, my mom noticed a light on in a vehicle. She thought that someone left the dome light on and told my dad. While looking at the van, I began to cry. My mom said that it wasn't my normal cry, so she started checking to see if I was okay. The closer they walked toward the van, the brighter the light got. My auntie told my dad to cover me up and not let any part of me show while she started praying in their language. My mom said at this point I was screaming and she was terrified. Then I stopped and at the same time the light went out. My dad later explained that when they got closer, the light was getting brighter and brighter, like a spotlight. But the light didn't have a source because the van was in an accident the week prior and the battery was gone, along with most of the engine. A man who was driving passed on. It's relevant because my dad was looking at the van and he swore he saw an outline of a person in the driver's seat 
and thought somebody was playing a prank. My auntie's version was the same, but after she was praying, she kept looking at the van and she said she saw a small ball of light shoot out of the driver's door and toward the house. She didn't tell my parents because my mom was freaking out. My mom only said that everything was quiet when the light was getting brighter. She didn't hear dogs barking, and they always bark on the res. No birds were cawing, and there was no other noise other than my crying. So that's that. My first paranormal experience, and I wasn't even aware of it. As a kid, I grew up in the country, and I was pretty much surrounded by the woods. I had some paranormal experiences that I can't explain in those woods, and the house. I was 15, I decided to go hiking in the woods on a bright summer day. It was hot out, but being in the woods I found plenty of shade. I got lost in my own angsty teen thoughts. I don't remember what I was thinking about, but... It must have been about how city kids have fun, or boobs. It could have been either. It was probably boobs. I snapped out of it and realized I was in grass and brush that was literally over my head, and I couldn't tell where I was. I had never been in that part of the forest before, and as I looked around for anything to tell me where I was, I found nothing. For example, the stone wall that was in the eastern side of the woods, the creek that lay in a ravine to the north, or the cornfield to the west. But all I saw were trees and thick brush. When you trample through brush, you normally can see the path you took in. But oddly, there was no such path. I calmed myself and thought of what to do. I decided to head east because the stone wall lined most of the eastern side. If I could find it, then I would be able to follow it down to a lower field and find my way back. Instead, I ended up finding the ravine that led down to the creek. But the stage, it was an old wooden structure that looked like a stage, so that's what we called it, and the field that it was in were nowhere in sight. I thought a bit that if I followed the ravine west, I would find it. That lasted ten feet when I found a really large wall of thorn bushes. South was many trees, north was the ravine with the creek blocked by thorn bushes. I'm turned around. Obviously you've noticed that I'm not sure which is south at this point, or north, but I'm telling it from the way I was facing when I heard it. It was faint at first, but it was clear what it was the sound of drums, beating steadily, as though there were a drum circle behind me in the woods. I figured it was someone out in the woods who, one, would kill me, two, would give me weed, or three, would help me out of the woods. So, being lost, I headed towards the sound. As I walked to the sound, it didn't get louder or fainter. It was steady. I just kept walking, as I walked, the beat became more distinct. Definitely a hand drum, not a drumstick. Not a big drum, but more like bongos. I followed the sound until I heard it fade, and then I heard dogs barking. It was at that point I realized where I was. It was a place that I was familiar with. I heard the drums a couple of more times when I was in the woods, but I never figured out where they came from. At one point, I was walking with my cousin, and we both heard it. We swore that it came from deeper in the woods, but we weren't sure who was doing it or why. Now the fun part. I live 18 miles away from that part of the forest, but I'm at the other end of it now. The same forest travels that far. Same forest, different location. Tonight, what made me decide to tell this story was... I was out smoking a cigarette. I stood at the banks of the river that separated the forest from the yard I have, and all of a sudden in the darkness, 
I could hear the sound of drumming over the hill. It didn't scare me. It brought a smile to my face. When I was a young kid, had to be around four or so, we lived in a small house in Florida. My parents had bought the house right before I was born. I vividly remember going into my bedroom one day and sitting on my bed. There was a window directly across from my bed and the sun was shining through it. I remember pulling out a blue notebook that I loved. It had stickers all over it and I started to draw. All of a sudden, I remember getting up and walking into my closet. I have no idea why I got up and went into my closet, but once I'd gone through the door, I wasn't in my closet. I was walking down a path made up of pebbles, and all around me were tables with yellow umbrellas, like patio tables that have the hole in the middle for the umbrella. The sun was shining brightly and people were talking and laughing and I could hear water splashing. For some reason, I remember feeling really happy and excited about this cool place. I couldn't see a pool, but I could hear the water and the splashing, and see these tables with the umbrellas and even feel the sun. I loved going to the pool, and everything felt safe, and it was so sunny, and I felt really happy. I look up to see a man on a very tall chair. He looked down at me with the kindest eyes and gave me a little wave. I remembered that I waved back, but I started to look around, curious as to where I could go swimming too. The next thing I remember, I was back sitting on my bed and the sun was still shining in the window and the notebook was on my lap. I felt so sad and disappointed. Being four, I went out of my room and found my mom and demanded to know if we used to have a pool and tables with yellow umbrellas. I remember this as clear as can be. She paid me very little attention, but laughed and said, no, we never had a pool or tables with an umbrella. I remember being super disappointed that there was no cool water park or whatever that I could access from my closet. Fast forward many years, many years, to when I was grown and married with two kids of my own. We had moved to Texas when I was a teenager. My mom and I are looking through old photos and there's a picture of our house in Florida taken from the outside. My mom says something like, do you remember much about that house? I said, yes, actually, I remember a lot about living there. She says, your dad and I bought that house from a lady whose husband had died. He had been a lifeguard and actually wound up saving someone and then promptly had a heart attack right beside the pool. The memory of going into my closet at four years old did not immediately return to me. I had all but forgotten about it and probably chalked it up to being a dream. But later it hit me. My mom had never told me about the lady she bought the house from. Not until that moment when I was much older. The whole thing came back to me and how I couldn't have been asleep. I remembered the bed and the window and the notebook so clearly. I also remember feeling so excited about what I was seeing and so disappointed when it went away. Looking back, the tall chair I saw had to be a lifeguard's chair. It was crazy, and to this day, I have no explanation. When I was 11, my dad, my sister, and I moved into a townhouse. At night, I would wake up and see two different men, they were different every night, walk into my room. My room was right next to the bathroom, which is where the two men would walk in from. One would have a top hat and a tailcoat. The other wore dark sunglasses and a trench coat, but the silhouettes would change. It would creep me out so much that I would hide under my covers. Sometimes I got too scared and slept in my dad's bed. One night I was sleeping in my dad's room and two identical twin girls with long black hair 
and hollowed out eyes came up to my dad while he slept. They didn't say anything. They just stared at him. And then they went away. Our neighbor John told me that I could see ghosts. I've been told I'm a medium, but I block it out as an adult. I'm 20 now. In John's house, I saw a woman hanging by the neck in his kitchen, and then in the basement, a man with a cleaver, dripping in blood. I was so scared that I left. Now I'm 20, and I still believe in ghosts. People tell me that I should develop my gift, but... I don't know if I want to develop it any more than it already has. My twin and I had adjoining bedrooms, and she had to enter my room to exit the house. We shared inexperiences. If she got hurt, I would have sympathy pains, etc. She would always come over to my bed in the night complaining that she heard something or had a bad dream. One night, she called out to me, Sissy, can you come to my bed? I refused and told her to come to me. She replied that she couldn't and absolutely begged me. I could hear in her voice that something was very wrong. I got up and walked to the light switch to turn on the light and I looked through her door. I saw a tall, dark hooded figure at the bottom of her bed. It turned around and looked at me. There was no face, only a void. I immediately flipped the lights on and it was gone. Before I could say anything, my sister asked me, did you see it? Chills ran down my spine. She said, did you see it? Did you see the tall, dark thing at the bottom of my bed? It's been watching me all night. I'm not a believer in ghosts, but I cannot explain what we saw together that night so many years ago. She's convinced that it was something evil. To this day, I don't know. When I was three, my grandmother on my mom's side died of a heart attack. While at the funeral, the adults were outside talking and smoking cigarettes. My older brother, another family member that was close to our ages, and I were told to stay inside. They said that it was to keep us out of conversations we didn't need to hear, but who knows. Well, the other family member convinced my brother that locking me in the viewing room was a good idea. It's those rooms with red lights over the coffin. Once they locked me in, the other family member called through the door. He said the grandma needed to take me with her because I was her favorite. I screamed and cried as loud as my little self could, and some adults took me outside to my parents. I was told that they were just playing and that even though grandma loved me, she was never going to take me away. Later that year, we moved two states away. One night in the new house about four years after, I woke up in the middle of the night, which according to my mother was highly unusual. I heard a song that only my grandma ever sang to me. I sat up looking around and I see the lid on my old toy box opening by itself. Slowly it creaked open. Once it was fully open, I saw what looked like my grandma slowly standing from inside the box. She turned slowly and really creepily to look at me. I was frozen in place. I couldn't cry or scream or even move. She started walking toward me. She stopped close to the bed and said, I came to get you. You were always my favorite and I want you with me now. Somehow I found my voice and screamed. My mom came running in and just before she got to my room, this grandma said, I'll come back for you again, and vanished. My mother came in asking who I was talking to. I told her everything, and mom let me sleep in the living room for a few nights while she got rid of my toy box. The toy box was the last thing that my grandma had ever given me. 
My mom told me that grandma would never scare me and that it was the boogeyman. Later in life, I tried to ask her what she thought it was, but she told me it was over and done with and to stop talking about it. To this day, she won't talk about it or answer any of my questions. This is not my experience, but I heard it from my father firsthand, and it sure is scary as heck. My father spent most of his childhood years in the village, from elementary school to the third grade. This happened when he was like nine or ten years old, as he remembers. I need to mention that he was never a religious person or anything like that, but he had a very realistic perspective on life. He was definitely logic-based. He never told this incident to anyone other than his mother when he was young, but when he heard similar stories from his relatives from the village about that specific area, he believed that his experience was probably not a dream or a hallucination. My father's house was outside of the village and also on top of the hill. It was difficult to reach their house on foot, but there was a shortcut that goes around the hill, and people who knew about the shortcut would sometimes prefer to use that path. It was a pathway rather than a road, narrow but less rough than the other roads. Those who knew about this road also knew that the path was a bit uncanny. It didn't really have a very clean past. There's a story about that road that my father heard from his father. Four or more centuries ago, around when the Mongol invasion of Anatolia happened, Mongolians attacked this village and killed every living being in the village. They put their heads on spikes along the path. People used to call this place Kabatas because it is also full of steep and sharp little stones. It means rough stones in Turkish. The thing is, nobody would want to use this path if it wasn't really necessary. Again, because of its unpleasant past. One summer afternoon, my father started walking toward his house and he opted for the shortcut because he had to hurry. The road wasn't that long and he could get there faster. There were even neighbors living in their own houses just beyond the bifurcation at the end of the road. He walked a little more on the stony road and then stopped. More precisely, he had to stop. A stony wall appeared right in front of him, a wall that had never been there before. Why would anyone build a wall on that narrow pathway anyway? He asked himself. But the path continued just behind the wall, after all. It was like a newly knitted wall. His first thought was, maybe the neighbors put it there. But why would they? Also, the wall wasn't very long. The height of the wall was maybe 150 to 160 centimeters, and the length of the wall was maybe 200 centimeters. But of course, that was beyond the height of my father, who was still a small child. Still, he figured that in two moves he could climb the wall and get over it. There was no passing from the right or the left of the wall, and as the weather started to get dark and stormy, he wanted to climb the wall and continue on his way in order to get home quickly. When he climbed the wall and gave his hand to where he thought the stones would be over, he realized that the wall wasn't done yet. No matter how hard he tried to climb up, he couldn't reach the top of it. It seemed ridiculous. He thought, maybe it's my shoes, maybe they're not good enough to climb and reach the top. But he was sure that he'd been firmly on his feet when he touched the top that wasn't the top. He kept saying to himself, how is this possible? Why is it not ending? By this time he was tired of climbing. He had a growing sensation within him that somebody was watching him, maybe toying with him. He was starting to get scared. The sky was almost dark. He thought, it would be bad if I fall. I would break all my bones. Even though he'd never been religious, he started to pray to God. Then he fell to the ground with a bang. The wall collapsed on its own, and my father was buried under the rubble. He couldn't get up from the ground. He thinks that he passed out there. A few hours later, my uncle saw my father lying there a little boy half of his body under the stones. 
He picked up my dad and carried him home. He tells my grandma where he found my dad, and my grandma said, Oh, my son, were you so tired? Haven't you found another place to sleep than that cursed land? My father told her about what happened to him. There's a widespread belief in that region, especially expressed by the ancients, that if you are wandering alone in a deserted place like that, something will come and play games with you, like the short wall that never ends when you climb it. When I was around 10, my family decided to make the change to move to a small town in Northern California, along with my grandparents. Since the moment we moved there, I always thought the place was strange. I have a younger brother, and for the majority of the time we lived in the new house, he would act somewhat odd. He would often be playing with an imaginary friend and my parents and I always blew it off as him just being young, who didn't have one. But some of the things he would say would leave us pondering who or what he was actually interacting with. For the most part, whenever we would ask him who he was playing with, he would always say it was his friend, or more disturbingly, his dead brother. I was always left in awe, since as far as I knew, it was just the two of us. I even questioned my parents if they had lost any children and they always denied it. At times when it was time to go to sleep, my brother would refuse because he was playing with his friend and on one occasion he asked if his friend could sleep next to him. He was still young so he slept in my parents' room. My mom was somewhat done with him talking about his friend so he told him to tell his friend to get the hell out of there. The moment she said that, the show she was watching on TV turned to pure static. She got terrified and immediately tried to turn off her television. It wouldn't shut off or change channels, and she was left with having to unplug it in order to cut the noise off. For the rest of the night, she was completely unable to go to sleep, and she told me her experience on the way to drop me off at the bus stop. There's also a local Chinese cemetery close to where we live, and a lot of times my brother would always say that that's where his dead brother lived. I often had to tell him to stop saying things like that, since it spooked my mom, and me. Once he started to get older, he stopped playing with his friend, and other things around the house started to happen. At times you could hear whispers in the home. Sometimes doors would close by themselves, you would hear walking outside by the windows. As I got older and I started high school, we moved over to the neighboring town and my grandparents bought the house that we lived in. My uncle was recently divorced and he moved back in with my grandparents, so he was off and home. My parents, being Mexican, always had their ritual of going to Mexico to go home to visit family during the holidays. So on one occasion, I decided not to go with them, and my uncle was left to look after me. It was just us at the house, and he had the knack of staying up all night and watching TV, so I only saw him after I got home. Me having to be up early in the morning would just be lounging around the house, waiting for it to be time for me to walk to the bus stop. On one of these mornings, I decided it was a good idea to get up close and personal to an angel figurine my grandmother had in the room I was staying in. As my face got closer to it, all of a sudden I heard a loud, hey, in front of me. It startled me so badly that I jumped up and almost fell on my back. I had no explanation as to what had just happened, so I rushed over to my uncle's room thinking it was a prank. I tried to go into his room, but I wasn't able to since it was locked. Having no explanation, I just decided to leave and wait outside. That was my last experience there at the house. My grandparents sold the house and moved to the same town we live in now, and all of these things were somewhat forgotten. Many years later, me being 23 now and working at a warehouse for an electronics company, 
made a friend with a person who also happened to have gone to the same trade school that I had attended. On one occasion, just chatting, we started to talk about paranormal things. He started to tell me how his younger sister had an imaginary friend, and strange things happened at his house. I was kind of a jokester, so I decided to play a prank on him. I knew he lived in the same town where I used to live, but I had no clue where. I started to describe my old house, and he just kept staring at me in disbelief, until I told him, oh, you lived at such and such a road in such and such California at this zip code. He started laughing. He said, what are you doing, stalking me, following me home? I was like, wait a minute, you live there? He confirmed, and I told him that that was my childhood home. After that, I told him that my brother had also had an imaginary friend while we lived there, and also heard all the whispers that he and his brother hear coming from the walls. The doors had also closed and slammed on us. He also confirmed one thing that I had never told my parents or my brother until years later, that I had seen shadows moving around inside the house. My buddy stated that he sees them too. What got to me the most of him telling me all these things that have happened to his family there isn't that it's the same things my family experienced, that I got validation that we weren't crazy. I still talk to my buddy to this day, and he still hears and sees the same things. The last thing that reminded me about that home was an old photo my brother dug up from my parents' closet. My mother had the hobby of taking pictures of everyone and everything, so we have albums on top of albums. The picture my brother decided to take out was one where we were celebrating my brother's birthday. My uncles, brother, and myself are all posing in the picture. And in the window next to us, you can see a whitish face pressed up against the glass from the outside and handprints on either side. In the town of Baldenboro, just eight miles southwest of Elizabethtown, where I stay, it was said that a demon cat from hell used to stalk the woods, killing livestock and making the locals scared. And then, suddenly, it disappeared. That's what they say, anyway. But we know that it didn't. To this day, there have been reports of something that looks like an abnormally large mountain lion with blood-red eyes and fur as black as night. Its cries have been compared to that of a woman being torn apart and screaming for her life. Luckily, it's only ever gotten a taste for goats and cows, or so we think anyway. I will tell you, there have been a few people that have gone missing. Some have been found, and to hear some of the police tell the stories, the bodies were torn to shreds. It's not just located in Baldenboro, like most think. It goes from Bladen Lake State Forest to the Green Swamp, which covers three counties and over 1,200 square miles. A friend of mine was hunting one day down in the Green's Swamp when it started getting dark. If you hunt in this area, you know that you've got to be out of the woods by dark, by law. So he climbed down from his tree stand and began the long walk through the swamp and underbrush to where he had parked his truck. Now, my friend is a cornbread fed Southern boy and has the size to prove it. Standing at six foot six with a weight of 260 pounds, he is pure farm muscle and he's not small by any standard. So he's learned not to be afraid of anything. He said that what happened next made him never want to go hunting in that swamp again. Making his way through the brush, he said he began hearing something walking through the woods toward him. He stopped to listen for it and said that it sounded like a large black bear, so he got his gun ready just in case. When he stopped, it stopped. When he walked, it walked. He said it made him nervous because whatever it was knew he was there and wasn't running off. He said that he started making noise and even shot his gun into the air as a warning. 
It didn't leave. Instead, it let out a growl, he said, that you could feel as much as hear. All the way through the woods, it just stayed behind him and out of sight, but he knew that he was being stalked. When he came out of the woods onto the dirt road, he said his truck was about 50 yards down from him. He decided that there was a pretty good chance that whatever was following him was going to keep following or make a move on him there. So he took off running. It took off running too. He said that it sounded like a bulldozer was crashing through the woods. And when it broke from the woods, it sounded like a horse running through loose dirt. He could hear the stomps of its feet and the growling of its breath. He didn't have to look back to know that it was coming and catching up to him. He shot behind him, hoping that it would scare it enough to stop for a moment and give him a chance to make it to the truck. When he did, he said he must have hit it because it screamed. For a moment, he thought it was a person. That's when he finally turned around. He said this thing was jet black, as big as a 600 pound black bear, a tail as long as its body, and eyes that were glowing red. He hit it and it was just standing there, looking at him, as if to say, now you've done it. He bolted to the truck and jumped in. Just as he shut the door, he looked and it was right there. He said the thing was so close that its breath was fogging the window. By now, he said he was shaking so badly and it was everything he could do to get the key in the ignition and start the motor. He drives a Ford F-350 four-wheel drive that was raised up, so there's a good two feet of clearance under the truck. He said this thing was on all four feet and looking eye to eye with him in his truck. The engine started and he took off like a bat out of hell. He said it chased him as hard as it could until he picked up speed and stopped and watched him drive off after that. The next day, he and his dad went back with guns and looked around for tracks, blood, or even a dead body. He said there was no blood, even though he knows it was shot, and there were paw prints as big as his hands on the ground everywhere. Then they found a tree that nine feet up had claw marks one inch deep in the wood, spaced about four inches apart from each other. They didn't venture into the woods, nor did they go too far from the truck. Both of them said they felt as though they were being watched and didn't want to stick around to find out what it was. They got back into the truck, and that's when they heard it. A scream from the woods off in the distance. He said it was that same scream, like a woman screaming bloody murder. It was there, letting them know that it was there and that it was waiting. There are many a dark secrets in them woods, as my grandpa would say, Charlie Daniels even wrote about these woods in one of his songs. If you ever get adventurous and want to try your luck, come on down to Green's Swamp, and when the sun goes down, get real quiet. You might hear that scream. I hope when you do, it's off in the distance and not close by. Because if it is, well, it might just be the last sound you hear. This is the first ghost encounter I can remember. From around age two to five, my family moved into an older rental home. In the brick house next door was a nice family with little kids around our ages. I barely remember them, but everyone else remembers that they were very friendly. One day, my mom and I walked to a nearby convenience store. We were almost back home when we saw an old woman in the neighbor's front living room window. We could see her pretty well from the sidewalk. It was so long ago, but with my mom's memory, I can say she wore a dress or a robe. Her hair was pulled back, and she was rocking back and forth in a rocking chair. She was just staring out toward the road. We waved, but she didn't wave back. The next time my mom and the mom next door spoke, my mom asked her who she'd had visiting. She said nobody was. My mom then asked her who the old woman in the rocking chair was the other day. Very casually, 
My mom claims the woman said, Oh, that was just the old woman who lived here before us. She died. That was her rocking chair. Apparently, it came with the house, and even though she still rocks in it, they kept it. Apparently, they were okay with just living with the ghost. So, it's apparent that some people are totally fine living in haunted houses, but personally, I'm not. This story is a few years old now, but it's interesting nonetheless. This involves what I believe to have been a poltergeist. I was already very interested in spirits and had attempted to communicate with them various times. This is the first and only time that communication was successful. To protect mine and others' identities, the names in this story are fake. Every other detail, however, is completely true. When I had just turned 19 years old, I moved out of my grandparents' house for the first time with my best friend Alex and my ex-boyfriend Tim. Alex's son would be at the house every other week because Alex was separated from his mother. Let's call the kid Rex. Rex was a very cool kid. He was only three years old, but was still able to beat me at Mario Kart Double Dash, which I grew up on. Because he was so smart, Alex didn't question it when Rex would talk to himself, because apparently a lot of smart kids do this. One day, being the self-proclaimed ghost hunter that I am, I asked who he was talking to. Rex looks back in the direction he was originally talking and then back to me after about five seconds. Nobody, he said, and went back to talking quietly and playing. Tim and I exchanged freaked out looks, but Alex exclaimed, see, he's not talking to anybody. I didn't buy it, despite him still being a close friend. A few weeks go by and I find myself babysitting Rex, alone at the house. He was playing outside, on our carport that we turned into a porch. I told him it was time to go inside so that I could make him lunch. He sat at the dining room table and I sat in the living room next to the door to the carport. I'm scrolling through Facebook when all of a sudden I hear one of Rex's toys start singing. I peep out the blinds on the window of the door and I couldn't see anything that would make it go off. I figured it was a squirrel and sat back down. Not a minute later, it started singing again. I opened my camera app on my phone and began recording. It didn't stop until Rex came into the living room to proclaim that he was done with his sandwich and was ready to go back outside and play. I compromised with him into watching something on Netflix instead, without giving away any details. I ended up brushing it off thinking maybe somehow the button was stuck. Another week or so goes by. I'm home alone, as I had a day off from my job at Pizza Hut, but the guys were at work. I was doing the dishes in the kitchen. Our kitchen was pretty nice. A nice fridge on the opposite side of the kitchen than the sink had liquor bottles on top of it, sat toward the back of the fridge. As I was listening to music and finishing up, a bottle flew off the fridge and smashed into the opposite wall. I waited in Tim and I's bedroom until Alex got home and explained what happened. He said it was probably sitting up there for so long that it found its way to the edge. I became quite scared of whatever was going on at this point, but my ex and best friend were signed on to the lease and anything beat living with my grandparents again even though I ultimately moved back home. Yet another week goes by and I'm out delivering pizzas. I rode by the house fairly often on my routes because we lived next door to the strip my store was in. I glanced over on this particular day and saw a raggedy lady standing outside our carport door. 
She was wearing tattered clothing, and her hair was curly and unbrushed. She was just standing there, staring at the door. I immediately called Alex, maybe three seconds after seeing her. He answered immediately. I told him to go look out the door at the carport, and he did without question. He said, I don't see anything, and I explained to him what I saw. He didn't know what to think of it. At this point, I was seriously concerned. I began stating we needed to protect the house and wore a blessed necklace a friend of mine from college had made for me. The last experience I had in this house isn't the reason I moved out, but happened shortly before I did. I went to sleep early one night, being high off my ass. I normally wouldn't go to sleep without Tim because of the events that had been happening. I left the door cracked open and a small standard nightlight on to give me peace of mind. About three minutes after falling asleep, my eyes dart open. I realized I had fallen asleep on my back, which often leads to minor sleep paralysis for me. I had taught myself a trick, wiggling my toes to get out of it. But no matter how much I wiggled my toes this time, I couldn't get out of it. I then heard the door creak open. I was relieved because I thought it was Tim. But when you're paralyzed in your sleep, it's never what you want it to be. The raggedy lady I had seen outside of my carport door glided to the corner of my bed. I couldn't see any details of her face. It was like someone had shaded it out with a pencil. She was wearing the same tattered striped shirt, and what I could now see was a long black skirt. I want to speak to the boy, she said. I'm not sure if I actually said anything to tell her okay, as I was mortified. But sure enough, Rex, who was in the room over, glided into the room next to her, and I woke up. I immediately bolted out of bed and opened Rex's bedroom door. He was muttering in his sleep. I told Alex and Tim what happened immediately, but neither of them seemed concerned. None of us live in that house anymore, and Alex has told me that Rex no longer talks to himself. Go figure. I never saw the raggedy lady again, and I hope I never do. So, I'm a 23-year-old man, and I recently had an experience quite unlike any of my lifetime. I live in a community housing project. I would say it's half a hotel motel and half apartments. It's one building with three floors of maybe about 20 different studio bedrooms on each floor, and two other buildings with the same, except those are two bedrooms. That's neither here nor there, I'm just trying to give some perspective. I've been staying at this place for about eight months now. I haven't really had any problems at all. I wouldn't say this is a problem, not as of yet, but it is weird. Now, there was an old lady that stayed directly across from me. She must have had kind of a rough life, because she broke down pretty badly mentally over time. Every night since I first moved here, I would hear her screaming and yelling and cursing literally having a whole entire conversations. Now this was weird from the start, but after a few days, I learned that she lives completely alone. I heard her literally making threats every night, sometimes crying and apologizing to someone. Now after a while, I actually ended up getting used to this behavior. Sometimes I would actually see her in the hall. No one ever talked to her. She would point at everybody and would say the most vicious, evil things to literally everyone. Our first encounter, I was met with the same treatment. I fake smiled it off and asked how she was doing. Ever since the death of my grandmother in 2014, I, for some reason, have an extreme soft spot and instant love for old ladies. Not in a weird way, just in like a how are you, let me help you with your bags, ma'am kind of way. 
I approached this lady in a similar fashion, and she seemed like she didn't know what to do with that and didn't know how to take it, but she never met me with the same aggression after that. Now, I have been here for eight months, like I said. Fast forward to just several weeks ago. By this time, this lady and I have crossed paths maybe nine to ten times. Briefly, but a few times. We never really had a conversation at all, but I would always make sure that I spoke to her and acknowledged her. She didn't really show emotion, but a little gratitude. Now every day, all day, she would still continue this manic-like screaming in her room. She very literally was sounding like an older, very angry, middle-aged man. Now, as I said, I was directly across from her, but we're also right dead at the end of our long, long hallway. And to make things even better, I have a 10 hour shift job that I work four to five days a week. I'm working a 5 p.m. to 4 a.m. shift. So just imagine a long day of work. You get to your home at the very end of the hall, almost isolated with this lady. At 4 a.m. we know it's very early, but very late also. It's still dark outside when I pull up to my apartments. It would be 4.30 in the morning and this woman is still up, barking, growling, shouting, evil, haunting, and spooky stuff, sounding like a man. I swear this is absolutely not an exaggeration. Now on to the actually scary part. Right now it's 4.14 in the morning as I type this. I actually took a day off today and I may take another just to wrap my head around what has happened in the last few days. Sunday morning, at around 6 o'clock in the morning, this woman was found dead in her room, right across from me. She wasn't killed, nobody ever came to see her or anything. She had no relationships as far as any resident here ever knew. A maintenance man would check on her at least once a day because, like me, he felt very bad for the old woman. When he checked on her this day, he had seen that she had passed and obviously reported it. She was found at 6 a.m. and they had her wrapped up and gone by 9 a.m. From what I was told, they say it was natural causes or side. They don't know which. Now, I spent that weekend at my girlfriend's place, so I wasn't present when whatever happened happened. I also had no idea that she had died. But when I returned to my apartment Sunday at 11.30 in the afternoon to noon, I walked the halls and, for the first time in eight months, heard no screaming. Now keep in mind, I have no knowledge of what has happened as I'm walking to my door. I see absolutely no one in sight. I turn and stick my key in and I hear a familiar voice. It's the old lady, but she looks much different. She looks cleaner and happy. Her hair wasn't all over the place from constantly running into walls, and she actually spoke clearly. She saw me and said, Hey, I was shocked at just that simple three-letter basic greeting from this woman. Honestly, with the events that transpired, I can't remember our exact conversation verbatim, but it was literally the happiest and best I'd ever seen her. It took me a few seconds to realize it was even her. At this point, my encounter with her was when it was approaching noon. Remember, she died at 6 a.m., but anyway, we had a brief conversation and I said, I'll see you later, ma'am. I'm a little tired, but you look beautiful today. She said, I'll see you again, young man. She said this and walked back into her apartment. It was something about her. She had a certain glow to her, a certain force and energy that I had never felt before from her. But anyway, now at this time, I think nothing about it and I go into my house and shut the door to use the restroom. A lady from the rental office who I'm close with and look up to as a godmother came and knocked on my door. Her name is Miss Tate. I opened and she asked me how I was doing. I said, I'm fine, chillin', you know, the usual. She had a very horrified look on her face and sad look. She said, have you heard about the incident? I said, no, what's going on? She says, the woman across the hall from you she took her own life this morning. Now I look at her and say nothing for legitimately 15 seconds. I ask, 
Are you talking about the screaming lady across the hall? She says, yes. I ask, are you sure it was her? She gives me a really confused look before quickly saying, I saw that lady with my own eyes, sweetie. I say, I saw her with my own eyes too, just 15 to 20 minutes ago. Miss Tate, I don't know if this was supposed to be a joke or whatever, but you need to give it up. She looked dumbfounded, and we nearly had a really bad argument. I said, let's go to her room right now. She repeatedly says, I'm not going, you can go all you want. She said that she was never going in that room again. Miss Tate finally cooled down and showed me all the proof and paperwork, and now I'm literally at a loss for words. I never even got to know that woman's name. Miss Tate told me that she suffered from extreme schizophrenia and dementia. Also, she had a very sad last half of her life. I'm still not entirely sure what happened to me. Can somebody please explain this to me? I want to think that there's some natural explanation to this. But if not, I guess I saw a ghost. I'll never forget the summer night my friends and I decided to explore the waterfall and creek on my family's rural property. We were bored teens looking for adventure. Little did we know what we would awaken. As dusk faded to darkness, we hiked along the creek, conjuring imaginary monsters in the shadows. Reaching the waterfall, we scrambled up the slippery rocks, laughter echoing. Behind the cascading water, a recess opened in the cliffside. Flashlight beams revealed a tunnel leading back into darkness. Grinning, we ducked inside, the roar of the falls fading behind us. The narrow cave passage spiraled deep into the earth, dripping water eroding strange patterns on the walls. It felt primal, pristine. Our voices bounced eerily down the unknown corridor. Finally, the tunnel opened into a high-ceilinged cavern with gigantic stalactites hanging like stone daggers. We craned our necks, awestruck. It was like entering a natural cathedral. Venturing farther, we stumbled upon something incredible. An underground lake, ink black and still as glass. Stalagmites ringed the shore like stone sentries. The place seemed off somehow, heavy with secrets best left undisturbed. Shivering despite the cavern's warmth, I turned to leave. The others begged to stay and explore, their voices too loud in the oppressive silence. Then the still black lake began to ripple, at first just faintly, then increasing until the entire surface roiled and churned violently, frothing white. My friend's laughter turned to screams. I shouted for everyone to run. We tore back through the twisting passageway as roaring filled the cavern, terrible and deafening. I chanced a backward glance and saw a pale, sinuous shape rising from the frothing water, malformed and gargantuan. We scrambled desperately up the slick tunnel, lungs burning that monstrous roar pursuing us. Finally, we tumbled out behind the waterfall and sprinted down the wooded trail. At the farmhouse, we collapsed, gasping but too terrified to speak of what had awakened in that buried abyss. I only know we unleashed something primeval, lurking in those sunless depths since the dawn of time. Something that knows the surface world still waits above, full of light and life not yet corrupted. The cave entrance now lies collapsed, sealed shut by a recent quake according to geologists, but deep in my bones I know the truth, that the tunnel collapse was no quake. It was the only way to re-entomb that which we should never have freed. I still have nightmares of the warped white form erupting from the subterranean lake, slamming into the cave walls in chaotic rage as it surged 
toward the surface, toward freedom. Whatever that ancient thing was, it thirsts to be unleashed. And I fear one day, it may finish crawling out of the depths we disturbed, its patience eternal. This was told to me by my friend who lives in Florida. One of the reasons I believe him is because I stayed at his house and observed what seemed to be paranormal activity. My friend is an artist, and before getting a studio, he would do his art in a very old warehouse. Keep in mind, he has OCD and is very specific with how he sets everything up. On more than one occasion, his work, mostly statues which weigh enough for it to take a large amount of time to carry, would end up on the complete opposite end of the table when he knows that's not where it was. There's also a room in there. It's said that a lady died in that room, and the door to that room is never opened. He said that a few times he would walk by, and the door was open and the light was turned on, when he knows that it was definitely shut and off when he last looked. He said that all of these things happened at around 3 a.m. I know that that's kind of cliché, but I believe him. Maybe it's cliché because it's true. The incident that finally convinced him to get out of there was when he was packing up to leave one day. As soon as his last piece of art touched the trailer, the building made a sound as though the entire roof had collapsed. When he turned around, everything was fine. He never went back after that. It was senior year of college, and my best friend and I were driving south to meet a friend in Florida. We were on a small back road, about 40 minutes or so out of one small town and about 40 minutes away from the next. Suddenly, out of nowhere, there's this deep fog. I had to turn on the windshield wipers to continue to see the road. I looked down briefly to adjust the wipers, and when I looked up, out of nowhere, there was a man standing halfway into the road. He was unlike anything or anyone I have ever seen. White skin, white hair, white clothing, and no shoes. He had his arm out signaling for a ride, and he didn't flinch when our vehicle went by. Worst of all, he had these glowing white eyes. Now, I've seen plenty of animal eyes glow, dogs, cats, you name it. But I've never seen a pair of human eyes reflect the light like that. It was unnerving. Anyway, I swerved out of the way, laid on the gas, and kept going. My friend and I were both quiet for a moment, and then she turns to me and says, Did you see him too? And I said, Yes. She paused and asked, and the eyes, I'm not crazy. They were glowing, right? I assured her that I saw the same thing. We haven't spoken about it since. To this day, I think about the man with the glowing eyes. Where did he come from? What did he want? And worst of all, what would have happened if we had actually stopped or crashed while swerving to avoid hitting him? At Habersoft Financial, punctuality was a religion. From trading bell to trading bell, the office was a whirlwind of calls, numbers, and stress, all in pursuit of that next deal. Yet when the market closed, the building took on a different tone, softer, quieter, as if exhaling from the day's relentless grind. But in that silence, I started hearing something else, something I couldn't easily explain. It began as a murmur, a low, indistinct sound just at the edge of my hearing. 
I'd catch it during late evenings when I was alone, filing away the endless paperwork that came with being a junior analyst. Each time I'd pause, listen, and then dismiss it as the hum of the ventilation or the echo of my own fatigue. The first time I realized it was something else, I was in the office kitchenette, making a cup of tea to power through another long night. The whispering wafted through the air, clearer this time. A subtle, sinuous thread of sound that seemed to come from conference room C, the one with the frosted glass walls and a stubborn projector that took ages to warm up. Curiosity getting the better of me, I crept up to the door. The whispering continued, undulating like a distant radio frequency. I pressed my ear against the cold surface, straining to make out words, but caught only disjointed symbols, fragments of sentences I couldn't piece together. Taking a deep breath, I pushed the door open. Silence. The room was empty, the projector off, the chairs neatly aligned around the long wooden table. I flipped on the lights, checked the corners, even peered under the table. Nothing. Just the stale aroma of dry erase markers and old coffee. It would have been easy to dismiss it as stress or fatigue. I had plenty of both. But the whispering persisted, appearing like clockwork during my solitary late night stints. It wasn't confined to conference room C. I heard it emanating from unused offices, empty hallways, even the restroom once. I took to wearing headphones, filling my ears with music or podcasts, anything to drown out the sounds. But deep down, I knew it was still there, unseen, unheard, but ever present. Then Yasmin heard it, a no-nonsense senior trader who'd been with Haversoft for over a decade. She was one of the few people I looked up to. We'd stayed late to work on a high stakes pitch and around midnight, she'd gone to make a phone call. When she came back, her face was ashen, her lips pressed into a tight line. Did you hear that? She asked, her voice tinged with disbelief. Hear what? I knew, of course, what she was talking about, but acknowledging it felt like crossing a line from which there'd be no turning back. The whispering in Roger's office. Roger, one of our VPs, was out of town. I hesitated then nodded. Yeah, I've heard it before. No idea what it is. Yasmin shook her head, as if trying to dispel the very notion. This place, I swear. Too many long hours, not enough sleep. We never spoke of it again, but the atmosphere had shifted. An unspoken tension had settled, a shared secret neither of us wanted to probe. Weeks passed, and the whispering grew bolder. Now, I didn't just hear it in empty rooms. It seemed to emanate from the walls themselves. It was as if the building had taken on a life of its own, whispering secrets it had gleaned from years of high-stakes deals, broken promises, and corporate maneuverings. The final straw was the night before the quarterly review. The office was deserted everyone having left to get some rest before the grueling day ahead. I was putting the finishing touches on a presentation when I heard it. Clear, distinct, almost intimate. The whispering filled my office, emanating from the walls, the ceiling, even the floor. It spoke in fragments, disjointed phrases that made no sense. The numbers lie under the surface, see, but don't tell. Each one layered over the other in a cacophony of insinuation. My heart pounded. My breath came in short, sharp gasps. This couldn't be stress or fatigue. It was too real, too immediate. I bolted from my office, slamming the door behind me. The whispering stopped as suddenly as it had started. The building was silent once more, its secrets contained within its walls. I still work at Haversoft Financial. The whispering has faded, but it's not gone. Sometimes, when the office is quiet and the weight of my workload lightens for a moment, I hear it. A soft, almost mocking murmur that seems to beckon from within the walls. I've learned to ignore it, 
to go about my business as if it's just another quirk of the building. But every now and then, when I'm alone, when the office is shrouded in the stillness of the night, I wonder, what secrets is it hiding? What truths are etched into its very foundation? And most disturbingly, what will happen when the whispers grow loud enough to be heard? I'll never forget that brisk fall day I went hiking in the state forest near my hometown. I was enjoying the solitude and the vibrant fall colors when something peculiar caught my eye. A small farmhouse nestled in a clearing deep in the woods. Intrigued, I wandered up to take a look. It was clearly abandoned, the roof sagging and the porch covered in leaves. All the windows were dark and broken. Surprisingly, the front door creaked open at my touch. Inside, everything was blanketed in decades of dust. The simple, rustic furnishings looked straight out of another century. Who had lived in this remote place, miles from any roads? In the bedroom, the remains of a quilt lay on a metal-framed bed. An ancient wedding photo hung askew on the wall. The young, smiling couple stared back across time frozen in that moment, even as their home crumbled around them. I was startled by a sudden thump from above, mice in the attic, I assumed, but as I explored further, more thumps and even scratching sounds came intermittently from the walls and floors. The entire house seemed to vibrate subtly at times. Unease crept up my spine. I entered what appeared to be a child's room, decorated with faded paper cutouts. Thump, scratch. The rhythmic sounds continued, becoming louder, more insistent. This was no mouse. I staggered back as a section of plaster fell from the ceiling, startled by the suddenness. I laughed at myself for being so easily spooked, but as I turned to leave, a floorboard creaked nearby in the hall, as if under slow, heavy footsteps. This was no settling house. My laughter died in my throat. Something was here with me. I rushed outside, heart racing. The empty clearing was still, autumn breeze whispering through the changing leaves. The odd sounds did not follow me out, but they had been real. Some invisible thing dwelled here. I hastily retreated down the trail glancing back frequently until the abandoned farmhouse disappeared from view. I told no one of the encounter, afraid they would think me mad. But I knew the truth. Something lingered within those crumbling walls, restless and waiting. The Transnational Express had always been a dream of mine, a cross-country train journey that zigzagged through small towns and big cities, offering panoramic views of the landscapes most people only saw in travel brochures. When work dried up and my apartment lease ended, it seemed like the universe was giving me a sign. So, with a one-way ticket and a duffel bag, I boarded the train and settled into my seat. A couple of hours into the journey, I discovered an old worn out paperback wedged into the seat pocket in front of me. No title, no author, just a yellowed cover that looked as though it had survived a few decades. Curiosity peaked, I flipped it open and began to read. The story was engaging from the get-go, featuring a protagonist named Alex, who had an uncanny number of similarities to me. Same age, same hometown, even the same peculiar birthmark on the right wrist. The sense of deja vu was amusing at first, but then, as I turned the pages, the amusement turned to disbelief. Every minor detail, every anecdote, mirrored my life. There were episodes I hadn't shared with anyone, private moments, embarrassments, triumphs. 
It was as if someone had rifled through my memories and penned them down, rebranding them as fiction. I scanned the train car, suddenly paranoid. Faces stared blankly out windows or were buried in books and screens. No one paid me any attention. Yet I felt horribly exposed, as though I'd found a hidden camera in a dressing room. Forcing myself to breathe, I decided to keep reading. I needed to know how deep the rabbit hole went. The story meandered through familiar events, then veered into unfamiliar territory. Here, the narrative split from my reality. In this alternate life, Alex had never boarded the Transnational Express. Instead, he stayed in his hometown, shackled to a job he loathed, embroiled in a doomed relationship. Page by page, the story unfolded into a cautionary tale, a life filled with regret and missed opportunities. I read about Alex's downward spiral with growing unease. The climactic sense was jarring, a tragic end involving a car accident, alcohol, and shattered dreams. I closed the book, my hands trembling. Was this some kind of sick joke? A warning? Restless, I roamed the train, passing through cars filled with families, solo travelers, and empty seats. When I reached the observation car, I found it deserted, except for an elderly woman seated by the window. She looked up as I entered, her eyes narrowing for a moment before widening in recognition. You've read the book, haven't you? She said, her voice tinged with an accent I couldn't place. What is that thing? I asked, holding up the yellowed paper back as though it were evidence in a trial. It's a glimpse, she replied. A glimpse of another path, another ending. But why me? Who wrote this? Some questions don't have answers, she said, staring past me at the blur of landscapes rushing by. Or perhaps they have too many to count. Is it a warning? I pressed, seeking some thread of sense in this woven chaos. It's a gift, she said, meeting my gaze. Whether you take it as a warning or an inspiration is entirely up to you. I left the observation car, my mind a labyrinth of questions without exits. Back in my seat, I shoved the book into my duffel bag, burying it beneath clothes and toiletries. Yet it felt like it weighed a ton, pulling me toward an understanding that remained tantalizingly out of reach. The train journey continued, stops were made, passengers disembarked, new faces appeared. But the scenery outside felt like a backdrop to the storm of thoughts inside me. Could I take this fork in the road, so vividly outlined in the pages of a nameless book? On the final day of the journey, I awoke to find the seat pocket empty. The book I had returned had vanished. I rummaged through my bag, but it was gone, as if it had never existed. No one else on the train remembered seeing it, or had any knowledge of the elderly woman in the observation car. When the train pulled into the final station, I stepped onto the platform, my duffel bag slung over my shoulder. The air was different here, filled with a sense of potential, a vibrancy that felt miles away from the life I'd left behind. I hailed a cab and directed it to a local inn. As I checked in, the woman at the front desk handed me a form to fill out. New in town? She asked, her eyes friendly, her smile genuine. Yes, I said, grasping the pen and hesitating for just a moment before writing down my name. Not Alex, the name I'd been given, but a new one, a name of my choosing. As I signed, I glanced at the clock on the wall. It was the same time the accident would have happened, according to the book's narrative. The coincidence, or was it fate, sent a shiver down my spine. I collected my room key and headed upstairs. But as I turned the corner, I froze. At the far end of the hall, a door creaked open, and for a fleeting second, I thought I saw the elderly woman from the observation car step out, her eyes meeting mine in a knowing glance. And then she was gone, the door clicking shut behind her. I stood there, a cold draft whispering down the corridor, caressing the birthmark on my wrist. 
I gripped the key in my hand, its jagged edges digging into my palm, as if urging me to unlock not just a room, but a life yet unwritten. And as I inserted the key into the lock, I wondered, would this door lead me to the story the book foretold, or to one of my own making? The lock clicked open. I stepped inside, leaving the door ajar behind me. Nightfall in the forest has its own language. The rustling leaves, the far-off hoot of an owl, and the subtle creaks of swaying trees form a symphony that speaks to the insomniac in me. On nights when sleep is a distant promise, I find myself outside, in a small clearing near my cabin, staring at the sky sprinkled with stars. But it was last night that the forest revealed a chapter of its language I had never understood before. I stepped into the clearing, my eyes tracing the familiar constellations. Orion's Belt, Cassiopeia, Ursa Major. Just as I began to retreat back to the cabin, I noticed it. The shadows of the trees were shifting, not the way shadows normally do, flitting and fading with the passing clouds or moonlight, but in a deliberate, rhythmic motion. The towering shapes of oaks and pines morphed, their silhouettes transforming into figures so massive, they seemed like giants. I blinked, rubbed my eyes, and even pinched myself. The shapes remained. They danced in slow circles, their movements synchronized with the songs of the night, each sway of their elongated arms in harmony with the rustle of leaves, each step in tune with the creaking of branches. My heart thudded in my chest, not out of fear, but awe. My feet felt anchored to the ground, as if the very earth commanded me to witness this hidden ritual. I fumbled for my phone, considering capturing this surreal spectacle, but something stopped me. The act felt intrusive, like snapping a photo in the middle of a sacred ceremony. So I watched, my eyes wide, my breath shallow, as the giants continued their dance. As the first light of dawn began to stretch across the sky, the figures gradually retreated, their forms disentangling from the shapes of giants back into the gnarled branches and trunks of trees. Just like that, the forest returned to its usual self, as if the giants had been nothing more than figments of my imagination. I walked back to the cabin in a daze, the image of the dancing giants imprinted on my mind like an indelible ink. Throughout the day, I pondered what I had witnessed. Was it a trick of the light, a vivid dream, or perhaps a rare glimpse into the forest's hidden folklore? Tonight, I find myself back in the clearing, watching the sky transition from the hues of sunset to the deep blue of night. The shadows stretch and loom as darkness descends, but there are no dancing giants this time. Whether they were a one-time marvel or a regular event for which I lack the secret schedule, I may never know. However, the forest seems different to me now, more alive, more enigmatic, a place of mysteries and untold tales. I feel privileged to have witnessed its hidden dance, a spectacle that's added a new layer of wonder to my nights. And so, every evening, I continue to step out into the clearing, not just to look for the giants, but to listen, to observe, to be a part of the forest's ever-evolving language. Even if the giants never return, their dance remains etched in my memory, a secret chapter in my ongoing relationship with the night, a silent pact with the hidden rhythms of nature. But for the past week, our hikes had gained an unexpected soundtrack, a second bark, echoing Stella's but coming from an unseen source. Every time Stella barked at a squirrel or sent a joyous hello into the wilderness, this other bark would respond. 
It was uncanny, a perfect mimic of Stella's own vocalizations, yet somehow hollow, as if coming from far away, or perhaps from somewhere much closer than I cared to think. Tonight was no different. As we stepped onto the familiar path, Stella let out a playful bark, and sure enough, the second bark replied. This phantom canine always seemed to be just out of sight, hiding behind a curtain of trees and leaves. I had considered every reasonable explanation, a neighbor's dog, an animal with a similar sounding call, even the playful acoustics of the forest. But the more I heard it, the less it sounded like any of those things. Tonight, my curiosity reached its boiling point. I decided to find out once and for all where this other bark was coming from. Come on, Stella, let's find your friend, I said, a note of forced cheerfulness in my voice. Stella looked up at me, ears perked, as if she too sensed that this hike was different. I led her off the main trail, following the direction from which the second bark seemed to emanate. Stella hesitated, then followed, her steps more cautious than usual. The second bark sounded again, closer this time, pulling us deeper into the woods. The sun was setting, and shadows stretched long fingers across the path, making the trees appear taller and more menacing. Stella barked, perhaps sensing my tension, and the second bark answered, now sounding not just like an echo, but like a distorted version of Stella's bark, as if heard through a broken speaker. The forest was darker now, and I flicked on my flashlight, its beam cutting through the gloom. I felt disoriented, as if the trees had rearranged themselves to confuse me. It was foolish to be here after dark, I realized. My gut screamed at me to turn back, but I needed to know. Just then, Stella growled, a low, rumbling sound I'd never heard her make. The fur on her back stood on end. My heart pounded in my chest as I swung my flashlight around, half expecting to catch a pair of eyes staring back at us. But there was nothing, only an impenetrable wall of darkness. That's when it hit me. The second bark had stopped. The forest was silent, save for my own breathing and the distant rustle of leaves. Whatever had been mimicking Stella was gone, or perhaps it had never been there at all. I looked down at Stella, who seemed as relieved as I was to retreat. As we made our way back to the trail, the normal sounds of the forest gradually returned. The chirping of crickets, the hoot of an owl, even Stella's own occasional bark. But the second bark remained absent, as if swallowed by the woods. We never heard it again after that night and our hikes return to their peaceful routine. Yet the experience lingers at the back of my mind, a mystery without an answer. I still venture into the woods, drawn by their beauty and tranquility, but there's a cautiousness now, a heightened awareness. I listen more than I used to, attuned to the hidden life that teems just beyond the reach of sight and understanding. As for Stella, she still bounds ahead with joyful abandon, but I've noticed she sticks closer now, as if she too understands that some mysteries are better left unsolved. Sometimes I catch her pausing, ears perked, as if waiting for something, but whatever she's listening for remains silent, a haunting whisper that has vanished into the depths of the forest, leaving only questions in its wake. I've always been fascinated by abandoned places. There's something haunting about remnants of lives once lived, crumbling back into nature. Last summer, while scouring satellite maps online, I discovered what looked like an overgrown plantation estate, deep in the rural county where I live. The curiosity was too much. I had to explore it. On a humid June day, I drove out following the GPS coordinates until I reached a seldom used dirt road snaking back into the dense forest. After a bumpy mile, I caught sight of a stone pillar 
framed by oak trees at the end of an overgrown driveway. This had to be the place. I parked and walked up the crumbling drive to find myself before the decaying facade of a once stately plantation home, two stories tall with white columns out front. The windows stared back like gaping eye sockets, frames drooping with rot. I strolled around to the side porch, its roof sagging under the weight of vines and kutsu. The back gardens were an impenetrable sea of weeds and brambles. Clearly, no one had lived here in decades. What stories lingered within these dead walls? I was itching to get inside and find out. Testing the front door, I found it unlocked. Hinges screeched as I eased it open just enough to slip through into the dusty foyer. Flecks of peeling wallpaper and plaster crunched under my footsteps. A musty odor hung in the air. I wandered slowly through the vacant rooms. Peeling floral wallpaper revealed the lathe beneath in places. Old furniture lay strewn about, drawers hanging open, dollies and books scattered across the floor. In what was once a grand parlor, the marble fireplace had collapsed, its elaborate mantle cracked completely in two. Moving upstairs, I paused in a child's room. Shelves still held scattered wooden toys, headless dolls, a faded pink blanket spilling from an iron bed frame. What long ago little girl had once played here, I wondered. What tragedy befell this family, leaving their home stranded in time? A sudden loud thump from below made me jump. Just the old house settling, I told myself. Yet somehow it sounded almost purposeful. A minute later, another heavy thud seemed to come from the walls. Unease trickled down my spine. Maybe I should leave. Heading downstairs, I felt watched from every crevice and dark corner. I quickened my pace through the musty rooms. Turning a corner, I halted in shock. A tall, thin figure stood silhouetted in a doorway up ahead, dusty sunlight streaming behind. Heart racing, I stumbled back around the corner and pressed myself against the wall, willing my panicked breaths to quiet. When I dared to peer around again seconds later, the hallway stood empty. The back of my neck prickled as I looked around wildly. Where could someone have possibly gone so quickly and without a sound? A loud crash came from upstairs as if a door had been flung violently open. That was enough for me. I bolted outside, not stopping even after I reached my car. Tires spit gravel as I tore down the winding dirt driveway, every glance in the rearview mirror half expecting to see a pallid face watching from the gloom within those dead halls. But as time passed, my unease faded. I told myself it was all in my head, a trick of the light and shadows, but I don't think I believe that. I'll never return to explore the rest of that estate's tragic secrets. What my eyes imagined seeing there, if they did, was enough to haunt my dreams for years to come. Some doors to the past are better left unopened, mysteries unraveled. Whatever spirits still linger behind in that forgotten place, I'll let them keep their solitude undisturbed. I'll never forget that sunny afternoon I went hiking in the slot canyons near my hometown. As an amateur geologist, I loved exploring the mazes of red rock formations that wind through the desert landscape. On that day, I stumbled upon a small cave I had never noticed before, halfway up a secluded sandstone cliff. Against my better judgment, I decided to investigate. I switched on my headlamp and crept into the narrow opening. The cave was larger than it appeared from the outside, consisting of a network of small chambers. I ducked through the low tunnels, tracing my hand along the smooth walls that looked almost melt-formed. In the farthest chamber, 
an arched doorway led into pitch blackness. I paused, then stepped through into the void, my headlamp piercing the darkness. The room was perfectly round, the walls ringing with echoes. It was clearly not a natural formation. I played my light upward, illuminating a domed ceiling. That's when I saw them. Hundreds of humanoid figures carved intricately into the sandstone, covering every inch of the ceiling. I stumbled back in shock. Each figure was different, some with large almond-shaped eyes. None looked quite human. I stood frozen, staring upward, my mind unable to process what I was seeing. These bizarre etchings would change human history if revealed. A scraping sound in the tunnel behind me made me whirl around. For a split second in the flashlight glow, I saw a small hairy creature crouched on all fours. Its eyes reflected the light back like an animal's. Then it scurried away down the tunnel before I could get a better look. I raced after it through the chambers, clambering back up to the cave entrance. By the time I emerged onto the cliff, it had vanished. The surrounding canyons were empty and still. I couldn't shake the image of those eyes watching me from the shadows. I had discovered something incredible and something sinister. I couldn't tell you how I knew, but in my gut, I felt it. This cave was not meant to be found. I returned home, knowing I had to keep its existence secret, at least for now. I could barely sleep that night troubled by the encounter. What had I seen, and what were the carvings of? The next morning, I hiked back, determined to get photos of the chamber that would turn science on its head. But I couldn't find the cave entrance, no matter how hard I searched the canyon walls. It had simply vanished. Over the years, I returned to the area many times, obsessively seeking the hidden cave but the sandstone face remained a sheer, unbroken surface. It was as if the cave had never existed at all, the bizarre etchings nothing more than a fantasy. Deep down, I know the truth of what I discovered that day, and more chillingly, that something ancient and unearthly dwells within those lost caverns, protecting its secrets. I've never spoken publicly of the encounter until now, but the time has come to share my story, if only to warn others that some places are not meant to be found. They must remain undiscovered for the good of humanity. When my husband and I lived in Florida, we bought a cute little three-bedroom, two-bath, ranch-style home as our first home. It wasn't huge, but it suited us just fine. We built a huge organic garden that took up about a fourth of the backyard. There was no indication of any presence in the house, at first. Over time, however, I started to notice little things that slowly turned into bigger things that I couldn't ignore. There were two smaller bedrooms on one side of the house, and those were our son's rooms. The front room was our younger son's room, and the back room was our older son's room. He was about three when we bought the house. That back bedroom always had a strange feeling about it, I wrote it off as me just being weird when we initially moved in. I distinctly remember having the thought that I was glad I didn't have to sleep in there, and that my son was so young that maybe he wouldn't be bothered by it. Wrong. When our son was about four, he asked me if God wakes us up in the morning. I told him, not physically, but metaphorically, yes. Of course, I explained this in four-year-old terms. He said that he wanted to know if God actually wakes us up in the morning. I said, what do you mean by wakes us up? My four-year-old son said that somebody tickles his feet in the morning to wake him up. What? It was tough, but I tried not to react in front of him. 
I told him God doesn't usually do that, and I moved on. Thankfully, he didn't ask about it again. There were a lot of nights before my third son was born when my oldest would come into our room saying that he was scared and couldn't sleep in his room. He would sometimes sneak into our room and use his pillow and blanket to sleep on the floor beside our bed without waking us. Generally speaking, he never really did like his room. There was even a time, out of a need for sleep, that I told him to sleep in our bed and I would try to sleep in his bed. I actually couldn't do it. It felt like somebody else was in the room with me the whole time and I couldn't fall asleep. After that, I was much more lenient about him sleeping in our room. He was very relieved when we had our third son and made that room the nursery. We put bunk beds in the front bedroom and put the two older boys in there. Now that the back bedroom was the nursery, that meant that I had to go in there several times throughout the night to nurse my infant son. I was not thrilled with that idea, but having my other sons in the front bedroom immediately put a stop to my son waking us up in the night because he was afraid. That was helpful since the new baby was already keeping me up with feedings. The feeling of never being alone and always feeling watched prevailed. It never seemed to affect the baby, though. He slept a typical infant schedule. However, I dreaded his nightly feedings. As soon as I stepped out of my bedroom, I felt that someone else was there. Once I entered the nursery, the air actually felt heavy. It was as if the atmosphere in that room was thicker. I couldn't really distinguish it. It felt like dark energy. It just felt different from the rest of the house. There were nights when I would constantly look around the room, half expecting to see someone looking back at me. The feeling of being watched was so tangible that it often gave me goosebumps. Then, it all came to a head during a typical feeding one night. My baby was probably about four months old or so and woke up at about 3 a.m. Pretty normal for him. As I sleepily stepped out of my bedroom, I saw a black figure in the shape of a man sitting on my couch. The features were definitely the build of a man, but perfectly jet black. I couldn't see any defining features like eyes or a mouth or hair, just the outline of a man that was solid black. As soon as I saw him, he stood up from the couch and disappeared. It was so fast. I stood in the doorway of my bedroom, trying to figure out if I'd really seen what I saw. I can still see it in my mind's eye to this day. It was definitely up there with some of the coolest paranormal experiences I've ever had. Of course, my immediate problem was that I had to walk right past my couch and into the nursery to nurse my son. I'm sure I don't have to tell you how much I didn't want to do that in that moment. But he was crying, and I suddenly wasn't sure if he wanted to be fed or if something had woken him up and messed with him. I rushed in to find him doing this typical hungry cry. He was such a cute little baby boy. He's almost 11 now. I miss those days. Anyway, I got sidetracked. I scooped him up and nursed him, all the while looking around the room and listening intently for anything that didn't sound normal. I felt creeped out and didn't feel alone, but we got through the feeding without further incident. The feelings of being watched and never feeling alone continued until he was sleeping through the night. Thankfully, he never seemed affected by it and stayed in that room until we moved when he was three and a half years old. My feeling of unease while in that room remained throughout the entire decade that we lived there. The second time I saw a shadow figure in that house happened about two and a half years after the first time. It was the middle of the night, and I guess my husband couldn't sleep. He'd gotten out of bed and gone to the living room to read. I woke and opened my eyes to see a male figure standing on the other side of my bedroom, facing me. He was mostly black, but I could see that he was wearing cloth pants, kind of like khakis, and a short-sleeved, checkered-type shirt. My grandfather had just passed away a couple of months before this, so at first I thought it was him. 
because those are the typical types of clothes that he would wear. I mean, who knows? Maybe it was. He has visited my dreams since then. I looked down to where my husband should have been laying and put my hand there in order to wake him to tell him to look, only to realize that he wasn't there. As soon as I looked back up, the figure turned toward the little door to our back porch, took one step, and disappeared into the door. The whole thing was over in just a moment. After a minute of coming to terms with what I had just seen, I went quickly into the living room and told my husband what had happened, still convinced that it was my grandpa. He, of course, said that it was a dream and told me to go back to bed. I find it interesting that the figure showed up the one night that my husband was not in the room with me. I do not think that that was a coincidence. There have been other strange things that have happened in the home, too. We had a dog that would bark at our closet in our bedroom for no apparent reason. I don't mean she would bark in a friendly way, either. This was the danger-I-don't-recognize-this-person bark and growl. I was actually kind of thankful when we moved, although the house was perfect in every other way. I still miss our huge organic garden. We went back there a couple of years later and met the family that bought the place. I casually asked how they liked it and if anything strange had ever happened there. Anyone who has ever seen a scary movie would have asked a million questions at that point. They simply said nothing ever had and moved on in the conversation. I left them with my email address, but I've never heard from them since. I assume they're doing fine and are comfortable in the home. As I have said before, these energies tend to find me. It's possible that whatever was there when we moved out, left. I didn't have any major experiences beyond a few whispers in our rental house before we bought the home we're in now. We've lived here for over three years and have started having some interesting things happen here now. I'm sure that means I'll have more stories to tell in the future. We were pretty beat from the long drive, but we stayed up late hanging around the fire, having some beers and grilling hot dogs. It felt good to be out here disconnected from everything. The woods were so peaceful at night. At some point, Dana said she heard music playing faintly in the distance. We all quieted down and listened. Sure enough, we could make out the indistinct sounds of people laughing and singing along to guitar music. Must be another group's campsite nearby. Let's go crash their party, Tyler said. He was pretty buzzed by then. Yeah, I want to see who else is out here, Dana added. She looked a little creeped out by the distant music and wanted company. I shrugged and figured why not. We grabbed flashlights and started hiking through the dark trees toward the sounds. I felt sticks and rocks poking into my feet through my thin sneakers. As we walked deeper into the woods, the music got louder and more raucous, like a full-on party. We shouted a few, hellos, but no one ever answered back. The forest just seemed to swallow up our voices. We kept on toward the sound of singing and laughing, even though the hair on my arms was standing up. I couldn't see any distant campfire light or anything. Finally, we came stumbling into a little clearing. They must be just on the other side, Tyler said excitedly. But there was nothing. The music cut off abruptly, leaving just the normal nightwood sounds. No tents, coolers, picnic tables. Nothing to indicate a campsite had been there at all. That's bizarre. I know I heard people here, Dana said in a small voice. We all felt the creep factor rising. Let's get back to our site, I urged. We turned our flashlights back toward where I thought our camp was. But after 15 minutes of walking, there was no sign of it. We were well and truly lost. The laughter was long gone. It was dead quiet now, except for branches scratching and critters scurrying. Even our own campfire light had vanished. We wandered in the dark woods for what felt like hours, getting more turned around by the minute. 
Exhausted and freaked out, we took shelter under a rocky overhang as the first light of dawn started glowing through the trees. I don't know what was going on in these woods, but we sure as hell couldn't wait to get out of there. This was one camping trip I won't be forgetting any time soon. The morning sun had barely begun to dip its toes into the sky when I shouldered my backpack and set off. The trail ahead was a familiar one, winding through evergreen forests and alpine meadows. I was miles away from the nearest road, immersed in nature's solitude. That's why the footprints caught me so off guard. I first noticed them around midday, while taking a water break. A set of fresh footprints, imprinted in the moist earth, trailing behind me. My heart seized for a moment. This was a remote area. Encountering another hiker was unlikely, and there was something too deliberate about the footprints, each step precisely placed behind my own, as if tracing my exact path. I looked around, expecting to see another hiker, or at least to hear the crunch of footsteps through the underbrush. But the woods were still, as if holding their collective breath. You're imagining things, I muttered to myself, shaking off the unsettling thought. Maybe an animal had trailed me for a brief moment, its paws oddly mimicking human footprints. I tightened my bootlaces and continued, making a conscious effort to focus on the beauty around me. The spatter of sunlight on ferns, the distant burble of a hidden stream. But as the sun slid lower in the sky, the footprints persisted. Whenever I veered off the main trail, they followed. When I zigzagged through a maze of boulders, they mirrored my steps. Even when I backtracked, trying to catch this unseen follower in the act, I found only their footprints merging with mine, leading back to where I'd come from. An unsettling realization settled over me. Whoever, or whatever, was following me knew the woods better than I did slipping through the forest, unseen and unheard. Rationality warred with instinct. One told me to calm down, that there must be a natural explanation. The other told me to pick up the pace. As dusk started to paint the sky in strokes of oranges and purples, I made the decision to set up camp earlier than planned. I chose an open area where I could easily spot anyone approaching. My hands trembled as I pitched my tent and built a fire its flickering light casting both comfort and eerie shadows. Throughout the evening, I was alert to every snap of twigs and rustle of leaves, straining my ears for the sounds of footsteps. But nothing broke the stillness, and fatigue eventually caught up with me. I retreated into the safety of my tent, leaving the dying fire to fend off the darkness. When dawn broke, I unzipped my tent and took a deep breath before stepping out. And there they were, fresh footprints encircling my tent, as if my unseen follower had paced a silent vigil all night. This time, a shiver of dread unfurled down my spine, stark and undeniable. I packed up in record time and resumed my hike, cutting my trip short. The footprints followed me all the way back to the trailhead, a silent stalker woven into the fabric of the wilderness. As I reached my car, relief washed over me like a cold shower. I was out. I was safe. I was... My eyes caught something on the ground next to my car. Fresh footprints, leading away into the woods, disappearing among the trees as if daring me to follow. I never did find out who, or what, had been behind me on that trail. I reported it to the park rangers, who shrugged it off as a likely prank or misinterpretation. But I know what I saw and I know the dread I felt. Sometimes I think about going back, about following those footprints into the depths of the forest to unravel the mystery once and for all. But some questions are better left unanswered, and some trails are better left untraveled. Instead, I carry the experience with me, a chilling reminder that we are never truly alone, even in the most isolated corners of the world.
It happened so quickly. One moment she was beside me, laughing as we chased a butterfly. The next, she was gone. I called out her name, my voice swallowed by the thickness of the forest. Hours turned into days, days into weeks. The search parties dwindled, hope waned, and the forest became a forbidden zone, a place of loss and unspeakable grief. Life moved on, but the wound remained fresh. My family was a broken puzzle with a missing piece. Then, 10 years later, Emily returned. I was in the kitchen when I heard the door creak open. My heart sank, expecting to see another hollow-eyed stranger asking about the girl who disappeared. Instead, there she was, standing on the threshold, unchanged, as if a decade had been but a moment. Emily? She nodded. I'm back, Alex. Her voice was the same, a time capsule preserved from our childhood. My parents, stunned into silence at first, broke down in tears and laughter, embracing her as if she were a mirage that might vanish at any moment. Questions erupted like fireworks. Where was she? How did she survive? And most hauntingly, why hadn't she aged a day? I was in the forest, she said softly, but not our forest. It was different, timeless. I tried to find my way back, but couldn't. And then, suddenly, I was here. She spoke of a realm where trees whispered secrets and streams flowed with an ethereal glow. A world almost magical, but also capricious, indifferent to human notions of time and age. Yet she couldn't explain how she had returned, only that the forest had let her go. Authorities were baffled. Doctors examined her, finding not a single mark of a decade-long ordeal. Friends and relatives, once jubilant, grew quiet, unnerved by her unchanging presence. But to me, she was still Emily, the sister I had lost and miraculously regained. We returned to the forest, hand in hand, stepping over roots and rocks as we had as children. She led me to the spot where she had vanished, an unremarkable clearing marked only by a lone, gnarled tree. Here, she said, this is where it happened. I looked around, half expecting the air to shimmer or the ground to give way, revealing the magical realm she had described. But the forest remained just a forest, beautiful but silent. Are you okay? I asked, my voice tinged with concern and a hint of sorrow. How do you rebuild a decade of lost time? She smiled, that same radiant smile that had vanished and then reappeared, unchanged. I am Alex. It's not about the time we lost, but the moments we still have. And so we walked back, each footfall a step toward an uncertain but hopeful future. Emily was back, a walking mystery, a timeless child in a world bound by clocks and calendars. Yet, as we left the forest, I couldn't shake the feeling that another realm lay just beyond the veil of leaves and shadows, waiting for the next unwary traveler to stray too far from the beaten path. But for now, the forest was once again our playground, a little less mysterious perhaps, but no less wondrous. I had been exploring the dense woods for the weekend, a lone venture to satisfy my restless spirit. The well was not what I had expected to find. My plans involved wildlife photography and the simple joy of fire-cooked meals, not relics of human settlement deep in a place where even GPS feared to tread. I approached cautiously, the hairs on the back of my neck tingling with an instinctual caution. Nature had long reclaimed this space, but the well remained like a scar that refused to heal. The air was thick, and I felt the weight of a silence that seemed to have settled ages ago. Then came the voice. Help me. It was a whisper, a desperate plea spiraling up from the inky depths below. My blood ran cold. 
I strained my ears, wondering if it was a trick of the wind or an echo bouncing through the forest. Please, help me. There it was again, unmistakable this time, a voice tinged with anguish. My rational mind screamed at me, a voice from an ancient well, miles from any human habitation. Impossible. Yet my conscience, that stubborn internal compass, refused to let me walk away. Against better judgment, I rummaged through my backpack for my flashlight and rope. Knotting the rope securely around a sturdy tree, I shined the flashlight into the well. Nothing but an impenetrable darkness stared back, swallowing the beam as if mocking my feeble attempt to unveil its secrets. With a deep breath, I began my descent, hand over hand, each downward movement a commitment to the unknown. The walls of the well closed in, damp and claustrophobic, and the air grew colder as I plunged further into the dark. Finally, my feet touched solid ground. I clicked on the flashlight and scanned my surroundings. My heart sank. There was nothing there, no trapped animal, no lost hiker, just a small vacant underground chamber with walls of stone and earth. The reality of my situation hit me like a wave. I was alone, in an ancient well, chasing a voice that couldn't possibly exist. I felt foolish and unsettled, unnerved by the echoing silence that now filled the space. As I began my ascent, pulling myself up the rope, a chilling thought crawled into my mind. What if the voice wasn't coming from the bottom, but from somewhere above? The realization propelled me faster, my muscles aching as I neared the top. When I finally emerged from the well, gasping for air, I looked around frantically. The forest appeared the same, indifferent to my turmoil, but the weight of unseen eyes pressed upon me. I pulled up the rope, packed my gear, and without a backward glance, retreated from that haunted place. The hike back to camp was a blur, my thoughts a jumble of relief and apprehension. Had I imagined it all? A trick of acoustics, perhaps. But what about that insistent plea, so filled with raw emotion? I broke camp the following morning, cutting my trip short. As I made my way out of the forest, I realized that I was leaving with more than just photographs and memories. I was taking a piece of the forest's unsettling enigma with me, a riddle that would forever remain unsolved. I never returned to that well, never sought it out on later trips or on any maps. Some mysteries, I decided, are better left as they are, unexplained echoes in the wilderness of both the world and the mind. Yet, the voice from the well has never left me, its plea lingering in quiet moments forever raising questions that dare not be answered. The first time I heard it, my hands froze over my dinner plate, fork half raised. The sound cut through the usual evening quiet, a human scream, elongated and piercing. My heart raced. Instinct pulled me to my feet, but reason anchored me. It happened again, another scream, the sound filling the empty corners of my cabin. My neighbor had warned me, said it was the birds, but a primal part of me buzzed with alarm. I had to know. Flashlight in hand, I ventured into the dark labyrinth of trees. Moonlight filtered through the canopy, casting shifting patterns on the ground. The forest seemed to breathe, and my footsteps sounded like an invasion. Then it happened. A scream, so close I could almost feel the vibration in the air. I swung my flashlight toward the sound, half expecting to see a face twisted in anguish. Instead, a bird, a black silhouette against the dark sky, swooped from a branch and disappeared into the underbrush. More screams joined in, a cacophony that felt like an eerie choir. Birds? Mimicking human agony? My mind spun, 
juggling disbelief and the chilling reality. I watched as they fluttered from tree to tree, each scream indistinguishable from a human's. Yet, something was missing. No anguish, no pain. Just air funneled through feathers and beak. Eventually I returned home, but sleep eluded me. Lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, I wrestled with what I had heard, what I had seen. Nature, as it turns out, is neither kind nor malevolent. It simply is. The birds screamed not out of sorrow, but because that's what they did, a chilling phenomenon without rhyme or reason. Days turned into weeks, and I found a new routine. I still heard the birds, their nightly screams a haunting lullaby that no longer robbed me of sleep. It became a part of my life, another element in the complex mosaic of the forest. I never found out why the birds scream, and maybe that's the point. In a world teeming with questions, not all answers bring comfort. Sometimes the enigma is more tolerable than the truth. And so I let the birds scream. They fill the night with sound, each cry an enigmatic note in the symphony of the forest. It's unsettling, yes, but it's also a reminder, a stark, unforgiving echo of life's complexities. And I listen. It first appeared 10 miles in, just beyond a bend in the trail where the pine trees grew thick enough to turn daylight into dusk. A small wooden totem figure, weathered but intricately carved, a fusion of animal shapes and human faces, staked into the ground like a miniature sentry. I figured it was a trail marker or a backpacker's forgotten memento, so I took a photo and moved on. Another five miles later, there it was again. Same totem, same details, same inscrutable expression on its carved face. I picked it up, half expecting it to be the same one I'd seen earlier, as if I'd somehow looped back on myself. But my GPS showed a straight trajectory, and I knew the trail well enough to rule out accidental backtracking. An odd coincidence, surely. I left it where I found it, suppressing the nagging feeling that the forest had grown quieter, as if holding its breath. The third time left no room for coincidences. 17 miles into the hike, after crossing a stream that wasn't even on the map, the totem reappeared. The forest canopy seemed darker than before, the air thick with a silence that drowned even the rustling leaves. I looked over my shoulder, half expecting to catch someone trailing me, but the path behind was empty, holding on to its secrets like a miser clutching gold. I pocketed the totem this time, its wooden surface cool to the touch. It weighed more than its size suggested, like it carried a gravity all its own. It was just wood and carving, I told myself. The work of an artist messing with hikers, or maybe a series of similar markers from a local tribe. And yet, as I stowed it away, I couldn't shake the sense that I'd just accepted a challenge, or maybe a dare. With the totem in my backpack, the trail seemed to shift in subtle ways. The bird song turned discordant. The roots and rocks seemed to rearrange themselves underfoot. I'd been on this trail half a dozen times, but the familiarity had worn thin, leaving me to navigate an uncanny version of a place I thought I knew. My watch beeped, the end of another mile, but when I looked down, the totem was there again. Right on the trail, its carved eyes aimed straight at me. The impossibility of the situation stabbed at my rational mind. I unzipped my bag. The earlier totem was still there, so now there were two, identical down to the minutest detail. A thought invaded my mind like a whispered suggestion. Leave the trail, step into the woods, go where the path leads you. I fought against it, but the thought persisted, echoing louder with each step as if the forest itself was urging me to stray. I stopped, taking deep breaths to center myself. I was the intruder here, 
a transient trespasser in a world that danced to ancient rhythms. My eyes scanned the darkened woods around me, half expecting them to part and reveal. What? An answer? A revelation? Finally, I placed both totems side by side on a bed of pine needles, aligning them to face the depths of the forest, and backed away. An air of finality settled, like an unspoken agreement reached. The moment stretched, then snapped. I felt the forest exhale, its breath rustling through the leaves like a sigh of relief. I retreated, leaving the totems to their inscrutable vigil. The trail returned to its familiar state as I made my way back, each mile erasing the sense of dislocation, each step reaffirming the natural order. But the totems remained, at least in my thoughts. Were they guardians or omens? A test or a message? The forest keeps its secrets well, divulging them only to those willing to stray from the path. Yet, even now, the carved faces haunt my dreams, silent, expectant, and always, always watching. The hike started like any other, a blend of sunlight and shadow, fresh air, and the freedom that only a trail could offer. My backpack settled comfortably on my shoulders as I took the familiar path leading up toward the mountain's summit. Birds offered their songs as if to cheer me on. Everything was right in the world. That is, until I stumbled upon the clearing. A gnarled tree stood at its center, its limbs reaching outward like a pleading gesture. Around the trunk, tattered pieces of paper were pinned, remnants of past hikers and their ventures. As a hiker myself, I knew it was a tradition. Leave a note, take a note, sort of like an unofficial ledger of those who've come and gone. Curious, I stepped closer to inspect the scraps of paper. Some were simple messages. John was here, or Sarah and Mike made it to the top. But my eyes caught on one poster, a missing person notice, weathered by time and rain. My breath hitched as I looked closer. It was me. Dated five years into the future, the paper showed a photograph remarkably like the one on my driver's license. My name was printed in bold, stark letters, missing. Last seen hiking near Stone Mountain. Contact if you have any information. A cold sweat broke out across my back. My hands trembled as I pulled my phone out to capture a picture of the poster, half expecting it to disappear like a figment of some surreal dream. But there it remained, in the frame of my screen, and in reality before me. Questions spiraled through my mind like a relentless whirlpool. Was this a prank? A cruel joke plotted by a friend or an enemy? But why? And how could they produce something so convincing? Yet, if it was a joke, why did my gut churn with such intense unease, as though reality itself had twisted askew? I left the clearing as quickly as I could, my pace now a hurried march. The rest of the trail felt longer, the mountain air denser. The forest no longer whispered its comforting lullabies. Instead, it seemed to close in on me like an imposing maze. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, took on an ominous tone. I pushed on, propelled by a desire to put as much distance as possible between me and that eerie clearing. When I finally emerged from the trail, I felt like I'd been spat out from another world. I threw my gear into the car and sped home, where I examined the photo I'd taken. The image on the screen was as unsettling as the paper itself, a ghostly harbinger of a future I didn't understand. Days turned into weeks, and the incident transformed into an unsettling memory, buried but never forgotten. I considered showing the photo to friends, to family, even to the police. But something stopped me each time, the unsettling notion that some questions are better left unanswered. 
Still, the poster changed something fundamental in me. These days, when I hike, I steer clear of that specific trail, opting for paths that offer fewer questions and more peace of mind. Yet sometimes, when the night is still and sleep evades me, I find myself pondering that mysterious poster, a harbinger of an unspoken future. Could it be a twisted rip in the fabric of time, a prank, or a warning? I may never know. And perhaps that uncertainty is the most unsettling part of it all, a mystery that trails behind me like an ever-present shadow, lurking just beyond the horizon of my understanding. I'm not someone who believes in monsters or the supernatural, but after what I saw at my uncle's remote cabin, I don't know what to believe. It started as a normal visit to his cabin in the middle of the woods. I was bored one sunny afternoon and decided to explore the surrounding forest. I wandered pretty far from the cabin into the dense trees. Eventually I stumbled onto a small shed tucked way back in the tree line scrawled on the wooden door in what looked like dried blood were strange symbols and writings i didn't recognize a big padlock was hanging on the door but it was unlocked against my better judgment curiosity got the best of me i slowly opened the creaky door and went inside it was pitch black and smelled like mold much bigger inside than it looked from the outside i pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight that's when I saw it. Crouched in the corner was this pale, naked creature with sunken black eyes and rows of jagged, sharp teeth. It was hairless and unnaturally skinny, with long, spindly limbs. It looked right at me, eyes shining with some sort of awareness that didn't seem natural or human. I was frozen in terror and disgust. It made this weird, scuttling movement dragging itself sideways along the wall like a crab, never taking its eyes off me. That snapped me out of it. I knew I needed to get the hell out of there. I slammed the door shut and started running blindly into the woods. Behind me, I could hear it shrieking, this ear-piercing, inhuman scream. It started clawing at the walls and throwing itself against the door, trying to get to me. The sounds followed me as I ran. I didn't stop sprinting until I got back to the cabin. I locked all the doors and windows, shaking uncontrollably. What I had seen was real, and clearly dangerous. It was evil, some twisted, unnatural thing that should not exist. First thing the next morning, I packed up and left, knowing I would never return. I never told my uncle what I saw. I have nightmares about its empty black eyes staring hungrily at me. It knew I had discovered it. Whatever it was, it did not want to be found. I wish I'd never opened that shed or seen the creature inside. It's an image I'll never get out of my head. Some things are better left alone, hidden away from humanity. There are horrors people aren't meant to know or understand. That pale, skinny thing in the shed was one of them. No good can come from such unnatural things lurking in the shadows. I learned that the hard way. A couple of months ago for my sister's birthday, she wanted us to take a trip to Savannah, Georgia. She paid for the hotel, which was a room in one of the guest houses from the historic 1790 Inn. The guest house itself was located directly across from the old Thomas House and slave quarters, and a couple blocks behind us was the Colonial Park Cemetery. I had looked the place up, looking for ghost experiences, but nothing came of it really. Lots of people had said that they had no ghost experiences, but that it was a nice day. So while I was excited to stay, I wasn't really expecting anything paranormal to happen. Now there were a few small things that could easily be explained away perhaps, 
Like a few times, we thought we had left our parlor door open, only to come back to find it closed. Or we left the TV in our room off and we came back to find it on. But maybe we were just really forgetful. While at Colonial Park Cemetery, we both felt a pull on our right pockets, and we felt cold spots. Again, small things that could probably be explained away. But after exploring the city all day and having some night tours, got to go by the Sorrelweed House too, we went back to the hotel exhausted. We were sharing the bed. We grew up together mostly sharing a room, so this was nothing new for us. But we were laying in bed, watching TV, both on our phones, when the little trash can by the bathroom sounded like the bag inside was getting rustled very loudly. We both shot up and looked at it. It lasted for about 15 to 20 seconds. I got up, half expecting to see a rat or something pop out. The hotel was very clean. I never saw any rats or bugs, but I couldn't think of anything else it could be. I didn't find any explanation for the sound. I snapped a picture of it, and we both ended up going to sleep. It should probably be noted that the vents for the AC unit were on the other side of the room, and the trash never made a noise before or after this night. I know it's such a small experience, and it's probably not even noteworthy, but at the time, in the moment, it definitely caught my attention. When I was eight to 10 years old in the mid 1990s, my mom worked at a carpet company near Beaufort, Georgia. The building had a storefront where customers could walk through and look at the samples. And in the back, there was a huge warehouse where all kinds of flooring was stored. There was a loading and unloading area with large bay doors that opened up to a concrete loading lot. The loading lot was against an overgrown wooded area but the area still had rural housing dotted here and there, so you could see the backs of a few houses a bit of ways through the woods. In general, the building always gave me the creeps. I would run around the huge hanging carpets in the warehouse while my mom was working up front. One day, while I was waiting for my mom to get off work, the big bay doors were opened, so I went out in the loading area to play outside. After a few minutes, I heard what sounded like a train coming down the tracks. Of course, when you're a kid, you get really excited about that stuff. So I ran out a little farther into the loading lot. Sure enough, I heard a train horn and I could see a train coming down the tracks from the right of the building. I put my hands over my eyes to shield them from the sun so I could see better and I watched this robin egg blue, shiny metal train coming down the track. I remember seeing a lot of rivets. At the time I called them screws because I didn't know what rivets were. On the train and windows that came down, not up. Specifically, I saw people sitting in it and especially a lot of ladies with these kind of round looking hats and a kid running down the middle of the train car. I saw a man smoking a pipe, and I remembered thinking, must be in the smoking section. To give you a better idea, the train front was rounded and the cars were rectangular. The robin egg blue was in some details, like one of the panels under each window, stripes going up the front, and a few other small areas. The rest was really shiny, like metal. It seemed like one long train, because the cars were attached really close together. I watched this train pass by and I was really excited about it. It seemed like my mom came out almost right after it passed to tell me she was ready to leave. I said, I saw the train, it just passed by. She was really confused and told me that there were no trains that passed there. I lamented that there most definitely was a train and I told her everything about it. She said, there's no train that can even come back here. The train tracks end right down there. 
I seriously thought she was pulling my leg. So I laughed and I said, uh-uh. I ran down there and sure enough, the train track ran out of track just around a bend that wasn't visible from the lot. I swore to her that I had just seen the train pass by and she swore, of course, that I was making it up. As I thought about it, I couldn't really say that I saw any specific facial features of the people on the train though. I remembered the hats, the kid, the pipe smoking, but I couldn't remember what a single face looked like. I kind of dropped it because yeah, the tracks clearly ended and a train couldn't have gone through. But I brought it up to her and explained the detail of the train again in recent years. She thought I had made it up and couldn't believe the details, but I remember all these years later and I think she kind of got spooked by it because she finally admitted that she also felt creepy in that building sometimes. I took a trip to stay in a cabin in the middle of the woods, high up in the mountains of the city of Ranger, Georgia in the United States. This neighborhood was 30 minutes up in the mountains, away from civilization, and even the cabins were spread far apart from each other. The front deck of the cabin was completely exposed to the woods, so I acknowledge that any animals could stroll along by if they pleased. But I stayed there for about a week. My boyfriend and I sat outside on the front deck every night, very late, and at no point did we feel any danger. It was peaceful, with fireflies out and the sounds of crickets every night. Until the fifth night. It was eerily dark, too. The moon was heavily covered. It was about midnight. And all of a sudden, I didn't feel at peace like I had those other nights. The forest went completely quiet, and I felt a horrible sense of dread. I genuinely feared for my life, but I can't explain why. I sat there in my chair, looking out into the dark forest, trying to rationalize and calm myself down, that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. But all of a sudden, my boyfriend said out loud that he felt unsafe. I told him I felt the same way, so we ran inside. The cabin has three floors, and we were able to climb out the window and sit on the roof, because we still wanted to be outside and relax. It didn't matter how high up I was though. I felt something truly evil and I chose to stay inside. The only other time I have ever felt something so evil was when I had a few paranormal experiences at a haunted house. Georgia doesn't really get mountain lions a lot. Maybe a bear, but this didn't feel like an animal predator was around. It felt much, much darker. At the time that this happened, I was living in Georgia. My home was near Richmond Hill, and I was working as a lifeguard near Hinesville, which is about 45 minutes away. It was the middle of summer, and I had a later shift, ending at around 9 p.m., and I had stayed in Hinesville until about 1 a.m., hanging out with coworkers before heading home. Now to give you some context, at the time I had a four-door Honda CRV. Also, between Hinesville and Richmond, there's pretty much only one road of nothingness, except for one creepy house that, according to some of my friends, was rumored to be a cult house or something where this really weird family lived secluded away from everyone. At night, that stretch of road gets really dark. There's not a lot of traffic or streetlights, and without a moon in the sky or the light of your car, you'd be pretty much blind until sunrise. Well, it was around 1 a.m. and I was heading home. Stupidly, I had forgotten to get gas before I left, and I was close to empty. I was nervous, but I figured I could make it home. 
I made it about five minutes out of Hinesville before I got the feeling that someone was watching me from the back seat. The feeling was so strong that I slowed down. I know I should have stopped, but there was no traffic except for me. I switched on my phone light and I physically turned around and looked in the back seat and in as much of the trunk as I could see, but it was empty. I turned back around, but the feeling stayed and worsened, like somebody was full on glaring at the back of my head, wanting me to notice them. Because I have the worst luck, at that moment my gas tank light came on and my tank hit the empty mark. I was still 30 minutes from home. At this point, I started freaking out. I can't tell you why I thought this, but I just knew that if I ran out of gas and was stranded on the side of the road, something bad would happen to me. It doesn't seem logical, I know, but it honestly felt like someone or something was in my back seat, staring at me with just this incredible hatred and will to hurt me. And if my car stopped, they would get their way. So I did the only thing I could think of. I clenched both hands on the wheel and started praying, just begging God to let me get to my house before my car ran out of gas. Now I know this sounds insane, and maybe there's some kind of weird technical explanation for this, because I don't know much about cars. But I swear, as I was asking to make it to my house, I watched my gas light go off and my gas tank meter go up to a quarter of a tank. I still felt like there was something in my back seat staring me down, but it felt less intense. The drive felt like forever, but I made it back to the town that I lived in, and the minute I passed the sign saying that I was now in Richmond Hill, my meter went all the way back down to empty, and my gas tank light came on, and it stayed like that the five further minutes it took me to make it to my driveway. The next morning, I talked to my mother about it. For some reason, she thought the thing in my back seat was my grandpa, who had passed away a year earlier and had Alzheimer's. She theorized that he was coming to check up on me, but had scared me because he was still confused in the afterlife. I really don't agree with that. My grandpa was a very loving person. Even when his memory got really bad and he couldn't remember my name, he still remembered me. Rather than saying my name, he said T-Ball because he'd been my T-Ball coach when I was really little. Personally, I feel like whatever it was, was attached to the road and was entirely negative. Either way, I never felt it again and my car never repeated the gas tank trick. Though after that, I started hanging a cross on my rearview mirror, just in case. I honestly don't know how to put this or where to begin, and now that I think of it, I don't know who would believe this, but it's true. This happened two years ago when I enlisted into the army, and I did my basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. At the beginning of the cycle, it seemed normal, nothing out of the ordinary until white phase had started. I will only share four experiences to avoid this being too long so hopefully you at least enjoy the stories. Whether or not you believe me is up to you. Experience one. One day, I was a battle buddy for one of my friends who had passed out due to the heat, so he had to stay at the bay for a little while. We were on the other end of the bay that has 55 bunks in it. My roster number was 340 and he was 342. So we were sitting by our bunks talking about random stuff when out of the blue, one of the locks on the 301's locker jingled out of nowhere. Now keep in mind, we're the only ones in the bay, let alone the entire company area, because the others are out training. We stop what we're talking about, and he asks me to go check it out. I say no, so we check under the bunks and nobody's there. Experience 2 the second incident happened one night when I woke up at about one in the morning. I slept on the bottom bunk, 
and the way that I slept had my head facing the middle of the bay. In front of our bunks was a blue tape line where we would have to line up for different purposes. So I woke up and looked toward the middle and I thought I saw outlines of people walking back and forth. At least four or five people passed my bunk, or so I thought. I hopped up and threw on my boots and began to tow the line. Then the fire guard came up to me and asked me what I was doing. When I told him what I saw, he said that there was nobody else awake and I should get some sleep. Experience three. This incident happened a few nights after the second one. Again, I woke up at about one o'clock in the morning, but this time it was different. I didn't see anybody walking around. Instead, I physically saw a shadow figure sitting at the edge of my bunk. I knew it wasn't one of the others because it was pitch dark, the shadow I mean. The figure was darker than dark. I just kind of froze up and tried getting the attention of the guy next to me, but he wasn't having it. Eventually, the figure faded away right in front of me, but it was still pretty creepy. This last experience I'll tell you isn't too serious, but it's still weird. One day I was in the latrine and I was shaving and getting ready for the day before anyone else had woken up. Then, randomly, all the paper towel machines, which are motion activated, went off one by one. I checked to see if anybody had come in, but I knew nobody did. I would have heard the door and footsteps, but I was just trying to convince myself that there was some kind of an explanation. These are four of the weird and creepy things that happened to me at basic. For disclosure, I'm not crazy, and I also don't know how to explain any of this. I mainly give credit to it most likely being the stress getting to me. I'm not the only one who had experiences though. These are just mine. Even the drill sergeants had experiences of their own that they told us. So are there ghost recruits wandering around the training areas? Maybe. The hiking trail through the forest was familiar. Each bend, each fork, leading deeper into the woods held a nostalgia for Maya and me. We'd hiked it dozens of times, our love story punctuated by the footfalls on this very path. It was a year ago on this trail that we'd lost a shoe. A ridiculous thing, really. Maya's right hiking boot had somehow gotten loose and fallen off. We looked everywhere, but we never found it. A small loss, but it became one of our go-to funny stories. So, when we came across a lone shoe sitting squarely in the middle of the path, laughter was our first reaction. Hey, look, someone else decided to donate to the forest, Maya chuckled. I bent down to get a closer look. No way. It's a right boot, size seven. This is your missing shoe. She raised an eyebrow. Come on, what are the odds? It's been a year. I picked it up, brushing off the leaves and dirt. It looked almost new, its material free from rot or wear, the brand and design matching the pair she used to have. This is too weird, Maya said, taking the shoe from my hands. We looked at each other, the humor dissipating like mist before the sun. This didn't make sense. We lost that shoe miles away from this spot, and the condition, it should have weathered a year of forest life. Let's get going, I suggested, suddenly eager to leave this peculiar find behind us. We walked in uneasy silence. The trees seemed to loom a little taller their shadows stretching dark fingers across the trail. Birds chatted overhead, but their songs sounded discordant, almost mocking. When we reached the spot where we'd lost the shoe a year ago, we paused. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, just a bend in the trail framed by oak and pine, 
sunlight filtering through in dappled patches. Look, Maya whispered, pointing to the ground. Right there, where she'd lost her boot, was a fresh footprint. A right footprint, its shape mirroring that of the lone boot we'd found. A shiver crawled up my spine. It felt like the forest itself was watching us, that our movements were echoed by something we couldn't see or understand. The eeriness clung to us, the silence broken only by our hurried steps. Finally, we reached the end of the trail, the car park a welcome sight. Without speaking, we packed our gear into the car and drove off. The forest receded in the rear view mirror, but its unsettling memory lingered. Days passed, the shoe sat in our garage, an enigma neither of us wanted to touch. Maya suggested we throw it away, but I hesitated. It was as though discarding it would be an admission of something too strange to articulate. And then, one morning, it was gone. The shoe had vanished from the garage, leaving an empty space on the shelf. Maya shrugged it off, saying maybe one of us had moved it and forgotten. I wanted to believe her. I really did. Yet the absence gnawed at me, as if the missing shoe had become a metaphor for an unanswered question, a puzzle missing its final piece. Weeks later, we returned to the forest. An unspoken agreement hung between us to avoid talking about the shoe or the footprint. We just wanted a normal hike to reclaim the sanctuary this trail had once been for us. But halfway in, we found it again. A lone right boot, size seven, placed neatly in the center of the path. The same brand, the same design, impossibly new. This time, we didn't stop. We didn't discuss it. We quickened our pace until we were almost running, each step an affirmation of our desire to leave this bewildering mystery behind. As we exited the forest, a chill washed over me. I looked back one last time. The trees stood like sentinels, their branches swaying gently in the wind, or perhaps in farewell. We never returned to that trail, but sometimes when we're alone in the silence of our thoughts, I catch Maya looking at her hiking boots lined up neatly by the door. And I know she's wondering, as I am, whether that other shoe is still out there on the trail, waiting for the moment we dare return, and wondering what might happen if we do. I've always enjoyed exploring the remote wooded hills around my hometown. There's something magical about being alone among the birds and trees. One Saturday, I decided to hike farther than usual, bringing along a map and a compass. After a few hours, I came to a rocky bluff. In the valley below sat a small, decrepit house, hidden in a hollow between the hills. Curious, I scrambled down for a closer look. The place seemed long abandoned. I circled the sagging porch, peering in the dusty windows. Inside was a simple one-room home, modestly furnished. Books and faded newspapers were scattered across the floor, as if the owner had left in a hurry. A noise behind made me spin around. At the edge of the tree stood a woman, silently watching me. Her old-fashioned dress was filthy and torn, her gray hair in a tangled mess. Surprised, I asked if she lived here. She only stared, expressionless. Uneasy, I turned to leave. Glancing back, I saw her stepping silently into the brush. I hurried up the bluff, confused by the strange encounter. At home, I searched local historical records, finding no indication anyone had lived in that remote hollow for decades. The mysterious woman had seemed like a ghost haunting the abandoned house. Intrigued, I decided to return. The next Saturday, I hiked back to the hollow, entering the house to explore further. Nothing had changed from my first visit. 
Curiously, there was no electricity or plumbing. It was like stepping back in time. I searched for some clue as to who had lived here, finding only a tarnished silver pocket watch engraved with the initials JB. Just then, movement outside caught my eye. The same elderly woman stood in the yard, staring vacantly. I approached her slowly, asking again who she was. Up close, her eyes were clouded, as if blinded or catatonic. She mumbled incoherently, clutching her tattered dress. I noticed her bare feet were caked in mud and leaves. Growing uneasy, I left her there, swaying, and walked back home. I had to learn who she was and why she inhabited this forgotten place. Over the following week, I scoured archives, finally discovering J.B., Jacob Benton, a hermit who had lived in that hollow from 1920 until his death in the 1960s. Could this be his ghost somehow still lingering? Against my better judgment, I returned once more, descending the bluff to confront the mystery. But when I entered the empty house, something felt wrong. There was an earthy, animal smell, trails of dirt scattered across the floor. In Jacob's bedroom, the closet door now hung open. Inside, makeshift bedding lay on the floor, leaves and twigs scattered about. My pulse quickened. Someone had been sleeping here. Back outside, the yard was empty, the woman nowhere to be seen. Uneasy, I left to hike home. Had she been real at all? I now feared returning to that house, yet felt compelled to unravel its secrets. But my curiosity will remain unfulfilled. The next weekend, I searched the hollow in vain. The house and the woman had vanished without a trace, leaving only unanswered questions. The city was a labyrinth of narrow alleys and sprawling plazas, soaked in a history that I could only appreciate through the lens of a camera. Every corner seemed steeped in a story that I couldn't fully grasp. I didn't speak the language, relying on fractured phrases and Google Translate to get by. Restaurants, museums, shopping, simple transactions, aided by the ubiquity of the universal language of currency but a deeper understanding of the place and its people eluded me. Then came that first night. Jet-lagged and restless, I wandered into the old district, away from the well-trodden paths of fellow tourists. Midnight approached. The chimes of a distant clock tower marked the hour, a dozen resonant dings echoing in the stillness. I stumbled upon a hole-in-the-wall bar sparsely populated by locals. The moment I stepped inside, something shifted. The bartender spoke, and instead of hearing unintelligible sounds, I understood him perfectly. What will you have? He asked. I answered fluently, ordering a drink in a language I didn't know I spoke. The transformation was jarring. I felt like I'd been granted access to a secret layer of the world, one that had always been there right beyond the veil of comprehension. Conversations around me became transparent, people discussing politics, love, and the trials of everyday life. Words flowed from my mouth effortlessly, my tongue deftly navigating the syntax and grammar as if I had spoken the language all my life. My newfound ability persisted. I left the bar, wandered through the labyrinthine streets, and found myself among late night benders and night owls. I conversed with ease, each interaction deepening my connection to the city and its inhabitants. But I also felt like an imposter, trespassing in a realm that wasn't meant for me. As the sky started to brighten, a sense of dread settled in. Would my newfound ability disappear as mysteriously as it had arrived? A clock somewhere struck four, and just like that, 
the words became muffled, opaque. My midnight fluency had evaporated, leaving me with nothing but an aftertaste of what had been. I returned to my hotel room, a profound sense of loss mingling with wonder. For the rest of my trip, every night at the stroke of midnight, I found myself immersed in this alternate reality, a fluent stranger in a land that felt increasingly like home. And each morning the spell broke, pushing me back into the sphere of the outsider. I spoke to no one about it. Who would believe me? Who could make sense of this bizarre circadian talent? I took no videos, snapped no audio clips. It felt wrong to document what I couldn't explain. On my last night, I stayed in. I watched the city through my window, the streets slowly emptying, the sounds of a language I could temporarily call my own, filling the air as the clock tower struck midnight. A final evening of fluency, before boarding a plane, to a place where words wouldn't evade me. I left the city, carrying its alleys and midnight conversations in the inner chambers of my memory, an experience bound to time and place. I still travel, exploring other foreign lands and other tongues, but every time the clock strikes midnight, wherever I am, I'm taken back to those winding streets, to that hole-in-the-wall bar, to the people I spoke with in a language that only truly became mine in the shadowy realm between one day and the next. It was 1983 to 85 when we had moved from Japan to the Florida Panhandle. Fort Walton Beach, to be exact. The most beautiful community you could imagine. Even though the ocean was only one side of the Panhandle, it felt like we were surrounded by water. There were myriad of ocean-fed lakes and tributaries fed by the Gulf of Mexico, weaving their way around the area. Anywhere in the town was about five minutes from the warm sands of a beach. Okaloosa Island was a quick drive, and the entire length of it was like Peter Pan's Pleasure Island, dotted with huge water slides and pina colada scented surf shops. The beaches there were lined with snow white sand that melted into the bluest waters you usually only saw in movies. I loved it there. The ocean air, the many low bridges linking different parts of the town over parts of the ocean, the perfect warm weather. I absolutely loved it. The house was almost enough to make me forget that, though. Almost. It wasn't a big house at all, not like the typical haunted houses they make movies about. It wasn't huge and full of dark rooms and basements. It was just the opposite. It was a small, one-floor house with two bedrooms, one of which I shared with my younger brother, one bathroom, a living room, and a kitchen. What we didn't have with money living a military lifestyle was made up for by traveling all over the place and experiencing life in a way most people never get to. So the house was small, but we were happy. It was also on a pretty major street that was fairly busy all day a stoplight only a block away from us. A very unassuming living situation. There was, however, one small detail my parents had kept from us until we were fully moved in. Across the street, there was an enormous brick wall that spanned at least 20 feet high, dressed in dripping green ivy and topped with ornate black iron spikes every 10 feet, the entire length of it that being at least five or six blocks. I had thought it was the private property of the wealthy. There were so many of them there. Old mansions owned by older money. They were everywhere, but that was not the case here. No, not at all. That monolithic wall housed not an antiquated home, but an antiquated cemetery, complete with archaic statuary wrought with vines and cracks and small mausoleums for the old money of the city. My brother and I were, of course, completely horrified. But the wall did its job, 
and helped us to forget soon enough, and life continued. One night, we were all watching Night Flight together. I loved music, and my parents, being very young for parents of two boys, were a huge influence on my love of rock and pop. Our couch sat in front of the huge living room window that looked out onto the busy street, only facing away from it. At this time of night, traffic was minimal, and any noise was being drowned out by the yes singing, owner of a lonely heart anyway. Still, I heard something over the music, something coming from the street. I instinctively looked over at my mom, and she just kind of shook her head no to me, like she knew what I was thinking. I turned around on the couch anyway, and pushed the curtain aside to see what it was. My mom did the same. I could see the stoplight clearly. The light was red, and there was a woman standing on the corner, looking panicked. A car had pulled up to her, and she started screaming bloody murder, struggling and yelling, while she was being pulled into the car. My mom just squeezed my shoulder. I pulled my head back in to see why my dad wasn't running out there to save her, but he was watching TV with my little brother, both completely unbothered. My brother was playing with some toy, clearly not hearing the screaming, and my dad was just sitting back tapping his foot to the song. I started to say something, but my mother's hand squeezed harder, and I whispered, but, and she said quietly, there's nothing to see. I looked back out the window. There was nothing. No car, no woman, nothing. It happened so fast, I was confused. Where did the car go? I didn't hear it peel out, and there wasn't enough time either. I didn't know when the screaming stopped either. It just stopped. I realized that when I was watching the car and the girl, there were no other cars driving by. In those few minutes, no one passed them. And now the street was suddenly very busy. I looked up at my mom, and she said under her breath, I told you not to look and gave me this look that said, don't tell your father you saw anything. So I didn't. That would be just the beginning of my experiences at that house. The Airbnb was a quaint little cottage, tucked away in the rural backroads, the kind of place that promised a reprieve from the clamor of city life. The reviews were stellar, the pictures inviting. When Emma and I arrived, it was even more charming in person, a cozy living room, antique furniture, and an atmosphere thick with rustic allure. We were about to congratulate ourselves on finding this hidden gem, when Emma, made an observation. Hey, have you noticed something off about the mirrors? I looked around. She was right. Each mirror in the cottage was either covered with cloth or turned to face the wall. It wasn't just one or two. It was all of them, from the bathroom to the bedroom to even a small hand mirror that we found in a drawer. That's a bit weird, I admitted feeling a pinch of unease. Emma pulled out her phone. Maybe it's a cultural thing or some rural superstition? Should we ask the host? Before she could dial, I suggested, eh, let's not make a big deal out of it. People have their quirks, especially out here. She nodded, but I could tell she wasn't entirely convinced. Nevertheless, we pushed the mirror issue to the back of our minds and focused on enjoying the evening. We made dinner, watched a movie on my laptop, and eventually retreated to the bedroom. The cottage had no Wi-Fi and spotty cell reception, isolating us from the world outside. It should have been freeing, but as the night deepened, the absence of mirrors started to take on a weight, invisible yet increasingly palpable. We crawled into bed and I turned off the lights. 
In the dark, the mirror issue resurfaced in my mind, now a gnawing concern. The room was pitch black, save for the sliver of moonlight that sneaked through the curtains, casting elongated shadows on the walls. Then I heard it, a faint, almost indiscernible scratching sound, like fingernails against wood, coming from the direction of the covered mirror. I shot a glance at Emma, her eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling. You heard that too? She whispered. Yeah, I said, my voice trembling despite myself. The scratching sound continued, rhythmically persistent. I weighed the options in my head. Ignore it and hope it goes away, or confront it and risk discovering something we'd rather not know. A cloud must have moved because the room darkened even further, amplifying the tension. Enough was enough. With a surge of adrenaline, I sprang out of bed and flipped on the light switch. The scratching stopped instantly. My eyes darted to the mirror covered with an embroidered cloth. I felt a mix of dread and resolve as I approached it, my hands shaking as I reached for the cloth. Wait, Emma said, her voice tinged with apprehension. I paused, locking eyes with her. In that moment, we both understood the risks of unveiling the unknown. I let my hand drop, stepping back. We should leave it alone, she said, a mixture of relief and lingering curiosity in her eyes. Agreed, I replied, unable to mask my own relief. We spent the rest of the night in a tense, sleepless vigil, the covered mirror a silent sentinel in the room. Morning couldn't come soon enough. As the first rays of sunlight filtered through the curtains, we packed up and left without looking back. Our host sent us a message later, asking how our stay was. I hesitated before typing out a non-committal reply about the cottage being lovely and quaint. There was no mention of mirrors. The experience remained a puzzle piece that refused to fit, an anomaly in an otherwise idyllic getaway. The questions hovered in our minds but neither of us wanted to probe further. Some mysteries, we concluded, are better left covered. Their truths turned away to face the wall. This is an experience I had a few years ago, which made me a believer in the paranormal. I hope you find it as interesting and creepy as I did. I went out very early in the morning, about 5 a.m., to take photos in the forest. I've always liked the vibe of the forest, especially during early mornings, since it has a kind of calmness to it. I live in central Sweden, where we have many deep forests everywhere. Much of it is untouched. Think plenty of moss and old growth trees. This particular forest I went to was quite near my home. However, since I lived in the countryside, I was very alone with no other soul around. During this morning, there was also fog lingering in the treetops from the surrounding rivers which looked really cool to be honest, so I was very ready to go take some awesome photos. I went into the forest after parking my car along the road that went beside it, and I started walking straight in. After maybe a hundred meters, I stopped to take some photos, mostly of dead trees and mushrooms and things like that. I was 20 and I felt very artsy. After a few minutes, I started hearing knocks on the trees. Probably a bird, I thought, since we do have woodpeckers around here. So, I didn't think that the sound was too unusual. The strange thing is that I started looking for it, since it came from a tree that was right beside me. But I couldn't find it. Unlucky, I thought. I wanted to see if I could get a nice photo of the bird, but I decided to move on. I continued walking into the forest when I noticed something. The knocking or pecking 
seemed to follow me as I walked. It continuously knocked on the trees closest to me. At this point, I still didn't think too much about it, but that would change after a while. I stopped at a spot that looked really nice to set up my camera on a tripod in an attempt to maybe snap some cool photos of the surrounding area and treetops. I sat down and continued to hear this knocking on a tree just a few meters behind me. At this point, I started to feel a little weird about it, since I had started to notice how it followed me. A few seconds later, while changing my camera settings, I suddenly heard several very loud and very clear heavy footsteps behind me that rapidly approached until they were right behind me. My whole body froze. I have not until this day experienced chills like that through my whole entire body. After what felt like several seconds, I flew up and spun around to what I thought was going to be some kind of a big animal but nothing was there. For context, besides a few trees, this area was not particularly dense. Just a few trees here and there, but mostly moss and grass, like a clearing. I picked up all my things and started walking quickly back toward my car. And that's when the knocking started again. It followed me again, and I just knew that something was mocking me. Feeling a little silly, I said, I'm leaving, okay? I knew that whatever it was didn't want me there. I continued to hear the knocking until I came back to the spot where I first started hearing it. And then it just stopped. I, on the other hand, did not. I went straight back to my car and I went home. Before this, I was pretty skeptical about the paranormal but this really changed my views. Since then, I've only had one other experience that I consider paranormal, but this is the one that scared me the most. My wife and I love staying at the Kehoe house. It's lovely, and it's also where we got married. It's also haunted by ghost children. It never fails. Every time we stay there, someone at breakfast is complaining about getting very little sleep due to all the children shaking the bed and pulling on the sheets. We have a friend who was one of the managers there, and while she never saw anything herself, she would often hear odd noises at night. One visit, I decided to leave a digital recorder going in the room while we were gone for the night. I caught a couple of odd sounds here or there, but later on in the recording, I got what was unmistakably the cries of a baby. At breakfast, we noted that no babies or children were guests in the house this visit. Odder still is what we discovered about our room. It seems the bathroom of our room and the neighboring room were once the day nursery for the house. Also, we did an overnight investigation at Moon River Brewery and caught some awesome EVPs. One member of the group had quite the scare in the basement. We heard his scream from upstairs and rushed down to check out the noise. He'd been checking out the back staircase used by the staff, and he noticed the dark shadow of someone halfway up. He screamed when it turned and rushed at him. I had my shirt tugged down in the basement. My wife and I were taking a break in one of the rooms on the third floor when we were startled by a loud boom in the room across the hall. It sounded like somebody had thrown a brick across the room. We went in but found nothing out of place. Luckily, I had my recorder going and I caught the thunderous sound. Savannah is a place where there is much death due to war or disease. Many people here believe in ghosts and if you live here long enough, you have plenty of stories to tell, either from your neighbors and friends or your own experiences. Most old places downtown have a tale or two. Heck, these are just a couple for me and I have a ton more. I've lived in Savannah for almost 25 years and I'll probably die here too. 
Maybe I'll join the ghostly residents and continue the city's paranormal history. I grew up in Florida in a house that was the original train station for the town we lived in. It was on nine acres of property that our landlord owned, with one acre of that being our neighbor that lived behind but to the left of our house. We shared a shale driveway to the left of our house, but we had a semi-circular driveway made of mulch that went around the back of the house and out to the main road. Suffice it to say that people either drove to our neighbor's house or into our driveway. No one came or went without at least passing our house. One afternoon after school, I was about 11 at the time, my dad met me at the door and said that he wanted to keep an eye out for a yellow car and that he wanted me to sit on the porch until I saw it. That day, I didn't see anything. But for about a week, he went on and on about a yellow car pulling in the shared driveway and revving the engine and then taking off. That was his best explanation. Then, one day he yells for me to run to the bathroom window that faced that driveway. Right there was a car that wasn't so much yellow as it had a soft glow to it, even in the daylight. It was older, but I don't really know cars well enough to tell you what make or model. It just sat there, the engine revving for about 30 seconds, and then it disappeared. My dad wouldn't talk about it after that. He was out in our side yard watching it, and just like me, he didn't see a driver. Just a yellow car that kept appearing and disappearing next to our house for about a month and a half total. After that, it never happened again. And to this day, I have no explanation. Last week, my mother stayed at her friend's house in Florida on vacation. Her friend was out of town during that time, so it was just my mom alone in the house. Her friend is a little eccentric and artsy, but I'm not really sure if she is interested in anything paranormal. She does always insist that she doesn't believe in anything, that she's not religious or spiritual at all. My mom told me that when she first got to the house, she felt a little creeped out. Her friend is a super neat freak, so my mom believed that she probably had cameras around the house. My mom felt like she was being watched, and there were all these creepy statues and masks everywhere. There were also little artistic looking altars of bone and beads, but her friend is an artist also, so it kind of made sense. The first day in the house, my mom texted me a picture of one of the statues as a joke, saying, This guy guards the kitchen. He really stops the midnight snacking. I responded and we texted back and forth a little before we stopped. The weird thing is, about an hour after we stopped texting, she sent me the photo again with the same text. I ignored it, but then a couple of hours later, she sent it again. This continued at random for the entire length of the night until about 2 p.m. the next day. Finally, I texted her back and I said, Cut it out, Mom. This is getting creepy. She told me she only ever sent me the photo once. We even compared our messages after she got back into town. However, the really creepy part was when my mom was in the kitchen. She started to get really freaked out and couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, so she turned on her spirit box. That might be the wrong word for it, I'm not sure, but it's a thing that flips through radio channels really fast, and ghosts are supposed to be able to stop it on certain words. She stood there for a long time, not saying anything, and just listening. When her spirit box said, decompose, my mom asked if someone was there, and the spirit box said, Cooper. My mom didn't want to encourage it any further, so she didn't ask any more questions. But then, completely at random, 
the spirit box said, all alone. My mom turned off the spirit box because she didn't want to hear anymore, and she left the house. She told me at night she would hear footsteps upstairs, even though she was alone in the house, as well as voices and music, but sometimes she wasn't sure if the voices and music were the neighbors or not. She was so scared that she planned an escape route through the back door if she ever heard the footsteps coming down the stairs, but thankfully that never happened. One of the statues stares out at the garden through the sliding glass door. She said she always felt like that one was watching her, even though it was actually turned away from the interior room. The other weird thing about the house is even though her friend said she wasn't religious, she had something called, I think my mom said, Matsutsas on every single door inside the house. It's something from the Jewish religion. She's not Jewish, and even if she was, I think you're only supposed to put them on your front and back door. It's something for protection. I don't quite have all the details. But it was almost like her friend was trying to get protection at every single door. The friend is aggressively hospitable, and she's been asking my mom to stay over at her house for a while. Like, she'll be upset if my mom visits and gets a hotel. We have theorized that if there is a ghost in the house, maybe it truly is all alone, and somehow influences her to desperately want people to stay there. Or maybe it was saying that it knew my mom was there all alone. One of my good friends in high school had this lake house. It was given to his parents by their grandparents, and they lived in this house from 90 to 93. One day in 1993, his mom woke him and his younger sister up and left the house. It was like two to three in the morning. They went to a restaurant that was open 24 seven and stayed there until sunrise. Then they went home packed all of their clothing and other important items and left the house. They never went back and his mother refuses to speak about what happened. They still own this property. It has two homes on it and it's lakefront, probably worth millions. The power is still on and his dad comes and checks on it every so often. In hearing this story, of course we went to the lake house. Pulling up, a motion sensor floodlight flicked on and stayed on. We unlocked the deadbolt, which requires a key to open on both sides, and walked in. Instantly you got that creepy feeling like somebody was watching you. We walked around for about half an hour, walking up the stairs and unlocking another door with a deadbolt on both sides. And man, was it eerie. All the furniture was set up. His sister's nursery was still intact, and a tea kettle was still on the stove. It was just straight up creepy in every way. Finally, we go to leave and we decide to go through the garage. I have the keys, and again, you had to have a key to unlock it from the inside. I'm trying to open the door, and I turn around to get a light, just in time to see a rock come from somewhere down the hall and hit my foot. Staring at all three of my friends and not seeing them do anything with their arms or anything else, I decided to try to unlock the door more rapidly. Finally, I find the right key and I put it in the keyhole. As soon as I do, the garage door opens about two feet, and thanks to the motion sensor floodlight that's still on, I can see a chair in the garage. The chair proceeds to be thrown against the wall with a violence that I cannot describe, and the garage door is slammed shut. I turn around to say, let's get out of here, and I see a rock come from the darkness and hit the wall with a lot of force, right next to my head. At this point, I'm done. We run back to the stairs and down to the basement, and for the safety of the door that we had come in the door, which requires a key on either side to lock or unlock. We had left that door unlocked, and it was locked. 
Freaking out, we hear what sounds like heavy running footsteps upstairs. I'm panicking to find the key. Finally, I find it and unlock the door. We run to the next door, and you guessed it, it was locked. I again find the right key as the footsteps are getting louder and coming down the stairs. We run out the door, and it gets left open by the last person out. As we go to shut it, it's slammed, and instantly you hear the deadbolt lock. At this point, we're only focusing on getting out of that place. We ran to the truck, and all four of us piled in. As soon as the truck started, every light in the house came on at once. My buddy slammed it into reverse and we're flying down this very long driveway. And as soon as our tires leave the gravel and hit the pavement, every light in the house turns off, leaving it in absolute darkness. Something very, very bad is in that house. I'm not sure what, but I'll never go back to find out. And I absolutely believe in ghosts or demons now. Believe it or not, this is the short version of the story. The backstory of the house is even creepier. But suffice it to say, I will not be returning. This is a story about my little sister's experiences with the entity that haunted our Florida home. I myself have never experienced anything in that house, but I think you'll find her encounters very creepy. For my sister's privacy, I will refer to her as Liz. This all took place in Florida when I was 15 and Liz was 11. Liz shared a room with me and our youngest sister. She slept on the top bunk while I slept across the room in my own bed. I liked to entertain my sisters by telling scary stories or reciting the whole script to one of our favorite movies. Liz always had a habit of calling me out whenever I told a scary story. She didn't believe in ghosts, which makes this whole thing ten times weirder. The first incident was probably around July, as I remember it was pretty hot. I had been asleep maybe three hours when I was shaken awake. It was Liz. She asked me why I was standing by her bed and staring at her. Having just been woken up, I was confused. I no longer sleepwalked, so I had no idea why she would think that I was staring at her all creepy-like. I got her back to bed and sat with her until she fell back asleep. The second incident was maybe four weeks later. While eating breakfast, Liz asked Mom who the man in the hat was. Mom brushed her off, but I questioned her further. She told me that late last night, she woke up to find somebody standing next to her bed, peering at her through the safety bars. She described the figure as a man wearing a fedora-type hat and wearing all black. He was very shadowy and disappeared when Liz blinked. The third and most terrifying incident happened a few days after. I remember waking up after a particularly terrifying nightmare. I looked over to my sister's bed, and I noticed that Liz was sitting bolt upright, staring at me. I asked her what was wrong. She answered, with fear apparent in her voice, The man in the hat was watching you sleep. That was the last and most terrifying incident I can remember. I don't believe he appeared again. We had our house blessed twice, so that may have deterred him. What do you think it was? I know we don't have any dead relatives that wore hats like that, so I'm very confused as to what she saw. This story might be a bit long, but it's something that happened to me years ago, and I'm still very curious about what it could have been. When I was about 13, I was in a relationship with a girl that I visited pretty frequently. 
almost every day after school if I could. Due to me visiting her so often, I got to know her and her family, as well as her home. They were very kind people, but just a little off. At the time, I wasn't a very religious person. However, my girlfriend and her family were Satanists. When I first heard that, I thought it was a joke, but soon I realized that they were being serious. I wasn't too surprised or bothered by it. She later told me that the house was haunted and me being the biggest skeptic kind of just brushed it off and showed interest so we could keep talking. After a while, I started to notice things in the house that were a little bit unsettling, but I was quick to dismiss them. I figured anything had a logical explanation behind it, so why try to claim that it was something paranormal? At first, it started with small tapping sounds. To be honest, at this time, I thought it was just the house settling or creaking due to the wind. We live in Florida, so it wasn't too hard to believe that some weather could have caused the house to make noises. That's what I believed, since it was the most logical explanation. That was until we heard scratching coming from inside her closet. We thought it was her cat at first, especially because he would constantly bring her into the room and she liked to explore. We also thought maybe she had snuck in and we had closed the door on her, oblivious, and it took her until just that moment to try to get out. Obviously, we got up and opened the closet door, but nothing was there. This was very peculiar, but I shrugged it off and figured that maybe it was a mouse or a rat in the walls. She pointed out, though, that there were scratch marks all over the closet. They weren't high up. If anything, they were about level with a common cat or a small dog. But like I said, the cat wasn't in the closet. It wasn't even in the room. Needless to say, I was weirded out. I wasn't scared, but I was starting to believe that something wasn't right. I don't know exactly what was wrong, but I was starting to feel off after this. Weeks go by and even months go by. Some minor things keep happening. Mostly just the scratching, which has pretty much torn up the paint in the closet entirely at this point. But also other things like the cat acting strangely and a weird sense of unease when you're in certain parts of the house, particularly the restroom, the garage, and the master bedroom. I just assumed that it all had a rational explanation, of course. I wasn't sure of what it was, but I was stubborn and dumb. One day, though, something was especially creepy. So creepy, to me, in fact, that I had actually started to question whether or not there are such things as gods, demons, ghosts, etc. Something that will stick with me forever. One day, my girlfriend had invited me over. So I asked my mom and she dropped me off. I noticed that there weren't any cars in her driveway, which wasn't really weird since her family did work often or were out shopping a lot. My girlfriend opens the door after I knock and lets me in. First thing we did was head to her room to watch Third Rock from the Sun. While we're sitting in there, we make some small talk and go to the kitchen to grab some food. And then we go back to her room to keep watching TV. At some point though, hours later, we end up shutting off the TV and just start talking. Out of nowhere though, we hear her older sister yell her name from right outside her door. We assumed they were finally home from wherever they went and we went out there to check up on them. Weirdly enough though, we didn't see her. We checked everywhere around the house and didn't see her at all. We even yelled back but got no response. We chalked it up to us maybe hearing something else and just assuming that that's what we had heard instead. Like maybe there was a noise and we thought we heard her name. Like I said, stubborn and dumb. We head back to the bedroom and sit down, but this time we leave her bedroom door open just in case her sister really did call for her and attempted to do it again. After a few moments, we hear her sister call for her name again However, this time it didn't seem like it came from behind the door. It sounded as if the entire house had called her name. Not only was it so loud and so clear, 
but it didn't change its tone or pitch. It sounded like it was a repeated audio recording from the last time she had called for her. Once again, we quickly bolt up and search around the house as fast as possible. We thought if it was her sister trying to play some kind of prank, we would find her, but we didn't see her. We couldn't even trace where the sound had come from, so we checked in all the areas where somebody could easily hide. Being dumb, we once again said it was probably nothing to worry about. About an hour or so goes by and we hear her dad's truck start to pull up to the house. We check out the window to watch them and the rear passenger door opens. It's her sister. We were baffled to say the least and wondered when and how she had left so quickly. We met them at the door and asked her what it was that she had kept calling for and how she'd gotten out and ended up with her family. She looked at us with confusion and concern. What she and her dad told us makes me anxious to this very day. She said that she'd been gone since six in the morning doing some shopping. We immediately tried calling her bluff, but her dad doubled down and seemed to get a little bit annoyed by this and told us that they were indeed out shopping all day. Right after he told us this, we told her sister that we had heard something that sounded exactly like her voice calling for my girlfriend and we tried finding whatever it was, but we came up with nothing. Something about this must have really alerted and worried her sister, because after we told her this, she immediately went pale and looked sick. She told me that she would like to speak to my girlfriend in private real quick and brought her to the back porch. I went back to my girlfriend's room and just sat on her bed waiting for her to come back. After about five or 10 minutes, she came back and looked a little concerned while also downplaying what had just happened. I asked her if everything was all right. She said, yeah, she asked if we had gone into her room. I told her I did and she got mad. She told me though that if we ever hear her voice while she's not home to not go in her room. I guess right above her bed is an attic and she told me how one time she was sleeping, she'd woken up in the middle of the night and saw the attic right above her bed was cracked open and she saw her own face staring back at her from inside the attic. This story is entirely true and something that has stuck with me for years. I'm 24 now, and though it's been a little over 10 years, it still feels like it happened yesterday. My boyfriend and I are camping at the Fort Pickens campground in Pensacola, Florida. Last night was a full moon and around 9.30 or 10, we went for a walk down to the beach with our husky to look at the ocean and check out the moonlight. We sat there for maybe an hour and just talked about life in general. But toward the end of the conversation, we started talking about how the ocean can play tricks on you and how strange the energy can be sometimes. We were swapping stories about how we've seen people who we thought might not really be people before. And I understand that when you talk about things like that, it puts you in a very specific headspace. All night, I tried to justify what happened to us as a trick of our minds and us hyping ourselves up. But we both saw the same thing at the same time, and there's absolutely no way that it wasn't real. We started walking back to camp and it was maybe a quarter mile from the beach down the little boardwalk thing to the main road. Once you get to the main road, you see the entrance to the campsite, and there's a small parking lot there, a stop sign, a picnic table, and a building that looks abandoned and out of business. This building is one story tall and doesn't have any signs out front, and I don't believe the doors and windows are shuttered, but they're definitely not accessible. I wouldn't even be able to press my face against the window and try to peek in because it's kind of boarded up around it. I was sitting on this picnic table while Shane was standing and telling me a creepy story about something he saw in the ocean when he was 11 years old. We were there for maybe 10 minutes 
and we were talking about his story. I was trying to debunk it and figure it out with him. When all of a sudden a girl comes walking out of the campsite area towards us and stops at the building. We both thought nothing of it because we had already seen two people walking that night and we knew people were active because it was a full moon and wanted to make the most of the campsite. But this girl walks up to the abandoned building and it looks like she's trying to peer in the windows or open the doors on the right side of the building. I almost even remember her standing on her tiptoes. She obviously doesn't get in and then she decides to walk all the way across the length of the building right in front of us to the left side. This is when I started to get uncomfortable because she doesn't look at us or address us, even though we're both loudly standing there talking. And the way that she was walking, all I could see was her side or back profile in a long brown ponytail. I know it doesn't really make sense, but it's just like, how can somebody walk from right to left in front of you and you don't see the side of their face? All I saw was her hair. It's not like she had her head turned either. It just doesn't make sense. So she rounds the corner on the left side of the building and doesn't come back. At this point, I'm actually invested and I'm kind of grilling the location she went to the whole time. I don't take my eyes off of it. I don't really know how to explain this, but it didn't seem like she walked back behind the building. It seemed like she was right there, just waiting for us to do or say something. There's a little edge, like a ledge on the side of the building that looked maybe three or four inches wide, kind of like a gutter hanging off. And I swear on my life, it's like she went behind this little four inch ledge and flipped herself sideways and was just frozen watching us. Shane has this spotlight for hunting that he uses as a flashlight and he shined it on the little ledge area of the building that she went behind. We kept seeing something low to the ground on the side of this ledge and it made us think that she was just standing there doing something. So Shane shines his light in that direction and yelled, Yo, what's up? Are you good? After this, he kept his spotlight pinned where we thought she would pop out. And after a delay of four or five seconds, we literally saw her spring out of the shadow and leer forward facing right. She had her back hunched over so she wasn't standing as tall as she normally would be. I can't explain how scary it was to be sitting there watching this whole thing take place. And once we shine the flashlight, have this person's face pop out from the side of this building. It would have been less scary if she had never come out and we had circled the whole building and nobody was there. Her movement was incredibly unnatural. It was as if no human being would respond with their body language that way after having a flashlight shining on them. It was like she couldn't figure out what to do and showed herself only because we made her and then couldn't get all the parts right in the meantime. Almost like she was scared of getting caught for doing something wrong, not scared of us. The way she popped out, her face was turned toward us and she had her arms kind of sprawled out, almost like a praying mantis. I know this sounds ridiculous, but there's literally no other way to explain this. The best part about this whole thing, though, is something that neither of us figured out until we talked about it later. We never saw a face. It was just smooth skin or clay colored, rounded, with no eyes or facial expressions. I want to say that I personally almost saw divots or pits where the eyes should have been, but there was nothing substantial there. We were still trying to figure out this encounter, so we weren't super quick to get scared at this point. We honestly thought that it was our minds playing tricks on us, but I think since both of us saw it, we knew that was probably unlikely. This is where the story starts to differentiate a little bit. After she pulls her body back behind the ledge, Shane turns off his flashlight when I asked him to because I felt like we were being rude. At this point, she's back behind the ledge and the light is off, and I see her extended body about three feet off the ground. It's like she's crouching and reaching at the same time. 
like she was going to take an over-exaggerated step and almost tiptoe off like a cartoon character or something. She leaned forward one step to the right and then pulled herself back behind the ledge. She stands up straight and then starts walking back to the right side of the building in front of us. Shane has his flashlight on her the whole time. And now she just says, Oh, I just wanted to change without having to go all the way back. But it's like, all the way back to where? She literally just came from the campground. She could have changed right there if she was heading to the beach or something. Was she going to swim at 10.30 at night? It just didn't make any sense why she needed to change in that specific spot. The strange part is I specifically heard her talk about changing. But Shane heard her say something about having to pee. I'm not sure if one or both of us just misheard her or if Shane just assumed that's what she was doing, because that's what I thought at first too. But as she walked from the left of the building across to the right and back down the trail toward the campground, she kind of scurried away quickly, as if she was embarrassed. And the crazy thing is that I didn't see her face the entire time she did this. It was like when she walked across the first time. All I saw was her long brown ponytail. After she slowly walked down the road back toward the campsite, Shane and I were talking about how messed up that whole interaction was and how we needed to get back to our own site. He told me that this person had a short, blonde, bob-style haircut. He couldn't believe me when I said that no, she had a long brown ponytail because he hadn't seen that anywhere on this person. There's no way that either of us could have mistaken these two specific haircuts and colors for the other. It's almost like she was showing each of us what she wanted to. As we walk back to our campsite, we walk past a handful of good dark trees that I, as a female, would definitely have peed behind or changed behind if I needed to. This building was so far out of the way, and I would never think to go to the distant right side of it by myself late at night in order to change clothes. It just didn't make sense, the choices that she made. And trust me, we've spent enough time in the city that if we were in New York or New Orleans or Denver or wherever, and we saw somebody doing stuff like this, we probably would have just chalked it up to the person being high and just laughed it off. But this is a random, quiet family campground where everyone's super happy and peaceful. Of course we tried to justify that maybe it was just some drunk chick being sloppy and not knowing what's going on. But even that doesn't hold any weight in comparison to those body movements and that smooth face that we saw staring back at us. Nothing about this person's body movements were natural. Not when she came slinking up. Not when she didn't notice us sitting there. Not when she looked in the window. Not when she walked across the building or dipped behind the ledge or peered out or crouched down or replied to us and definitely not when she scurried off. This is one of those situations that left me with tears in my eyes. I was absolutely shaken, but I was incredulous at the same time. I couldn't believe that it really happened to me. It's like I almost couldn't even be scared because it had already happened. And I just had to sit there and process that we really saw what we did. We talk about NPCs sometimes and joke about people making us uncomfortable and maybe not being real. And we really believe that sometimes we cross paths with angels. But this was something else entirely. This was something that seemed like a lower form or something less intelligent than us that was just pretending to be human. I feel like I should add this as a side note, but I'm Native American and I'm super familiar with all kinds of witches or bad medicine or shapeshifters. And in a lot of our stories, these are humans who are incredibly intelligent and powerful and have this human urge based on jealousy or anger or evil to target individuals and appear as another living form. I'm telling you right now that nothing about this encounter felt like that. This didn't seem like something smarter than us. It didn't seem like something with an emotional intention. It didn't seem quick or cunning like it wanted something from us. It was the exact opposite end of the spectrum. It seemed like it was mimicking or mocking human movements. 
I have no idea what its intentions were, or why it was here of all places, or why it presented itself to us that night. But I guess I just have to move forward with the knowledge that this definitely happened, and I don't have any answers. Growing up in Jacksonville as a kid, I was living about a mile from a preserve and national park. Being that the area was known as a historic monument with Spanish forts and old naval bases, there were battles fought there, in which tons of Native Americans and Spanish died essentially in my backyard. Around the time of being six to eight years old, I had night terrors met with sleep paralysis events in which I would see a human-like shadow in my room. The latter only happened twice. During those two occasions, I remember seeing it emerge from the corner of my room. And during the first event, it just stayed in place. It had no remarkable features, with only the outlining of its body being a darker barrier that defined a human outline. Head, torso, legs, arms, and maybe hands. However, the second time this happened, I immediately had an elevated heart rate, and I started panicking out of fear. Most likely, I had woken from a nightmare. I was positioned on my left side, with the shadowy guy facing my peripheral on the right, and this time it started walking toward me, getting in my bed, and holding me with its hand on my chest, from that, I was in a total panic attack, to the point that I could hear my blood pumping in my ears. After a while, I guess I just fell asleep. Maybe I passed out, I honestly don't remember. Even with all of that, I don't think I told my mom at the time. Though now, I tell her about both of these experiences all the time. She kind of just says, well, maybe that did happen. Or maybe it was just a vivid nightmare. Nowadays, I look back on that with a sort of mystified perspective. Growing up, our household was really stressful for a child. There was a lot of parental fighting on a daily basis, especially with my dad being an alcoholic. He didn't abuse me, not physically, but all of that torment did lead to a divorce when I was about 13. I've never spoken with a therapist about this or anything, but I do feel like those events were likely a product of the stress. As a bonus, whenever I would talk to my dad about it later, he confirmed to me that he saw a squatting human figure up in the rafters while we lived there, well before he went through DTs. Rest in peace to the man. This story still gives me chills to this day. When I was in the fifth grade, I had my very first paranormal experience, as well as many of my classmates. Our school was known to be haunted for whatever reason, as well as the high school and the middle school. In 1991, before I was born, there was a tornado, and it was rumored that the bodies were buried all over the city which probably isn't true, but I just thought I'd mention it. I enrolled in the elementary school because I had moved and my first day was kind of rough. I could tell I probably wasn't going to fit in, but I made some great friends toward the end of the school year. We all had our own little friend groups and stayed on separate sides of the playground. But one day we were all on the playground and one of the students in my class named Kyle saw a person wandering around in the woods. He told the teacher, but she didn't believe him. So he started telling every one of our classmates, including myself, that he had seen somebody in the woods. Now, our school was surrounded by woods. Sometimes the high schoolers would smoke in the woods, but this wasn't the case. It was only a few minutes after Kyle had told everybody what he saw that the teacher would finally believe him. The look on her face, 
You could tell she had seen something that wasn't human. You just know that look. We weren't allowed on the playground for a couple of days after that happened for our safety. So we would have recess in the lunchroom. The teachers would bring out board games and snacks at what was supposed to be recess time. Well, during recess time, this girl named Serena walked up to me and asked me if I had seen the person in the woods. I said, no, the teacher was trying to get us all in as fast as she could, so I didn't really have time to look. After that, she sat me down and showed me a locket. I didn't really know why she was showing me a locket and how it would somehow possibly connect to the conversation until she told me that she knew the person outside and that the person had given her the locket. Serena didn't really have any friends. She was pretty lonely. During recess, she would always sit by the fence, all by herself. A few days after Serena had shown me the locket, we were finally allowed to go outside for recess again. And here comes Serena, walking toward me with the locket in her hand. She told me she was missing the locket for a day or two, but she found it over by the fence with a picture of a girl in it that looked exactly like the person that Kyle saw. Fast forward to a few months later, all of my classmates are participating in a musical at the high school. We all sit behind the curtain, waiting for our turn in the musical. Serena, myself, and some of the others were left behind. And for some reason, there's a staircase behind the curtain that leads up to a door. As we were about to go on stage for our role, we see the same girl going up the staircase, never to be seen again. I was in the same district until 10th grade, and we were constantly on that stage for many more musicals and for theater, and I never saw her again. To this day, I don't really know who she is. I just know that I don't think she was alive anymore. The whole thing with the locket never made sense either. I still have a lot of questions, but it was definitely weird. Redditor Rez on the Radio tells a story about waking up to an alarming situation. Here's the story. So, I have a simple story for you. I always go to sleep with my bedroom door unlocked and the key for the door to one side on a shelf. Every time I have ever fallen asleep around people, they've said that I'm most quiet, that I'm almost a dead-looking sleeper because I move so little. To my knowledge, I have never sleepwalked. One day, I remember going to sleep as usual, door unlocked, key on the shelf. I woke up to my mom banging on my bedroom door, confused as to why it was locked. I found the key on the shelf and unlocked the door. I tried to explain that I hadn't locked it, and I was just as confused as she was. It was very disorienting, and I think I probably looked like I was going crazy. It's something that I've wondered about a lot in my life. I don't think I'll ever get an answer as to how I woke up with my door locked from the inside when I was the only one in there. Our next story is about a woman who experienced a wild glitch in the Matrix, and she wasn't the only witness. Here's her story. If you don't believe in magic or the supernatural, just go to Africa. The stuff you see there is going to change the whole trajectory of your life and everything you thought you knew. I was born and raised in Australia, but when I was 15, I moved to Kenya for four years with my siblings. I just recently came back. I'm 19 now. I have a lot of glitch in the Matrix stories in Kenya, but this one is the most interesting to me. My older brother and sister and I decided to go to the grocery store after school because my grandma, who we were staying with, wanted eggs. 
We found this outside marketplace type thing, where all the food is on tables on the side of the street. We were picking some eggs, until everyone near me started screaming. I got scared, and I looked where everyone else was looking. They were looking and screaming at an old lady. She was just standing still. She looked so normal, nothing was creepy or scary about her. There were a lot of Muslims in the area of Kenya that I lived in, and they were all shouting Islamic phrases at her, some reading the Quran. It was such a scene. Then, as I was watching her, she disappeared. I can swear on all the heavens and gods above that I am not lying. This woman disappeared on the spot. Just gone. The moment she vanished, everyone started screaming even more. My brother tells me this is all very normal in Kenya, and people believe that women like her are demons, and that's why they were yelling at her to leave. I don't care what it was, but she vanished on the spot. No walking away, nothing to block my view of her, just vanished. My brother and sister saw, the cashier lady at the food place saw, a lot of people saw this. We ran home and told my grandma, and she goes, oh yeah, that's normal here. What? I said. She said that it was people who use black magic to get around and to never interfere with them. I'll never forget what that woman looked like or how my body reacted when I saw her vanish. But along with my other experiences, I know for a fact that the supernatural, magic, and other things exist in our world. Reddit user Between the Cold Wires posted a story about something they witnessed. Blink and you'll miss it. This is the story. My apartment overlooks a big freeway. Through my bathroom and kitchen windows, you can see everything on the freeway. I can't tell you how many times I have seen horrific wrecks that have shook my place. When I want to use the restroom, my toilet is right there by the window so you always see what's going on. I came across five cop cars, one wrecker, fire trucks, and two cars. The first car was white, and then about eight feet behind it was another car. The wrecker was in front of everything, and it hadn't even dropped the bed or anything. Normally, I just glance over and feel kind of bad about what I'm seeing and move on. But this time, it was different because it looked like there were a bunch of rescue people on the car, in the back, and there was stuff being pulled out all over the ground. But the cars didn't look wrecked, and normally there aren't that many cop cars unless it's a crime. I can't see that well, because I need my glass to see the small details, and I was curious what they were doing in that car and what was on the ground. Was it a shooting or something? Another weird thing is that I didn't hear any wreck like I normally do. I didn't hear anything at all. I only noticed that all this commotion was happening when I looked out the window. So I thought, I'm going to run out to my car and get my glasses. Because I use them for driving. As I went down, I also passed my kitchen window. And I saw all the red lights flashing. Just a few seconds to go down the stairs. And a few more seconds to my car got my glasses, came back up, and in a matter of two minutes, everything out that window was gone. There was no evidence of anything, not even debris on the ground. There's no way that one wrecker that didn't even have its bed down to move the two cars was gone that fast. There was no way that all of that stuff was pulled out of the car and somehow put back in completely in two minutes. What the heck just happened? The feeling you get when something like this happens to you is a split second of, did I just lose time? I know I'm not crazy. Did any of this even happen? About 20 years later, I had another experience living by the freeway, with some wrecks, but nothing like this. Still crazy, though. What happened was, I heard a wreck, called it in, and they came out. The person was deceased. 
I watched them clean it all up and then went to bed. 30 minutes later, I heard a wreck, jumped up, looked out my window, and it looked like the exact same wreck. I called that one in too, just in case. I even told them that there was a prior wreck the exact same way on this location, and I started questioning 911, asking if they had properly cleaned up the area. As I watched the second wreck, it was pretty much identical. The person was deceased in the exact same way. In the morning, I checked out the news, and what happened was that both cars went the wrong way up the ramp at the same location, hours apart, and both were decapitated in the same spot. The ramp appears to have no problems or indications that would have directed people onto it instead of off. I knew then that something really weird had happened that was unexplainable. What's even more messed up? I just checked our city's active incident reports, and it's not on there. I would say to look between 11 and 12 p.m., so I did. I looked at the time and date, and it wasn't on there. There's one freeway report, but it's not even in the area that this happened. So it's like both of these things just don't exist. Redditor Arctic Fox of the North came to the Ghost Stories subreddit to tell not one, but three ghostly tales. Let's hear what happened. So I've wanted somewhere to share my experiences, and figured here was as good as any. My encounters with ghosts have all been pretty short, so far, so I thought I'd just put them all into one story. To this day, I'm convinced that my workplace is haunted. I had my first encounter while at work one evening. It was a little late, and a co-worker and I were staying behind to clean up after the others had left for the day, which is something we regularly do. I was going about my business and cleaning up, but when we were done and heading back to the sluice, my co-worker and best friend noticed that I had a pretty large oil stain in the shape of a handprint on my upper back. At first, I was suspicious of my co-worker, thinking that she had placed her hand on my back, but we later compared her hand to the one that was on my clothing, and her hand was way too small. Thinking back on it, I had never felt anybody put their hand on my back while I was working. That and the stain was so visible that if somebody had actually put their hand on my back, they would have needed to keep it there for a while and while I was moving around. I find this pretty freaky. I still have no clue where it came from or how it got there. My second and most recent encounter happened two days ago. The weather was pretty bad and the power ended up going out, halting production. The foreman and assistant foreman told us to go wait in the sluice, but it got a bit crowded so we eventually shuffled into the cafeteria. My best friend and I were made to go clean up like usual, but since it was almost pitch black, we couldn't see anything, and thus we only finished off with all the machines the best we could. When we got back into the sluice, we both saw somebody standing by the racks where we would usually hang our work clothes, but when we got around the corner and out from behind one of the shoe racks, there was nobody there. We looked into the foreman's office that's attached to the stairwell, and looked into the other sluice, which is right beside the one we use, but no one was there. The weirdest part is that we both saw two different ghosts. I saw a short and stubby figure, while my best friend saw a tall and lanky one. By far the weirdest experience that I've ever had. But the other one happened a while ago. I was visiting my best friend, and we were watching The Conjuring as you do. She had turned on some candles for some ambiance. Well, while we were watching the movie, one of the candles she lit almost went out, while the other one was standing perfectly still. What I find scary is that the candle only moved whenever something happened on screen. 
This candle was on a shelf, mind you. I got so creeped out that I eventually just blew out the candle. Something I should note is that my best friend has an attachment. Her words, not mine. And now I'm pretty sure something has latched onto me as well. Her house has this old sword that she says has the souls of all of its victims trapped inside. Even the original owner of the sword. She's experienced way more spooky things than I have. So, I suppose she has more authority on this particular subject. Nevertheless, it's kind of scary, even though she always assures me that the ghosts at her home aren't harmful, but they do like to mess around. Somehow, that's less than comforting. This story was posted to Reddit by user Wernover Klimt, who tells about a theater with a ghostly reputation. Here's the tale. About 30 years ago, I spent several years working in movie theaters in Worcester, Massachusetts. My favorite was the huge old building that had been chopped up into four separate cinemas. It had been a beautiful theater back when it was built in 1926 as the Poli Palace. Though it had been semi-destroyed during modernization in the late 50s, there were still many original features of the building that remained. As a manager, I had been issued a big keychain that gave me access to the entirety of the building, and I spent countless hours exploring nearly every part of that building. Except the curtain loft, which would have required climbing an iron ladder up about 80 feet. No thank you. The building had attics and basements and crawl spaces. There was an area in the front of the building on the second floor that had two or three abandoned businesses that had been walled off. There was a music store and a ballet studio and maybe an office. There was also a bathroom. Everything looked like it was from the 1940s or 50s. Faded wallpaper with ballerina motif, a peeling mirror on the wall. In another section of the building was the old manager's office, with high ceilings and crown molding and a beautiful stained glass window that I believe dated back to 1912 and had previously been part of an adjacent theater. There was still an old safe in the office. I found a newspaper article in the public library from 1942 or 44 that detailed an armed robbery when two men had tied up the managers in the office and robbed the safe. One of those men was later executed in the electric chair for an unrelated crime. We used the old manager's office to store giant 30-gallon bags of popcorn. There was also a sort of crawl space under the box office that was accessible by lifting a hinged plywood panel and climbing over a four-foot wall. On the other side were the remains of a couple of basement rooms with broken concrete and bricks strewn about. In one of those rooms, I found an old flared Coca-Cola glass in perfect condition. I kept it for years. I also found a deck of cards in a handmade leather pouch with a snap closure, fashioned out of a buffalo nickel. There were also old dressing rooms with makeup mirrors and light bulbs. The paint was peeling off the walls in potato chip sized flakes. As you can surmise, the building was purported to be haunted. The head manager claimed to have had ghostly experiences, so I'll start there, I guess. When the building was remodeled in the late 1950s, the men's room in the basement was converted into the manager's office. One night, while closing up, the manager, my boss, made his way up to the stairs to the main lobby. As he emerged, something caught his eye. Way up by the ornate 30-foot ceiling, he saw an apparition floating there. It disappeared into the ceiling. Terrified, he ran back down the stairs and hid in the office until daylight. Another time, he was again working late. There were several arcade machines in an area of the lobby, and they were normally powered off when the last shows were in. As he climbed the stairs, 
he heard all of the machines making their electronic bleeps and bloops. He was annoyed that the usher had clearly failed to turn off the machines before punching out, and realized that he would have to go do it himself. As soon as he opened the door, though, the noises stopped dead. Looking across the lobby from where he emerged, the machines were all dark. They were indeed powered off. A projectionist claimed that he looked out of the booth window one night in the big theater upstairs while shutting things down and saw a face looking in at him. I take those stories with a grain of salt. I was always skeptical of those based on the sources, but here's my experience. I was obsessed with the history of the building and would research newspaper archives for articles about it. There were rumors that a stagehand had died there in an accident during the time that it had been a vaudeville theater. I was never able to confirm that. I had talked about the building to my mother, and she, in turn, happened to discuss it with a woman that she worked with. The woman claimed to be a psychic or clairvoyant, or maybe just that she would get feelings about things. She told my mother that she had been to that theater, and that she felt that somebody had indeed been killed there, and that his name began with the letter M. My reaction was, okay, sure, she sounds nutty. Sometime later, I was the sole manager on duty on a slow night midweek. I was alone in the office in the basement. The seven o'clock shows were in, and I was doing paperwork. The intercom buzzed. It was the box office cashier calling to tell me that I had a phone call. I asked who it was, and she said that she didn't know. I hung up the intercom and pushed the button for the main incoming line where the call was holding. The earpiece erupted with a loud, close squealing and static. I used the word close because it was so loud and distinct that I assumed that it was something wrong with the phone PBX in our building rather than the line itself or the caller's phone. It was just the impression I had. Hello? Nothing. Just more squealing and static. Hello, I repeated. Hello? A man's voice. Calm, flat, distinct. Then nothing further. Who is this? I was a bit perplexed. All of the noise on the line and the caller seemingly reluctant to speak. This is Mike. Calm, quiet, not shouting over the noise of the line like he couldn't even hear it. Quite audible and clear then nothing but the awful squealing and static. I waited a few seconds for the caller to continue. After all, he called me. Presumably there was a reason, but nothing. Mike who, I said, feeling a little bit impatient. Mike is a common name, and there were two Mikes employed there at the time. One of them had a fairly high-pitched voice that sounded nothing like the caller. It didn't sound like the other Mike either. The line abruptly went dead, silent. The squealing and hissing stopped. I waited. Nobody called back. I called Sandy, the box office cashier, and asked her if they had asked for me personally or just to speak to the manager. She said that the caller had asked for me by name. And suddenly, I remembered my mother's friend. A man's name beginning with the letter M. Mike. It never happened again, and the phone never made those noises again. No one ever confessed to some kind of a prank. And I never figured out who it was. Redditor's psychological aunt, 8611, posted a story that happened to him on a hiking expedition. Here it is. As a young man, I loved to climb mountains. This is an amazing encounter that occurred to me on one climbing expedition. We had left a hut late one night. The intention was to summit a mountain in a single long push by climbing right through the night. It was bad weather in the middle of winter and there was deep snow we were trying to find our way through a maze of crevasses on a glacier. 
I remember the howling winds and clouds moving rapidly through the sky as the bulk of the mountain loomed over us. There was a full moon, which would hide behind the clouds before emerging again. I remember seeing a man moving up the slope from below us. The first thing that struck me was that he didn't have a headlamp on. I yelled over the wind at my climbing partner. Let's go talk to this guy. What guy? He shouted back. That guy, I said, pointing down at the figure moving toward us. There was a pause. What guy? At this point, I remember losing it. That freaking guy right there. He's right there. And at that point, I looked back down to see absolutely nothing. Thinking he had fallen into a crevasse, we walked down, but we never found any tracks. There was no trace of anyone. In the years since, I have heard reports of similar encounters in that area. In fact, recently, the bones of a deceased climber from the 1970s were discovered, melted out of the ice. The news report reminded me of my mysterious climber from that night, and it just makes me wonder. For our next tale, Reddit user that goth witch one recounts the story of a Ouija board session gone wrong. Here's what happened. Roughly eight years ago, during spooky season, I was staying with my boyfriend's mom and her baby daddy at the baby daddy's house. My boyfriend was away in another town, visiting his grandmother and friends. My boyfriend's mom and his two sisters and I were watching a scary movie when we somehow ended up in a conversation about how the house that we were in had a history of being haunted. Fifteen-year-old me absolutely loved the occult and witchcraft, especially Ouija boards at the time. You see where this is going, right? I proposed the idea of making and using one. Stupid idea, I know. And everybody was all up in arms for a spooky October evening. I don't remember what the session consisted of regarding questions or answers, but there's a very good reason for that. About 15 minutes into our session, we get to talking about our creepy experiences. A woman's blood-curdling scream erupted from the downstairs basement, echoing up the stairs to the living room where we were. The baby daddy was asleep, mind you, and even if he hadn't been, there was no way in heck that he could have produced such a terrifying noise. Not a chance. This scream was not a regular scream. It sounded like a few different things. In one way, it sounded like a woman was being brutally stabbed to death and was in excruciating pain. In another way, it almost sounded otherworldly, straight up demonic. It reminded me of what I would imagine a banshee to sound like if I'd ever heard one. We all panicked. All four of us heard it. It sounded so clearly like a physical person, so much so that we were scared that somebody was really down there, so the mom went down to make sure that there wasn't, and there wasn't. We said goodbye and ended the session. To this day, I'm still unsure if it was a lost spirit calling for help, or if it was a dark entity making its presence known. When she was just 11 years old, Reddit user SimpleLeaf96396's dad rebuilt their home. However, brand new as it was, it didn't stop something uninvited from checking out her new bedroom. Here's the story. I grew up as an only child. My parents had my sister when I was 11. Before she was born, my dad rebuilt our bungalow into a huge two-story house. Hence, no one had died in my new bedroom. 
I'm in my mid-twenties now, but when I was around seven, I started getting a lot of nightmares about the concept of death. I would wake up in the middle of the night crying for weeks on end, and then it would stop for a while before starting up again. By the age of 10, this developed into a feeling of being watched, being unable to sleep, and being convinced that something, not someone, but something, was watching me from a specific corner of my room. My new room, the one that my dad had built. My dad eventually ripped that section of wall out to show me that there was a space there. I don't remember why, but there was a space all the way around the upstairs. He had tried to turn it into a fun den area for me, but I hated it, and I wouldn't go in there. This continued until I was about 12, when I got my first smartphone. The iPhone was my dad's old one, but it worked just fine. That was until it got dark outside, and the phone would start typing random letters when I was texting or typing to someone. This only ever happened in my bedroom. As soon as I would go out of the room, it stopped. I told my dad, and he said that it must be damaged, and he bought me a new one for my 13th birthday. He believes in ghosts, but he couldn't explain what was happening in that room that he had built. The new phone did the same thing. I thought I was going mad. I bought some spell candles from a witchcraft museum when we went on holiday. I was about 14. I used them to politely ask whoever or whatever was there to please leave the house peacefully. This seemed to work, and I was perfectly okay in that room again. I slept fine, my phones were all fine as I upgraded and got new ones, and I moved out when I was 20. I went to visit my parents and stayed the night in my old room. Whatever was there when I was a child is back. That same corner, that same feeling, the same dark energy, the same creature. Except now I have an image of it, burned into my memory, despite never actually seeing it. It's a dark creature. It has some type of human shape, but very muscular, and it crawls around on all fours, legs bent behind it. Almost wolfish, but without a snout. It snarls and glares, dark red eyes with big black pupils, and it has horns as well. Big horns curved back over its head. There's some type of red tinge to it, but I can't identify where it comes from. But there you go. That's my story. Believe me or don't, it doesn't matter to me. But I don't go into that room anymore when I see my parents. Not even in the daytime. For this next story, Reddit user PrestigiousNeck873 recounts their mom's tale about a rather heartwarming paranormal encounter. Here's her story. My grandma unfortunately passed away around five years ago. She was living here with my grandpa, and they were both on my mom's side. Unfortunately, again yesterday, my grandfather passed. What makes this a ghost story, though, is what happened twice the night before their passing. The night after my grandma passed, my mom had a very vivid dream that she told us about. The dream started with my grandma coming out of her room. My mom was in tears asking her, Mom, are you okay? And grandma reassured her multiple times, Don't worry, don't worry, I'm fine. My mom looks down and notices that my grandma's oxygen tank wasn't plugged in. She wasn't connected to it. My mom had said, Mom, your oxygen. My grandma just looked at her endearingly and said, Oh, I don't need that thing anymore. And then my mom woke up. Fast forwarding to more recently, my grandpa has been very sick. He gave up on his health and took very poor care of himself and wouldn't accept any help. 
He often said that he wanted to die. My mom tried so hard to get him to change his life and go to a hospital, but he wouldn't go or take any medicine. One day, we heard nothing coming from his room. We could usually hear a TV on, him coughing once in a while, but there was just nothing. At that point, he was gone, but we didn't know that yet. That night, she had another dream, but this time with my grandpa. He walked out of his room and made his way to the restroom, and Mom asked, Oh my gosh, are you okay? We hadn't heard from you. He smiled and looked at her and said, Yes, don't worry. We're okay now. My mom described him clearly smiling with tears in his eyes. She woke up the next day, ran into the room, and found him passed away. What makes it crazier is that both dreams happened the night of the day that they passed away, even though my mom hadn't known yet that they were gone. May they rest in peace. In a harrowing moment, Reddit user Cherry Cranberries encountered a police officer who saved their life. But was it an officer or an angel? You decide. I was telling this story to someone today. I haven't spoken about this story in many years, but I thought I might share it. This happened about 10 years ago. I was barely 20 years old, living in Massachusetts. I was driving to my college at the time. I commuted to school. And this particular day was very snowy, icy, and sleeting. I don't know why school was in session, but in the Northeast, they don't take bad weather very seriously. I think we've all seen the memes of cars with piles of snow on them saying that they're heading to work. That's just New England for you. So anyway, I'm driving to school and I was late. The road which I was driving on was a two-lane highway that was very steep. Between the two lanes were Jersey barriers, and the opposite flow of traffic was on the other side. Like many roads here, there are no shoulders, and there was no turnaround. Once you were on this highway, you had to drive another five miles before you could pull off to the closest exit. It was the type of highway where if your car stopped, you were pretty much screwed because there was nowhere to pull off. Again, no shoulders or grass, just concrete barriers on both sides and a barrier in the middle. It was a dangerous highway that many people had died on. Even a friend of my mom's coworker had died on it. I was driving pretty fast for the type of weather I was in. I was in the far left lane and could see a tractor trailer in the far right, but behind my car. Suddenly, my car fishtailed, and I spun out completely. I was suddenly in the far right lane, facing oncoming traffic. The tractor trailer was coming at me. Like, coming at me. There was no time or place to go. I remember this feeling came over me, like my brain didn't register what was happening. And suddenly, out of nowhere, my car was in reverse, and I was in a miracle of a small shoulder, but still facing oncoming traffic. I don't know how it happened, and I remember being in shock. Like, how did that just happen? The tractor trailer blew past me in seconds. I mean, I would have been literal toast if I hadn't gotten to that shoulder. Breathing really heavily, I said to myself, did I really just do that? Within what must have been 10 to 15 seconds, I hear a few knocks on my driver's side window. I open the window and a young male police officer is now staring right at me. He says, hey, I saw your car spin out. I see the lights behind now and his car parked right behind me in the same small squeeze of a shoulder that we had, which ended quickly up ahead. Clearly seeing me in what probably looked like total shock, he continued and said, uh, You were going too fast. I said, Yeah, I know. And then he says, in this 
soft but direct tone. Stop rushing. Why are you rushing? You need to relax, okay? Relax. It was something like that. He then says how he's going to stop the traffic so I can turn my car around the proper direction and get back on the road. It's fuzzy how he did it, but I just remember him stopping the flow. I turned my car around out of the shoulder. Remember that my car was facing the wrong direction, so I wouldn't have been able to do that without his intervention. And slowly I pulled it back in the proper direction that I was supposed to be going in. I continued on and I looked behind me. Normally, you can see a cop pull out after you, see their lights on or the car themselves if they turn it off or whatever. But all I saw were the cars that were waiting for me to drive. It's weird to explain, but this cop disappeared in seconds. I mean, disappeared. And like I said, there was nowhere for him to go. The only turnaround, that small cutout median that cops tend to use to go in different directions, wasn't for another mile ahead, and the first exit off wasn't for another five miles. The small little shoulder ended up right where I was, and this cop was nowhere to be seen. It was so weird. I remember looking back several times in my mirror and saying out loud, where did he go? It was so odd that I thought about it all day. I came home and told my parents what had happened. Of course, in shock that my car spun out in the opposite direction and I almost hit a tractor trailer, I told them exactly where this took place, how my car went into reverse, how I have no recollection, and of the magical cop that showed up in 10 seconds and disappeared just as fast. My own parents thought that it was the strangest thing. I've told this story to a few people I know, and they've also thought it was weird. I think and my parents agreed that either that cop was sent by God at the exact moment I needed help, or he wasn't really a cop at all. It's been a decade and I still think about this encounter. Without that man, I wouldn't have been able to get back onto the highway unless I had taken a great risk or sat there in confusion and shock with the possibility of someone else hitting me while snow, ice, and sleet fell on my car. It was a very peculiar and life-saving encounter, and whoever it was, I won't soon forget it. After the death of their grandfather, Redditor Omastorm had an encounter that startled and comforted them. This is the story. A few years ago, my grandpa had passed away. He wasn't a very big believer in ghosts or anything regarding the paranormal until he was in his older years. Well, I ended up inheriting his 86 T-Bird. Lots of history with that car between myself and my grandpa. Anyway, a few months after he passed away, I'm driving the car to work, listening to music, and just processing the fact that he was truly gone. The car is all I have left, or so I thought. I drive toward one of my work sites and out of nowhere, I get a blast of the cologne he always wore. It was his favorite cologne to use whenever he was going out anywhere. I pull up to my work site and park the car. I can smell the cologne so strongly in the passenger seat, and I'm just staring at it like, there's no cologne in here, but why does it smell like grandpa's? It took me a solid two minutes to figure out that his spirit was in the car with me. His spirit had taken a ride with me to work that day. The cologne scent didn't dissipate one bit. It was honestly reassuring to me that he was still there in a way, so yeah, interesting and odd encounter for me because of the fact that when he was alive he wasn't really a strong believer in the afterlife well i guess he proved himself wrong because he still hangs around me whenever something's wrong
When Redditor O.G. Wiz was 15 years old, they lived in a basement apartment at their parents' house. What happened there stuck with them for the rest of their lives. Here's the story. My parents bought their house in 1996. The family that owned it before us renovated the basement to be an apartment complete with its own kitchen and bathroom. So obviously, at 15, I lived in the basement apartment. I stayed there until 2013. I had this TV stand that I used for storage space. It sat next to the bathroom door. It had a couple of old computers on it, some boxes of random junk, and a ton of DVD cases. They were all empty cases. I had separate storage for the discs themselves, but I had a thing about not letting go of useless items, apparently. In the living room, which I didn't really use much, there were a couple of old couches. The family cat preferred to hang out there on one of the couches. One night, probably around 11 p.m., I went to use the washroom. The cat was on the couch, and no one else was home. I opened the door to leave the bathroom, and suddenly a DVD case shot from the TV stand and hit the wall across the room. At the same moment, the cat jumped up, arched its back, and started hissing. Then the cat ran upstairs. That was the only time that this happened to me in that basement. And it's the only time that I ever saw that cat, who recently died at the age of 22, hiss or arch his back at anything. I've only had a few experiences in my life that I would consider paranormal. I don't really much believe in this stuff, to tell you the truth, but I could not figure out any other explanation for the DVD case flying across the room, or for the cat to act so out of character. I don't know what it was, but I believe that something was there that night. For our next story, Redditor The Odd News shares a fascinating tale about a coal mine and the ghost he encountered within it. Here's the story. I was born in 1968. I am the son of a miner, a father, and a miner myself. I'm the father of two children. The incident happened to me in the mine where I worked a year or two before I retired. Everything started after an accident in the mine. That day, I went to the workplace as usual. In the morning, after having breakfast in the canteen, I got into the cage to go 260 meters underground. When I say cage, I mean an elevator. We mine workers preferred to call it a cage instead of an elevator because it was a simple device that worked with a large crane rather than a true elevator. Anyway, I went down to the mine. After working until the end of the shift, I started walking toward the bottom of the shaft. We call the place where we get into the cage the bottom of the shaft. As I was walking slowly, an engine passed by me quickly. What we called an engine can be considered to be a small train. It was a relatively simple device compared to the train, pulling only wagons weighing up to one ton at most. There were workers on the engine. Normally, they are forbidden to do this, but sometimes when the workers are very tired after work, they ride on the engine to avoid walking. I continued to walk slowly as the engine sped past me. Then, there was shouting coming from up ahead. Someone seemed to be moaning in a wheezing voice. I moved toward the direction of the sound in order to understand exactly what was happening. I started to look around carefully. When I approached the place where the sound was coming from, I saw that somebody was lying in the water channel on the side of the air door. Blood was flowing from the person, like from a faucet. At that moment, I went into like a short-term shock. In that chaos, we immediately carried the injured person to the lift entrance, that bottom of the shaft, and sent him to the hospital. I still couldn't get over the shock of that image. 
That day, the person that was injured in that accident died. This incident affected me deeply. My psychology was turned upside down. According to what I learned later, the accident happened as follows. While the workers were traveling with the engine, the air door did not open. Since the engine was also fast, the engine hit the door with great violence. The worker who was caught between the engine and the door was crushed badly during the impact. In the days following this incident, when I passed through that gate, it always seemed to me as if somebody was still lying in that water channel. I couldn't pass through there by myself. Since the hearth was not sufficiently lit, it was always very dark inside there. It was only illuminated by fluorescent lamps, which were very sparsely placed in certain parts of the hearth. Because of the effect of this incident, I was completely disenchanted with work. I didn't feel like going to work at all, but I had to. Anyway, one day when I was at work again, I was the last one left at the end of the work in the area of the mine where we were all working in. When I looked around, everybody had left. I sat down somewhere. Such a weight fell on me that it seemed like a lifetime to go from there to the lift area. I said to myself, I'll just rest a little where I'm sitting and then I'll go. My eyes closed for a while. I was between sleep and wakefulness. I saw a man approaching me from up ahead, holding a lamp in his hand. There is no work left at the stove at this hour. I guess he stayed later, like me, I said to myself. That light that was approaching suddenly disappeared. Oh my gosh, where did this man go? I thought. Then I just thought, let me sit for one or two more minutes. Maybe the man who just disappeared will come back and we can go to the lift together. Then my eyes closed again. I don't know how much time passed but suddenly I woke up with a very severe slap. But what a slap. I thought my neck was broken. I immediately recovered and looked around me. There was no one. It was impossible for somebody to hit me and run away and me not see them. For this reason, I started running toward the lift in fear and panic. That day, I didn't tell anybody about what happened. One or two weeks later, I was the last one again. This time, I hurried up and went straight to the lift entrance. As I sat down and waited for the lift to arrive, I noticed that something jet black was coming toward me. It had a hand lamp and a hard hat, but neither of them was lit. It was slowly approaching me. I called out, Master, what's wrong? Did the lamp malfunction? He didn't answer. Instead, it just kept coming toward me slowly. I felt such a strong sense of fear, and I didn't know why. I wanted to get up and leave. I even wanted to run away, but I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. Although he was very close to me, I couldn't see his face or body clearly. It was as if the man coming toward me was not a tangible substance, but a shadow. A silhouette. Don't ever sleep on the hearth again, he said to me. I could feel the man's speech, not in my ears, but in my brain. He spoke to me almost telepathically, and then he disappeared. I had heard of such events from a few other people before, but I never believed it. At that moment, all those stories that I had heard went through my mind. I read all the prayers I knew. That black silhouette had not harmed me but living that moment had further disrupted my already broken psychology. I couldn't get up from where I was sitting for another one to two minutes. After a while, I pulled myself together and walked away from there. When I told my friends what had happened to me, they didn't believe me. When I told what had happened to me to the Imam of the village where I lived, the Imam did believe me and said the following. They are the owners of the mines. As you know, according to Islamic belief, the souls of martyrs can choose to stay in this world instead of going to the hereafter if they wish. According to a saying of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, those who die under the rubble are considered martyrs, just like those who die in war. That's why we call people who died in the mines, mine martyrs. Most probably, that thing you saw in the mine was the spirit of a mine martyr, and it warned you. 
He wanted to protect you. After my visit to the Imam, and after that day, I never slept in the mine again. When I was about 15, my mom came home from work on a Saturday night to find my dad and I in the kitchen making dinner. She was excited because she had just gotten a promotion and had gotten the keys to her place of work, which she would be using for the first time the next morning. She put them down on the counter with her other keys and went upstairs to change. Fast forward to after dinner, my mom is getting everything organized for work the next morning and we're in the family room in the basement, picking a movie to watch. Suddenly my mom goes, has anyone seen my work keys? Immediately, my dad and I remind her that she put them on the counter when she came in. Yeah, I know, she says, but they're not there. So, of course, the three of us spent forever searching the house top to bottom for these keys. We looked in her purse, all over the kitchen, in the car, in the cupboards, pretty much anywhere we could think of. The keys were nowhere to be found. My mom concludes that they must still be at work, despite all of us having seen her bring them home and set them on the counter. She resolves to call her boss in the morning if they still haven't turned up. A little later, my mom is looking at outfits for the next day, and I'm laying on her bed playing with the cat. My mom takes a big, slightly fancier purse out of her closet, which she hasn't used in at least six months because, well, it's fancy, and somewhat expensive, and in her mind, that meant it was not for everyday use but tomorrow was special. She reaches into the purse to put her work things in it, and her hand comes back out, holding the lost keys. We were all stunned, and neither of my parents ever mentioned it again, no matter how many times I bring up the ghostly happenings in our house.